operation, apparently. A surgeon turned your penis inside out, and you had yourself a brand new vagina. In a very short time, Howie had become an addict of daytime TV. The girl with the nose ring, Jack said finally. Tell me more about her. I'll try. She was in her early twenties, sort of Nordic-looking, high cheekbones. A pretty girl, but not really in a distinctive way. I mean, it wasn't so much her features that you noticed. It was mostly that she was rosy-cheeked and blonde and full of health. I would describe her as a type, Jack. The sort of Colorado girl who doesn't wear makeup that you'd expect to see charging up a mountain with a pack on her back. I bet she has muscular legs. Her hair was the nicest part of her, a kind of dark gold, very thick. But a guy looks at a girl like that. I don't think he even really sees her. He just fills in the blanks, what his imagination wants to see. I want you to see her. I'm interested in individuals, not types. Well, good luck. This is a collective world, bro, a mass culture we live in. What do you think a nose ring is? You tell me, Howie. It's a badge. Let's people know you belong in a particular niche of the counterculture and that you hold certain well-defined opinions. It lets other people with the same badge know that you're one of them. This is how people relate to one another in an overpopulated world. They send each other smoke signals, constantly seeking their own kind. So you're telling me a nose ring is not a form of self-expression? Jack asked Riley. It's group expression, Howie assured him. It's a uniform, but not a uniform I expected to find in Colorado Springs. You said she looked familiar to you. Where did you see her before? Howie shook his head. I've been trying to remember, but I keep hitting a blank. Maybe I was mistaken. She was such a definite type, you know. Perhaps that's why she seemed familiar. She could have been any one of a hundred women I've seen in the past few years. Could you have seen her in San Geronimo? Possibly. Or maybe I met one of her many twin sisters. All right. We'll put it to the side for the moment. Let's discuss the person you saw on that dark mountain road. Hopefully he's more distinctive in your mind. Man, that guy scared me to death, Jack. I understand. How tall was he? Average. Not too tall, not too short. Was he slight? Or did he have a heavy build? I didn't really notice. Medium, I would say. Color of hair? I didn't notice. Was it long or short? Jack, I didn't see that either. Remember I told you he held an arm up to his face to shield himself from the glare of my headlights. So you saw nothing. Jack, what I saw was a gun. A gun that looked about ten feet tall to me. A shotgun, you said? Yes. Two barrels or one? Two. And what arm was he holding it in? Howie had to think for a moment. The left, he decided. So he was shielding his face with his right arm. That's right. I, I think so, at least. How was he dressed? Pants? A jacket? But if you ask me what kind of pants or jacket, I'm not going to be able to tell you. I only saw him for a few seconds, and everything about the guy was washed out in the headlights, like a photograph that's overexposed. Okay, that's reasonable, Jack said patiently. Now, tell me this. Are you certain it was a man? Good God. You think it was some sort of evil genie? That's not what I'm asking. Could the figure have been a woman? Howie stared at Jack in surprise. No, he said. But then he changed his mind. Well, maybe. Is it no or is it maybe? I can't tell you for sure. It's like trying to remember a dream. Frankly, I was terrified the way he appeared like that out of nowhere, and I didn't get a very good look. Up in Colorado, you described the figure as a ghost dancer. What do you mean by that? Did I say that? I was half out of my mind that night. Naturally. But just try to remember what you meant. Well, the figure, whatever it was, it was damn ghostly. And when I was lying on the rocks just before I passed out, I looked up and saw the thing in the light of the explosion, and it seemed to be dancing a little, jumping up and down, kind of a victory dance, like football players do after they've scored a touchdown. It was strange as hell. He reminded you of a football player? 
Not really. I just used that as an example. He reminded me of a ghost dancer. Yes, yes, Jack said impatiently. But what is a ghost dancer, Howie? They were an Indian cult in the last century. In the 1880s, there was a Paiute holy man named Wovoka from Pyramid Lake. He came up with a kind of garbled version of the Christianity that had been preached to the Indians by the missionaries, that the world was about to end and a red messiah was going to appear any moment to bring all the dead Indian warriors back to life. That's why they were called ghost dancers, Jack, because they danced to resurrect their dead. They believed the buffalo would come back to life as well and everything would be just like it was before the Europeans came, only better. The evil white man, naturally, would be totally annihilated. There was a lot of hocus-pocus. They wore magic shirts, they thought, would protect them from the white man's bullets. But this led to some major disappointments, as you might imagine. Basically, it was your classic messiah fantasy. You get these things from time to time when you have a downtrodden people looking for deliverance, just like the Jews under Pontius Pilate. For a while, the idea caught on among the different tribes, particularly the Sioux, but it was a decadent religion, Jack. Fanatic and awfully desperate, not the sort of religion that's born of love and light. You have to remember, the Indians were in pretty bad shape in the 1880s and clutching at straws. The white people, naturally, were scared to death of this talk of a red messiah, and Washington sent Custer's old outfit, the 7th Cavalry, to take care of the problem. The massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890 was the result. And this cult, is it still going on today? Not in any organized fashion. Every now and then, some guy on the res drinks a lot of beer on Saturday night and smokes enough dope and suddenly has a vision of white people dying horrible deaths and the buffalo coming back. We're not talking, Jack, about real Indian holy men. Not someone like Raymond Concha, for example. This is definitely the low-rent side of religion. Jack was listening carefully. Could anyone be trying to bring back the ghost dancers? If so, I've never heard of it. What about AIM? The American Indian movement? No, that's pretty much dead now. Anyway, those dudes like Leonard Peltier had a much more modern outlook. They were seeking political rights for Indians. They weren't religious at all, which bothered some of the traditionalists. AIM would have found ghost dancing an embarrassment. I think you're on the wrong track here, Jack. And why was the first description out of your mouth about the guy who shot at you that he was a ghost dancer? I was stoned on painkillers. It was just a phrase I used without thinking. Sometimes those are the phrases we need to take most seriously, Howie. Well, I told you he reminded me of a ghost dancer for that one moment when I saw him dancing in the light of the explosion. But on second thought, maybe the football image is a better one. He was doing a little touchdown shuffle. The asshole thought he'd killed me and he was celebrating. I wonder, said Jack. Well, this will require some thought. If I still had a big city police department to play with, I'd send a forensic team up to the mountain road to where that dancing ghost nearly killed you. Then I'd send another team to Colorado Springs to trace your steps and figure out who you spooked. I'd also put a couple of detectives on Alice and Hampton's problem to find out who's writing bloody hate words on her house. But since there are just the two of us, and I'm blind, and you're laid up in bed, we're going to have to keep this fairly simple. We need to keep our focus on the heart of this case, Howie. And what's that? April Fool's Day, of course. Why Kid Hampton wanted to see us at Doobie Rock. Why he got to Doobie Rock half an hour early, and most of all, what in the world he was doing having sex with some girl twenty minutes before he was killed. We need to find that girl, Howie. From now on, she's our number one priority. Being young, the word sex roused Howie's interest and stirred his imagination. So, Wilder and Associate are still in business, huh? Of course we are. Jack seemed outraged that Howie might think otherwise, just because appearances might be against them at the moment. Howie smiled. Well then, Jack, I have an idea. Four. There was a ski instructor named Zora Rousseau, who was everybody's mother, a middle-aged woman who provided the best shoulder to cry on in San Geronimo Peak. How he should have thought of her before. 
Zora had been working on the mountain every winter for nearly twenty years. The rest of the year she ran a successful business in town, Far Adventures. If you wanted to know who was screwing whom at the ski resort, she was definitely the one to ask. Well, I suppose she's worth a try, Jack agreed without enthusiasm. What's this company of hers? Far Adventures? River rafting? You'll see, Jack. No, unfortunately, I won't see. That's the problem, and I've had enough adventure myself for one day. So just tell me, please. Oh, she arranges all sorts of exotic life experiences for bored trust funders who are trying to find themselves. Llama safaris into the wilderness, vision quests, firewalking, you name it. What's firewalking? This is her specialty, Jack. It's an evening where she gets a bunch of people together to walk barefoot over a bed of burning coals. A kind of human barbecue, very hip, the absolute latest rage. First, you need to face all your fears, of course, and do a lot of inner work on yourself to get into the proper spirit. Then you walk over the coals, and amazingly, it doesn't hurt. As long as you remember to keep chanting your personal power mantra, naturally. You've done this? You bet. Bob and Nova and I did it one night. It was kind of fun, actually, except one part early in the evening where you're supposed to team up with a partner and make goo-goo eyes at one another. New Agers are always trying to look deep into each other's eyeballs with a kind of fakey-fake expression on their faces that's supposed to resemble gentleness and love. It's a little embarrassing. It all sounded strange to Jack, but how he assured him that there was tons of money to be made leading the lost and wounded souls of San Geronimo over beds of burning coal. The office for Far Adventures was on Martinez Alley, a small cul-de-sac behind the downtown plaza. Jack and Katya were able to get a ride here on the hospital minibus that was run by the town as a service to help the poor and elderly get to their doctor appointments. The driver was very helpful. He parked the bus and led Jack into an office that felt small and overcrowded, and then he waited to see that Jack was all right before he disappeared. There was a musty smell in the room of patchouli oil and incense. Oh, what a pretty, pretty doggy! cried a loud and enthusiastic lady in baby talk. She had a deep, earthy voice with a distant trace of Brooklyn in it. Are you Zora Russo? That's me, by God, holy shit, you're blind! How utterly fabulous! You know, sometimes I go about for days at a time with my eyes closed. Why, for heaven's sake? So I can really see, of course. All the truly important things are inside us, not outside. You blind people have such an advantage over the rest of us, getting in touch with your inner eye. Howie had described Zora as forty years old and kind of goofy. Frizzy hair, a short round body, and bright laughing eyes. Not the sort of slick, body-perfect person you'd expect to find as a ski instructor at San Geronimo Peak, though. In fact, she could ski the pants off most of the younger guys. Jack sat in a leather armchair that was old and cracked. So, she said happily, I hope you're here to sign up for the fire walking this weekend. We're really going to make some breakthroughs and expand our limits. Perhaps another time, Jack demurred. He reached into the pocket of his sports coat for his business card. I'm a private detective. Senator Hampton hired me shortly before he was killed, and I'm looking into his death. This gets better all the time. A blind detective, she gushed. But aren't there already a gaggle of cops investigating Kit's death? For days after the murder, there were detectives swarming all over San Geronimo Peak. Did they speak with you? No but I wasn't on the mountain when Kit died. My left knee had gone a little wonky, and I wasn't skiing for a few days. Well, there you are. All the cops in the world can miss the one potential witness who can bust the case wide open. Tell me something. I understand that Kit was quite the ladies' man. Zora let loose a big, booming laugh. You got that right. But, of course, he never made a pass at me. I'm everybody's mother, you know. Every ski resort needs a person like me so that the sex maniacs have someone to confide their deep, dark secrets to. Yes, and that's exactly why I've come to you, Zora. 
I'm hoping you can help me find Kit's most current girlfriend. I need to know who he'd been seeing. Jack heard a note of caution enter her voice. Why do you want to know? I should think it's obvious. Kit's lover, whoever she is, probably knows more than anybody else what was going on in his life. She'll be able to throw some light on this case. The gushing enthusiasm had drained from Zora's voice. I can't help you. You know why people confide in me, Jack? It's because I keep their secrets. And let me tell you a secret, too. This is confidential police information, by the way, so please keep it to yourself. The autopsy showed that Senator Hampton had sex less than half an hour before he died. Did he? She seemed interested. Yes, he did. And this is the most puzzling aspect of the case, as far as I'm concerned. The senator was seen taking the early morning chair up the mountain, so he must have had his tryst somewhere on the peak itself. But where in the world would a person go up there to have sex in a near blizzard? Well, well, she said, avoiding a direct answer. You know, Zora, I think you can help me, and I really need your help badly to untangle this mystery. She spoke reluctantly. Well, there's the number three avalanche hut, of course. What's that? There are several avalanche huts above treeline. You have to climb to them. They're way up on the ridge. The ski patrol uses them to watch the snow conditions and store the explosive canisters and grenade launchers. After a storm, they'll usually start a few controlled slides so that the snow doesn't avalanche on its own. At certain times of the year, they assign a patrol person to stay up in the huts during the day to keep an eye on things with binoculars. What's special about the number three hut? It has a bed and a good propane heater. Believe me, it's seen some hanky-panky over the years. It's situated on top of El Lobo Ridge, and there's even a fantastic ski down, if you like the really steep terrain. Can the general public go there? No way, it's roped off. Definitely off limits. Only the ski patrol is allowed on El Lobo. But occasionally they'll invite a special friend. You have to be an expert skier, of course, to even consider it. And Senator Hampton might go up there? Of course. Kit was the boss. He went anywhere he pleased. My question was more, was he a good enough skier? He was 63 years old, you know. Kit could still manage, she said with a laugh. I see. Now, what about the other avalanche huts besides number three? Are they ever used for romantic reasons? I doubt it, unless you like to screw standing up. The number one and two huts are about the size of a phone booth. Number three is the only one where there's a bed. Do the cops know about this? Probably not, unless they've asked the right people. You're learning some of the deep, dark secrets of San Geronimo Peak, Jack. And it's about time to... Jack muttered. So now the big question is this. If this hut is where Kit Hampton went on the morning he was killed, who was the woman he was with? That I can't tell you. No. It would have to be someone on ski patrol, wouldn't it? I would presume so. Well, how many women are there on ski patrol? There can't be many. The peak has a little over 40 people working ski patrol. Of that number, maybe one quarter are female. So, ten women. It shouldn't be too difficult to check them out and discover Kit's final lady friend. I would prefer it, however, if you would simply tell me, Zora. Why are you so certain I know? Because I can hear it in your voice, and it would save me a good deal of time. Jesus, and I thought you were a nice guy when you first walked in here. Jack leaned forward. Zora... There are no nice people in murder investigations. Now I'm going to get to the bottom of this one way or the other. So how about just telling me what you know? Damn, she swore sourly. It's a complicated situation. If it's who I'm thinking of, the girl's married. If you give me the facts, I can approach her in a discreet manner. Perhaps some time when her husband's not at home. The guy's going to be devastated if he finds out. He's a ski instructor, a nice guy. Well, he's a little weird, but I feel for him. 
All winter long, he kept telling me how he was suspicious his wife was stepping out with someone. It was very painful, particularly since I knew it was true. It's something I learned by accident one night when I stayed late. I came across her and Kit kissing in the parking lot. They didn't see me, but I sure saw them. It was dark? Yes, but not so dark that I couldn't see them properly. Anyway, I heard them talking as well. They thought they were alone and they weren't being very careful. She was saying, well, how much she enjoyed having oral sex with him. When was this? Sometime in late February. I forget the exact date. And you don't believe her husband ever found out? No. As I told you, Donnie suspected something was up, but he never knew for certain. I'm sure he never would have guessed in a million years that she was seeing Kit. Donnie, Jack urged. What's his last name? Oh, Jesus, I let that slip, didn't I? Donnie Henderson, she said with a sigh. I really wasn't going to tell you this. And her name? Crystal. She's good looking, but she certainly made life hell for Donnie. Good. Donnie and Crystal Henderson. I finally feel like I'm getting someplace with this damn case. Let's start with Crystal. Please tell me what you know about her. Not much. We've hardly exchanged more than a few hellos. She's ski patrol, of course, and they usually don't condescend to hang out with us mere instructors. Mostly I've just heard about her from Donnie. Who are her friends up on the peak? I don't think she has friends. She's very aloof and standoffish. I know that Donnie always felt he had to beg for her attention. She controls him. What does she do off-season? She's an artist, or at least trying to become one. Donnie says she does watercolors, but I've never seen any of her work. So Donnie is really the one you know. Well, I can't say I know him, but we work together. There's a lot of time riding the chairlifts to talk about stuff. Donnie's big obsession, of course, is Crystal. He's always asking my advice. What should he do so she'll be more interested in him? Poor Donnie, he's one of those guys who always has a kind of hurt look in his eye, which isn't so attractive to women. I tried to tell him he needed to forget her and work on himself. Do you think Donnie is capable of violence? Zora laughed. Oh, no. Donnie didn't shoot Kit with that bow and arrow. To be honest, I almost wish he had. The guy really needs to get in touch with his anger. But he's more the type who mopes and worries. Frankly, I'd nominate him as a candidate for suicide, not homicide. Sometimes there's a very thin line between the two, Jack told her. You said that he was a little weird. What do you mean by that? Nothing much. They're both into body piercing, that's all. I certainly consider myself a progressive person, but I have to admit, self-mutilation turns me off. Body piercing? Jack wondered. It was a subject he had never much considered, and it took him a moment to realize the importance of what she was saying. By any chance, does Crystal Henderson have a nose ring? That's right, through one of her nostrils. It caused a bit of a sensation on the ski patrol when she did it this winter, but Kit said it was all right. That should have tipped Donnie off right there. Actually, when Donnie and Crystal got married, they got pierced in some intimate places that aren't so obvious. This is something Donnie told me, by the way. I'm glad to say I haven't seen it for myself firsthand. They have matching wedding bands. His is hanging from his scrotum. Hers is through her clitoris. Jack shuddered. Let me make sure I have the right person. She's in her early twenties, not too tall, a kind of pretty Nordic face, high cheekbones, thick dark gold hair. You must have seen her somewhere. That's Crystal exactly. Jack permitted himself a smile. It's my inner eye, he assured her. It never misses a thing. 5. Jack and Katya were in a fine mood. Man and dog made their way, with the help of a passing tourist, half a block down Martinez Alley to the New Wave Café, where they sat at a picturesque table on the outdoor terrace and waited for Emma to get off work at the library. Sarah, the English waitress, made a cappuccino for Jack and a special doggy milkshake for Katya, and they split a giant cookie between them. You're looking awfully chipper. Emma observed when she drove by to pick them up a few minutes past five. 
You must have had one of your famous breakthroughs. No, not really. Jack was superstitious enough never to claim victory until the final snap of the handcuffs. But, in fact, he was very pleased with his progress that day. For the first time in this confusing case, he saw a clear line of attack. He would question Crystal Henderson, find out about her affair with Kit Hampton, and ask what she was doing in Colorado Springs the day Howie was nearly killed. New obstacles would certainly arise on the path to truth, but Jack no longer felt helpless. He was a man with a plan. Emma, would you mind stopping off somewhere for just a little while? There's a girl I need to talk to. A woman, Emma corrected. We don't call them girls anymore, Jack, unless they're under the age of twelve. Well, I'm a creature of old and wicked ways, he told her. He placed his hand suggestively on the upper part of her leg as she drove. You're a dinosaur, she agreed, complete with green scales and a horny old tail. A horny something, he admitted. I thought we'd have dinner in bed tonight, and maybe a nice bottle of wine. You think I'm going to let myself be seduced by someone who's still living out gender roles from the late fifties? It was a sexy time, the late fifties, all that slow dancing to corny love songs. Us dinosaurs enjoyed it a lot. Jack's hand was creeping higher. Howie would have been surprised at the extent of the wilder sex life. It was stout sex, certainly, and not quite what young people fantasize. Yet the passion was still there after many years together, and this moment in the car could have been interesting. But suddenly, Katya pushed her nose forward from the back seat, and with a small squeal of delight, she licked Jack directly on the mouth. Emma laughed, and the romantic moment was gone. She drove to the address that Jack had gotten from Zora for Donnie and Crystal Henderson. The house was a small pseudo-adobe on a narrow lot on the south edge of town. There were two cars in the driveway, both aging four-wheel drive Toyota Tercels. Someone must be home with two cars in the driveway, Emma told him. Why don't I drop you off? I'll run into town and get his pizza to go and a bottle of wine while you do your nasty old detecting. I can be back in twenty minutes. Then we'll go home and get a little cozy. You've got yourself a blind date, he grinned. When a case was going well, Jack had a tendency for atrocious puns. Just get me to the front door and I'll take it from there. They left Katya in the car and Emma guided Jack along a short path to the front door. There are happy houses and there are sad houses. You can often tell from the outside how life is going for the occupants inside. This, thought Emma, was a sad house. The yard was barren, there were few shrubs and plants, and the curtains on the windows were closed even though it was still daylight. Emma didn't see a doorbell, so she knocked on the front door. To her surprise, the door was not completely closed. It swung open on its hinges with the pressure of her hand. Jack suddenly took hold of her arm. Get me the gun in the car, he said quietly. There is no gun in the car. Yes, there is. Look in the trunk. It's in the compartment with the tire jack. Get it for me quickly and don't make any noise. Emma didn't like guns, but there was something in Jack's tone that made her decide to save her lecture for later. She left Jack for a moment, jogged across the yard, and found, to her dismay, a Smith & Wesson thirty eight just where he said it would be. She came back to the front door, not certain whether to give it to him or to hold on to it herself. Jack held out his hand and she gave it to him. Jack, I don't like this she whispered. Neither do I, Emma. I think there are some dead people inside this house. I'm not sure how many or what exactly we're going to find. If you want to wait in the car, you should. No, you need my eyes. He smiled weakly. As a matter of fact, I do. Emma pushed the door completely open, and now she too smelled what Jack had noticed first with his sharper senses, the unique odor of death. Jack put one hand on her shoulder and she led the way into the house. Emma stepped into the living room. It was a cheaply furnished house, old couches and second-hand tables and chairs from the thrift shop. She gagged as her eyes scanned the room and came to rest upon the small dining alcove. Tell me, Jack ordered. As the wife of a policeman for many years, Emma had seen a few terrible sights in her time, usually in photographs. She had never gotten used to it. She took a deep breath and tried to remain calm. There's 
a young woman lying on her back on the floor by the dining room table. She was shot in the throat. Does she have a nose ring? Emma peered closer. Yes, a small gold loop through her left nostril. She's blonde, and it looks like she was quite pretty, poor thing. What a shame to die so young. That's Crystal. What about Donnie? He's slouched backward in one of the dining room chairs. It's pretty gross, Jack. He shot himself in the mouth. What makes you say he shot himself? There's a pistol that's fallen to the floor a few inches from his right hand. I hear something. A kind of hum. It's a computer that's been left on. It's on a desk by the window. It's on? Be careful not to touch anything, Emma. Tell me what's on the screen. Emma laughed darkly when she saw what it was. This is suicide the modern way, Jack. It's a note. Read it to me, please. It's short and to the point and very tragic. Five words, all in capital letters. Till death do us part. 6. On Thursday morning, Dr. Allison Hampton took her five-year-old daughter to work with her. Leaving her house in San Geronimo at 5.30, the usual time of her commute, well before even the first hint of dawn. It seemed almost cruel to bundle the half-asleep child into the ancient M.G. for the three-hour drive to Albuquerque. Supplies were necessary. A banana, a giant oatmeal cookie, a bribe, a purple dinosaur, Barney, a coloring book, and a box of Legos to keep Angela occupied later in the day. This was the third consecutive day Allison had brought her daughter to the clinic with her. Normally on the days Allison worked, an elderly Spanish woman named Viola Suazo took care of Angela in the early morning until it was time to drive the child to the bright rainbow preschool in town. But after such a crazy weekend, the incident in the restaurant and the blood on her window, Allison had suffered an attack of nerves. It wasn't a rational decision so much as a gut feeling that with hostile forces all around her, Angela must be kept very close at hand. At first the little girl seemed to enjoy the special time with her mother, driving back and forth to Albuquerque, but as the days passed it became obvious that this arrangement could not go on forever. On Thursday morning, Allison half listened to the news on National Public Radio, while Angela sat dreamily in the passenger seat, hugging her purple dinosaur and staring out the window. The sun rose, lighting up the desert and mountains with a burst of living color. On the half-hour, NPR broke off for local news of New Mexico. There was yet more violent death to report from San Geronimo, an apparent murder-suicide yesterday of an unhappy couple. The police reported that the young man had shot his wife before turning the gun on himself. Good Lord, Allison sighed. For a picturesque little town, San Geronimo was certainly getting its share of brutality these days, but New Mexico was an unexpectedly violent land, not quite the paradise one imagined. Angela stretched restlessly in the passenger seat. How you doing, sweetie? Want me to tell you a story? Yes, a story. How about the Frog Prince? Allison offered. Red Riding Hood. Well, that's a grisly tale, but all right. Allison turned off the radio, and it was at this point, as she leaned forward, that a glint of reflected light in her rearview mirror caught her eye. It was the fender of a black Ford pickup truck behind her. Extended cab, balloon tires, tinted windows, CB antenna. This was not the dark car she sometimes feared had been stalking her the past few months, but nevertheless the truck caused instinctive worry since it came from the other side of the Great American Divide. She knew she was being jumpy, but she couldn't help it. Mommy, tell me Red Riding Hood. Well, okay. Allison did her best to forget about the truck in her rearview mirror and get on with the fairy tale. At Angela's preschool, the teachers liked to tell an altered Red Riding Hood, in which the Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood talked things over, did some creative problem-solving, and parted as friends. But Allison was against such revisionism. She told the tale that she herself had heard it as a little girl, believing some degree of terror was not amiss in the world, and that innocent little girls must indeed be on the lookout for wolves. 
Allison took St. Francis Drive through Santa Fe on her way to the interstate. At a stoplight, she studied her rearview mirror for the black pickup and was relieved to see a green Volvo station wagon behind her instead. You knew what sort of person drove a Volvo station wagon, a person like yourself. But as she accelerated onto a southbound lane of Interstate 25, she glanced in the mirror and the black Ford was once again on her tail, sleek and aggressive on its oversized tires, only a dozen feet behind. Surely it's nothing, she told herself. Yet it was impossible not to worry. The reappearance of the Ford bothered her so much that she allowed the tail of Red Riding Hood to drift to an inconclusive pause at the climactic moment, just as the handsome woodcutter was about to bring back Riding Hood and her grandmother from the very jaws of death. Mommy, what happens next? You know what happens next, sweetheart. The handsome woodcutter hacks away at the big bad wolf with his sharp axe. He cuts open the wolf's nasty old stomach, and out pops Grandmother and Riding Hood, and everyone lives happily ever after. From the wolf's stomach? Weren't they all yucky and chewed up? Angela asked the same question each time she heard the story, and Allison always gave her the same answer. No, and you know why? Because that nasty wolf was so greedy, he ate them up with one huge bite, and they got swallowed whole, just like Jonah in the whale. Now, Mommy needs to concentrate on driving. Mommy, I think that Howie looks like the handsome woodcutter, Angela announced seriously. When I grow up, I'm going to marry him. Probably it was a good thing that Mommy wasn't listening. She slowed from 70 to 55 to encourage the truck in her rearview mirror to pass, but the truck did not pass. It slowed to match her new speed and remained in place 20 feet back, confirming her worst fears. Allison made certain her daughter's seat belt was tightly fastened. Then she put her foot on the gas pedal and moved into the passing lane. The MG accelerated quickly past two huge trailer trucks and a blue Honda, returning to the right-hand lane at close to eighty-five miles per hour. The road ahead was clear, but in the rearview mirror the black pickup was still behind her, matching her new speed. Damn, she swore. A black pickup truck with tinted windows and a CB antenna was a terrifying sight. A vehicle onto which a woman could project her every fear of rape and mayhem, the male violence of the American highway. Allison looked about wildly for a police car, hoping for a speeding ticket, any miracle to save her. But there was no police car, no help in sight. Then she saw a freeway sign announcing a rest stop one mile ahead, and this gave her an idea. She eased her foot from the pedal and slowed gradually to sixty-five. The truck stayed on her tail, slowing down as well. Her plan was a simple one, to swerve into the exit at the last moment and hope the truck would speed past on the interstate and be unable to back up. If this failed, if the truck followed her into the parking area, she wasn't quite certain what she would do. Hopefully there would be other people around to help. As Allison approached the exit ahead, she maintained her speed at exactly sixty-five so as not to alert the black truck to her plan. Hang on, sweetie, she said to Angela. She was about to break and swerve when an odd thing happened. The Ford simply moved into the left-hand lane and passed her. Was it possible the truck hadn't been following her after all, but was simply going on its own merry course through hell? Allison caught sight of a bumper sticker on the tailgate as it sped past. The sticker read, Don't like my driving? Call 1-800-EAT-SHIT. Incredible! It was only blind anger speeding down the highway, road rage that had nothing to do with her personally. By the time Allison read the bumper sticker and understood the danger was over, she had already overshot the exit. She pulled over to the shoulder of the interstate, her hands shaking and her heart beating so fast it was difficult for a moment to breathe. I'm going crazy, she thought. Angela was studying her with huge, worried blue eyes. Mommy? Yes, darling? What were you and Howie doing on the living room floor? You didn't have any clothes on. All of Allison's tension exploded into laughter. You saw us that night? Well, it's called sexual intercourse, she explained as seriously as she was able, and you don't need to know anything more about it than that just yet, young lady. Allison continued into Albuquerque, thinking, 
My God, it sure as hell isn't easy to be a parent these days. The woman's cooperative family planning clinic was located in a bad part of town, a converted Victorian house on the far eastern end of Central Avenue, a dissolute area of shabby motels, pussycat adult theaters, Chinese restaurants, and businesses that always seemed to have signs in their window announcing a going-out-of-business sale. The area was well known locally for prostitution, drugs, and violent crime. The co-op was located here for a good reason. This was the only part of the city where Allison could find a landlord who was willing to shrug off bomb threats and the possibility of arson to rent to a medical clinic that performed abortions. On Thursday morning, Dr. Hampton parked her car and held tightly to her daughter's hand as she led the way up a cement path to the entrance of the converted Victorian house. This was always the worst part of the day, entering and leaving the clinic, passing the line of protesters from Christians for a moral America. In the past few months, Allison had come to hate these people with all her heart and soul. About a dozen protesters were already in place waving placards and gruesome photographs of mangled babies. When they saw Allison, they began to chant in unison, Abortion is murder! Abortion is murder! Months ago, when all this first started, Allison had sometimes shouted back comments of her own, wondering aloud about these people, who apparently cared so very much about the sanctity of life. Where had they been when the United States was dropping napalm on Vietnamese villages, or supplying weapons and advisors to the military dictatorship in El Salvador? And why weren't they marching against the death penalty? You're not pro-life. You're just anti-sex, she had shouted at them once. But it was hopeless, and she had ceased long ago trying to have a logical dialogue with the CMA, even in her own mind. After nearly six months of protest, she and the Christians had come to a kind of status quo. The Albuquerque protesters, in fact, appeared intent on obeying the letter of the law. They remained the prescribed distance from the co-op entrance, 33 feet, and although they shouted a good deal at clients going in and out of the building, they did nothing physically to stop business at the clinic. Nevertheless, every muscle in Allison's body clenched tight as she walked up the path to the building, holding her daughter's hand. It was terrifying, the angry voices beating down upon her. She looked neither to the right nor the left, but hurried straight ahead. She was not a particularly brave woman, but she was proud, and all her life she had despised bullies. Come on, Angela, she said grimly. Don't even look at them. They're only nasty old bullies. Nasty old bullies, Angela mimed, sticking out her tongue briefly at a thin woman holding a sign. Once inside the building, it was a typical morning. Dr. Hampton's first patient was an eighteen-year-old girl who was pregnant for the third time and appeared blissfully ignorant of the facts of life. Allison first made certain that the girl was indeed pregnant, and then, on condition that she promised to use birth control pills in the future, she set up an appointment for a DNC. Next came a twenty-two-year-old secretary who wanted to go off the pill and be fitted for a diaphragm. Dr. Hampton always felt a moment of small triumph when a few of these young women actually used contraception. After that, she did a pap smear, examined a patient for genital herpes, and finally, late in the morning, performed a suction aspiration the simplest form of abortion, on a sixteen-year-old girl who was pregnant only a few weeks, still in the first trimester. The procedure was little more than inserting a catheter inside the uterus and sucking out a few cells. It was this act that the religious fundamentalists outside called murder. Angela, meanwhile, spent the morning playing with her Legos on the floor of the receptionist's office. Allison visited with her daughter for a moment or two between each patient and then during her lunch break they went to her own office on the second floor. Lunch was sent over from the Sichuan Palace nearby. Sweet and sour chicken, Angela's choice, shrimp with asparagus and a black bean sauce, fried rice, two spring rolls, and two fortune cookies. The lunch was delivered in cardboard cartons with handfuls of napkins, disposable chopsticks, plastic spoons and forks, and a sea of condiments in annoying plastic containers that you needed to tear open with your teeth enough trash to fill a small corner of the city landfill. Allison was eating a spring roll, chatting with her daughter, trying to act like everything was peachy-keen normal, when she could not resist the temptation to glance out of her office window and check on the protesters outside. 
Her heart sank as always, and her mood darkened to see that they were still there, the men in business suits, the women in polite church dresses, waving their placards. Couldn't they simply go away? Didn't these people have lives of their own somewhere? As Allison watched, a late-model Cadillac de Ville drove up to the line of protesters and a large man emerged. The Cadillac made Allison immediately wary. It was a dark burgundy in color, a flashy car, an automobile from a different segment of society than the black Ford pickup this morning. But it was the enemy nonetheless, a quintessentially Republican car, as Allison thought of it, a sort of anti-Volvo. The man from the DeVille shook hands with several of the anti-abortionists, and then he stepped out in front of their line onto a flower bed that was adjacent to the clinic. Allison had planted those flowers herself in an attempt to make the clinic more homey, and it annoyed her greatly to see them trammeled underfoot. Damn him, she swore. Somehow this was the last straw. She had endured too much already, a bloody afterbirth thrown at her in a crowded restaurant, her daughter's dog butchered, hateful words shouted at her month after month. For some reason she could not adequately explain it later, something in her snapped as she watched her flowers being crushed by fundamentalist shoes. Wait here, she said tightly to Angela. She walked downstairs and passed through the reception area with such military resolve that Susie Gonzalez, the receptionist, looked up from her work with a feeling that something terrible was about to happen. Allison marched out the building without bothering to close the door behind her. You goddamn son of a bitch, get out of my flower bed, she screamed at the man from the Cadillac as she approached where he was standing. Her voice was shrill, almost crazy. Don't you have any respect for living things? The man gaped at her in astonishment. Allison's fury was like a hot wind sweeping down upon him. You son of a bitch, get out of my flower bed, she shrieked. The man had never seen anything like it. As it happened, and though Allison did not realize it at the time, she was addressing Dr. Fred J. Doron himself, the director of Christians for a Moral America. Dr. Doron was a tall man with broad shoulders, and he looked a good deal more like a high school football coach than a religious figure. At the moment, his size 13 shoes were planted firmly on the green shoots of a not yet budding daylily. Allison stood inches from the man, tiny by comparison, shivering with rage. She made an effort to control her voice. If you don't get off that flower, I'm going to take my scalpel and cut your balls off, I swear to God. Dr. Fred J. Duran's eyes went very wide, and he stared downward at the small figure before him, as though he were seeing the devil herself. He had always suspected the devil was a woman. Move! she screamed. The head of Christians for a Moral America literally jumped back onto the paved sidewalk, as though his feet had touched burning coals. 7. Dr. Fred J. Duran suffered a delayed reaction from the indignity he had just endured. As soon as the lady abortionist returned to her clinic, he turned red in the face with fury and embarrassment. A group of people gathered around him to offer spiritual solace, but he wasn't consoled. Then he did something he knew he shouldn't. He jumped back onto the flowerbed and took out his frustration by grinding the daylily under the heel of his shoe. He pulverized the poor plant. Finally, he got a grip on himself. Observe what the devil can do to a Christian soul, he said mournfully. I shouldn't have let that creature get to me. Anyone would be upset after an experience like that, Fred, one of the women nearby told him in a kindly voice. Why, I've never heard such language in my entire life. No, praise be. I should have been stronger. If you don't mind, my friends, I think we'd better gather in a circle for a moment and bow our heads and pray. Dr. Duran was in particular need of prayer today. He had been out of touch for a week snowbound in a Montana cabin where he had gone to hunt elk and grizzly bear with one of CMA's most generous supporters. On his return to Colorado Springs the night before, he had gotten an earful of what had been going on in his absence, and he didn't like it one bit. This morning he had been up since five, tearing up the asphalt in his Cadillac de Ville, 
doing the 350-mile drive to Albuquerque in a little over four and a half hours. None of this put him in a good mood. The moment he and the abortion clinic protesters said amen and released hands, Fred raised his eyes across the circle and glared at his two boys, Luke and Dwight. Both boys were dressed this morning in conservative gray suits, expensively cut clean white shirts and ties, black shoes shined to a high polish. They were big boys, both of them over six feet tall, but they jumped when their father called them and followed him to the Cadillac. Get in, you damn fools, Fred ordered, punching the master button to open the computerized security lock. Though he was a religious man, he was not adverse to a little swearing when he was mad. He was certain that Jesus didn't want American men to act like sissies. Luke slipped into the front seat and Dwight into the back. Both boys recognized the signs of extreme paternal wrath and, from long experience, knew how to deal with it. This was the time to say, Yes, sir, no, sir, and keep their eyes lowered and their manner respectful. Luke, the oldest, was thirty-three. He had light red hair, pale eyebrows, and a strangely elongated face. Dwight, the younger boy, was twenty-seven. He had dark hair and a low forehead. He was nearly an inch shorter than his brother, but muscular as a bull. Fred was so angry he didn't allow himself to speak a word until he had reparked the Cadillac behind the clinic in a place where no one would hear them. Okay, now you tell me what the hell is going on here, Fred demanded, turning off the engine. Exactly what do you sons of bitches think you've been doing? Yes, sir, said Dwight from the back seat. You're probably wondering about what happened in the restaurant, sir. You're goddamn right I'm wondering about what happened in the restaurant, sir. You know I told you specifically no funny stuff in New Mexico. What we are waging here is a war of public relations. So whose idea was this? to get some damn fetus and dump it on the lady doctor while she's eating dinner. Dwight temporarily sidestepped the matter of authorship. It wasn't actually a fetus, just some afterbirth from a cow. Betsy Winthrop did it with Arnold Shipley and Alice Larkin. You know how deeply committed those people are, Dad. Yes, and I also know how stupid they are. There's no way they could have pulled off this stunt without help. Finding out where that doctor was eating dinner and terrifying her like that? Don't try to bullshit me, Dwight. I recognize a certain hand. The hand of the Lord, said Dwight with the smallest smile. Don't worry about this, Dad. Betsy, Arnold, and Alice are taking full responsibility, saying they did it without the knowledge or participation of CMA. Fred snorted. And how long do you think that's going to last? They're in jail, I presume? No, they're out on bond. But they'll keep quiet, I promise you. What we're talking about here... Christian martyrs. Before I left for Montana, we discussed all this in detail, didn't we? What did I tell you, Dwight? That everything we did in New Mexico had to remain strictly within the limits of the law. And why did I tell you this, Dwight? Why? You said we didn't want any adverse publicity. That's right. No adverse publicity. That's what I told you. We don't want John Q. Public to think we're a bunch of damn extremists particularly right now when we have some very delicate deals in motion. So you tell me. I'm waiting patiently to hear why you allowed this goddamn stupid thing. What happened next was a watershed moment in the Duran family history. Dwight Duran met his father's challenging stare and said simply, I disagree with you that it was stupid. I think it was the first clever thing we've pulled off in months. You what? Look, Dad. We had the local media at the clinic for exactly two days, six months ago when we started up our Albuquerque operation. No one really gave a damn. I mean, big deal. Christian protesters march around in front of an abortion clinic. It's been done to death. None of the national media showed up at all, and even the local papers lost interest fast. There's only one way to get the attention of the American public. You gotta give them just that little jolt of violence. Fred stared at the boy as if he had never really seen him before. A little jolt of violence, huh? He repeated with outrage. What are you, some kind of bomb-throwing anarchist? Not at all. This is simply show business, Dad. You know that, and so do I. We could parade up and down in front of that clinic until doomsday, and nobody's going to pay us the slightest attention without that little added something. And look what happened. The day after that restaurant business in San Geronimo, we were the lead story on the local news all over New Mexico. The day after that, 
We got CBS and NBC down here. The story went coast to coast and we got national exposure. Fred tried to stare down his son, but Dwight refused to look away. I'm not saying you don't have a point, the father agreed. But in this case, we're trying to portray the other side as the extremists, not ourselves. We're talking about tactics here, son, not to mention the fact that you have disobeyed me. Dad, look, it's simple. CMA will simply distance ourselves from the action. We didn't do it. Just a few of our followers who got carried away by the idea of that evil doctor killing innocent babies. What I suggest you do is give out a statement expressing regret, etc., etc., how CMA would never dream of breaking the law. But meanwhile, it's really that bitch doctor's fault, and anyone who kills babies is at risk for stirring up the natural anger of moral Americans everywhere. This way we get the best of everything. Deniability on one hand, and some fear and respect, not to mention media coverage on the other. Every parent comes to this moment eventually. They look at their child and see a stranger, an adult they do not know. Fred Duran continued to stare at Dwight, his youngest son, uncertain if he should be proud or horrified at what he had raised. You're assuring me, you're absolutely goddamn assuring me that Betsy Arnold and Alice aren't going to blab? Dwight smiled. Not if they want to go to heaven, he said. And, incidentally, not if they want to collect $5,000 apiece at the end of the year. You've offered $15,000 of our money, Fred roared. CMA can afford it, Dad. Boy, you're way out on a limb here, way out. For a moment, Dwight thought his father was going to hit him, as he had done so often in the past. Dwight steeled himself to get whopped good. But instead, Fred Duran turned to his oldest son, Luke, who had been sitting rigidly in the front seat of the caddy without uttering a word. Fred worried about Luke. The boy was his stepson, actually, but that was a complicated story and part of the discomfort between them. More and more recently, Luke's behavior frightened him. So what do you think, Luke? Fred asked softly. Are you having one of your headaches? No, father. I'm not having one of my headaches. Luke Duran turned his gaunt face toward his father and smiled sadly. I'm feeling very sorry for the lady, doctor. Are you? Of course I am. Can't you see how unhappy she is living her life of pleasure? In her shallow vanity, she is like a plant that has cut off its own roots. She is denied there is a God. She believes she can do whatever feels good. But there is a God. There are laws, Father. Terrible laws, and I fear she's about to discover his retribution. Luke Duran spoke quietly, but the very calm of his words worried Fred more than all his younger son's bluster. He didn't like it when Luke became too serious. It seemed to him that his best bet at the moment was to lighten things up a little. So he grinned, thinking about the scene in the restaurant up north. That must have been some sight, boy. A damn bloody cow's afterbirth on that doctor's table. Did she scream? The whole restaurant screamed, Dad, Dwight said from the back seat. It was one of those faggoty places where you probably can't even get a damn piece of meat. Hey, I don't want to hear you use language like that, Fred said sternly. But his tone wasn't stern enough. What language? Dwight taunted, knowing the signs were right for joking. Damn or faggoty? Fred smirked like crazy and put on a fake English accent, like the kind very uppity butlers used in old Hollywood movies. Don't say faggoty. Say homosexual. The two Duran men, Fred and Dwight, laughed loudly at the picture in their mind of a lot of elitist liberals sitting around in a fancy restaurant and what the arrival of a bloody mess on the table might do to their appetites. But red-headed Luke, the son with the face of a tortured saint, turned and whispered something toward the closed window, fogging the glass. What did you say? Fred asked him. Luke turned back to him. He seemed exhausted, worn thin, his skin so pale it was almost translucent. I said, Father, even this will pass. As in every war, it is the innocent who suffer most. 
That night, five-year-old Angela Hampton had a screaming nightmare and woke at two in the morning, terrified that the thin woman she had stuck her tongue at earlier in the day at the clinic was now hiding beneath her bed, waiting to strangle her if she fell asleep again. Allison took the sobbing child to her own bed and held her tightly. I don't want to go to Kirky again, Angela cried. Oh, sweetheart, it's okay. You don't have to go to Albuquerque ever again. I won't go to work tomorrow, I promise. I'll telephone Susie to cancel all my appointments. We'll do something special together, just you and me. I'm frightened, Mommy. Shh, shh. At last, the little girl fell asleep again, leaving her mother to stare at the ceiling and wonder what to do. Should she get out of family planning and specialize in some medical practice that was less controversial? But that would be giving in to the bullies. It was intolerable to her sense of justice that these fanatics should beat her through intimidation. At close to four in the morning, Allison decided the hell with them. Let them win if they liked. They could have New Mexico, America, too. She would go to Africa and live on the veldt with the elephants and zebras, taking care of people dying of AIDS. Allison fell asleep thinking of a movie that had affected her passionately when she saw it as a young girl. The Nun Story in which Audrey Hepburn played a nun who fell in love with a handsome, cynical doctor, Peter Finch, in the Congo. The elephants stood by the river, the zebras galloped through tall grass, and Peter Finch whispered that he loved her. Allison slept soundly into the early morning hours until she heard distant voices murmuring in her dream. Baby killer! Baby killer! You can't hide from God! over and over again in sleepy rhythm. Baby killer! Baby killer! You can't hide from God! Then Angela was shaking her awake and yellow morning light was streaming into the bedroom. Mommy, there's some funny people outside. Allison sat up in bed, her stomach instantly in a knot. Outside the window she could see more than a dozen people standing on the road just beyond her front yard. The protesters had followed her home to San Geronimo, intensifying their siege. They were chanting, Baby killer! Baby killer! You can't hide from God! 8. Howard Moondeer was getting into hospital life. No need to think or plan. Just lie there and let the world go by. His roommate, the Spanish man who had fallen off a horse, had been discharged, and for the moment, how he had the room to himself. He was in the lap of luxury. About noon on Friday, how he ate his tray of hospital lunch and read through the San Geronimo Post, which came out once a week. The Post was everybody's favorite reading in town, always entertaining. For a town of less than 10,000, the people of San Geronimo had an amazing ability to get themselves into hot water. The main story this week concerned the murder-suicide of Donnie and Crystal Henderson. Apparently, the police were taking the two deaths at face value, and there was quite a bit of talk about the pressures and problems of a marriage that had gone very bad. Howie had spoken with Jack on the phone earlier that morning, and Jack held a very different opinion. As far as Jack was concerned, it was a double murder, and he was pissed that his best witness had been killed before he could question her. Howie studied the photograph of Crystal Henderson in the paper. She was the nose-ring girl, without a doubt, and now he knew where he had seen her, on the ski patrol at San Geronimo Peak. But what was she doing that day in Colorado Springs? Howie was still wondering about this mystery when Allison Hampton and Angela appeared unexpectedly in his hospital room. The little girl came up shyly to his bed and regarded him gravely with her huge blue-green eyes. Hey, Angela, how's it going, kid? I don't have to go to Kirky today, she told him. No, Kirky, huh? Well, that's great. Albuquerque, Allison corrected patiently. I never talk baby talk to her, Howie. Howie let his gaze travel from daughter to mother. From the toes upward, she was wearing ratty tennis shoes, tight faded jeans that were torn at one knee, a white t-shirt that had some writing on it about an AIDS foundation, and a light wool jacket that was a patch of muted colors and must have come from Tibet or Bolivia or Guatemala, take your pick. With the huge dark glasses perched on her pert little nose, she looked like a slumming movie goddess. For the first time since his accident, Howie felt the call of the real world. 
He looks scrumptious enough to eat, he assured her. Isn't the hospital food agreeing with you? I love it. And you know you're brain dead when you start looking forward to the meals here. She took off her dark glasses and smiled at him. But it was a sad smile, and she did not look happy. She pulled up a chair and sat close to his bed. How would you like to come live with me? she asked. Uh, er, live together? he gulped. Does it scare you? Well, maybe just a little, but they don't call us braves for nothing. Howie, stop being a clown. I'm scared to death. Those damn anti-abortion people appeared outside my house this morning, here in San Geronimo. It's gotten so I'm afraid to leave Angela alone, and I don't want to take her to work. I feel like I'm going crazy. To his surprise, Allison burst into tears and buried her face against the upper part of his good leg. Meanwhile, little Angela started crying, too, overwrought and frightened by her mother's tears. Howie managed to pull the child to him, and she buried her head against his shoulder. He was glad he could be useful, at least, a human handkerchief, but he couldn't help wondering how he had gotten himself into this sea of weeping women. Listen, of course I'll do anything I can. If you need me, I'm there. Though I don't know how much good I'm going to be with my leg in a cast. Howie made various comforting sounds, and one by one they stopped crying, first Allison and then the little girl. You know, there's something about you, Moon dear. Allison said speculatively, drying her tears. I don't know what it is, but you're reassuring somehow. Like an old sofa, he agreed. I just feel better having you in the house. Both of us will. I have a Spanish woman, Viola, who comes in and does everything, so you can just get well and hang out. But if there's trouble, Allie, what am I supposed to do? Go after the bad guys with my crutches? There won't be trouble. Not if you're there. I know these people, Howie. They're cowards. They won't try anything with the man in the house. Allie had it all worked out. She had even spoken in a professional capacity to his doctor and been given a copy of all his charts. The hospital had originally planned to keep Howie another two days, but she was able to convince them to release him into her care. I can look after you much better at home anyway, she assured him. We'll get to work on your rehabilitation, you know, it's important that none of your limbs or organs remain inactive for too long a time, or they'll wither. Are you saying we can play doctor, Dr. Hampton? We can play doctor all you want, patient moon dear. Mm, you're making me very impatient for it to begin, she smiled. Well then, let me go and make you an outpatient immediately. Howie checked out of the hospital and moved into Allison's downstairs guest bedroom late on Friday afternoon. He liked the guest room, even though it seemed a catch-all for spare furniture and all the odd things that Allison had not quite been able to make herself throw out, but didn't know what to do with. There was a chaste single bed with a virginal white cotton bedspread, an old beanbag chair whose innards were slightly leaking, a pair of cross-country skis forgotten in a corner, ice skates hanging by their laces from a hook on the wall, trophies from junior ski competitions long past, a desk with a personal computer. The computer was an antique as these things went, four years old, an IBM clone with an early version of Windows on it. Allison had a much newer setup in her office upstairs, but the downstairs computer was online, and she gave Howie her access code just in case he got bored and wanted to surf the Internet or send email to his friends. Make yourself at home, she said. Anything you want, you only have to ask. All in all, he could see that there were advantages to having a girlfriend who was a doctor. Allison gave him his medicine, his shots, brought him dinner and breakfast on a tray. She made him feel that if he were to break his other leg walking to the bathroom on his crutches, she would fix him up again in no time. She even crept downstairs to his bedroom in the wee hours for a bit of creative hanky-panky. And it did take creativity to commingle with an unwieldy cast on his leg. Life would have been idyllic except for the cast and except for the dozen anti-abortion protesters who had taken up a vigil outside on the road. The large front curtains of the solar living room had been closed to erase their visual presence, but how he found he could not forget them completely. Occasionally, when the house was very quiet, 
he could hear the distant blur of voices. Baby killer, baby killer, you can't hide from God. On Saturday afternoon, Allison needed to go into town to run some of the many errands she had been putting off since before her father's death, buy two new tires for her car, pick up her camera from the repair shop, shop for groceries, even drive out to her accountant's house to drop off some papers. Viola Suazo, the all-purpose Spanish cleaning woman, had come by to help look after Angela and Howie, so there would be two adults in the house in case anything happened, as Allison delicately put it. Even so, she had an attack of nerves before leaving the house. You're going to be okay? she asked, sitting on the edge of his bed. Believe me, any of those Christians try to sneak in here. I'll feed them to the lions, he assured her. Howie, I want to show you something. Come into the living room with me for a minute. Howie had done some practicing in the morning with his new crutches, and he was getting about with more confidence all the time. He followed her at a lilting three-pronged gate down the hall into the high-ceilinged living room, darkened now because of the closed curtains. She led the way to a tall bookcase along the western wall. Howie saw there were a lot of classics, Anna Karenina, Great Expectations, and Company, most of them in well-thumbed paperback editions. Allison reached up to the middle of the top shelf and pulled out a hardcover edition of Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead. Mailer's not really my bag, he told her. But if you have any Kurt Vonnegut, Howie, this is not a literary conversation. Do you know how to use a thirty-eight? Are we talking about thirty-eight as in pistol? I don't want to take it out, but it's on the shelf directly behind the book. A thirty-eight revolver with five bullets in the cylinder. The hammer is on the empty chamber. I've never had to use it, but I like knowing it's there. If there's any trouble while I'm gone, don't worry, Ally. I'm not much of a gun freak, but I can always wave the thing around and look like a damn scary Indian if I have to. How in the world did you decide to put it behind the naked and the dead? She smiled. I thought the title would help me remember where it was. It's up high, of course, so Angela can't reach it. I like the naked part, anyway. She kissed him lightly on the lips. Get your strength back, Howie she whispered, and then she was gone. 9. Howie and Angela spent an artistic afternoon together. She was the artist, that is, and he the canvas. The white blankness of his plaster cast inspired the little girl's imagination. Howie sat sprawled out on the living room sofa with his bad leg propped up on a stool while Angela worked on him with a box of colored felt pens. Remember, I'm going to have to live with this cast for the next few months, he cautioned. Don't move, she told him. Can I look yet? No. Like all true artists, she was a touch imperious. Howie really got a kick out of her. Her face was serene, yet extremely concentrated as she worked. Howie doubted if Michelangelo had set to work on the Sistine Chapel with a greater seriousness of purpose. He glanced through an old New Yorker, while she drew, but his mind wandered. It worried him a little, playing house with his snow maiden. He couldn't help but wonder where this was leading and how it would end, if she was only using him, and if at the end of it he was going to be one unhappy Indian. Yesterday, just before he left the hospital, Howie had phoned Jack to say he was moving in with Allison Hampton for a while, and that's where he'd be if Jack was looking for him. How he told Jack the news in his best aggressive defensive posture, prepared for a battle. But Jack had surprised him. You should do what feels right to you, Howie, Jack said mildly. But as long as you're there, frankly, there are some aspects of this case that puzzle me, and it could be very helpful to have you on the inside of things. You want me to spy on her? Howie asked, outraged. Exactly. You can be a sort of male Matahari on crutches. You're still on salary, of course. In the end, Howie agreed to it, more or less. He would pass on to Jack anything that might bear on the case, at least with the provision that personal stuff was none of Jack's damn business. Fine, fine, that's all I want, Jack said reasonably. So there he was, spy, lover, and invalid. The little girl was the only part of this whole scenario that seemed entirely right to him. He enjoyed hanging out with her. 
Now can I look? he asked. No, she told him moodily. Look, my leg's gonna go to sleep if I don't move it pretty soon. Okay, she said suddenly. You can look now. Well, well. His plaster cast had been transformed into a bright, multicolored panorama. There was a little girl with blonde hair and a red hat and red dress walking along a path with a basket on her arm, about to enter a forest of decidedly phallic trees, a girl-child's Freudian trees, if ever there were any. Howie saw a house in the forest, narrow and dark, and a blue river running nearby. A funny brown furry animal with long ears stood on a rock by the river. So who is this guy? A rabbit? That's not a rabbit, she told him. That's a wolf. Isn't he a bit round in the stomach for a wolf? He just ate grandmother. Ah, said Howie with sudden understanding. Was grandmother tasty? Angela shook her head with great solemnity. No, she tasted bad. And what does Little Red Riding Hood have in her basket? Angela had to think for a moment. Ice cream, she decided. What flavor? Brazilian Rainforest Crunch. Howie laughed. When he was a kid, he would have been hard-pressed to fantasize anything more elaborate than a cherry popsicle. He had to stretch and turn his cast from one side to the other in order to see all of Angela's creation. Who's this guy with the long black hair and the axe over his shoulder? She was astonished he didn't know. That's the handsome woodcutter. He looks sort of like an Indian. He is an Indian. That's you, Howie. Me? I'm the handsome woodcutter? She nodded. You mean I get to rescue Grandmother in Little Red Riding Hood? Yes, she assured him. That's your job. Later, they watched a Walt Disney movie together on the VCR in the den. It put both of them to sleep, Angela on the oversized pillow on the floor and Howie on the couch. Howie woke up when his legs started bothering him. He covered Angela with a crocheted blanket and then moved the curtain aside to peer out the window. A dozen protesters were walking in a lethargic elliptical pattern along the road, holding their signs with a noticeable lack of energy. These Christians for a moral America intrigued him. Who were they, really? What sort of lives did they lead when they weren't camped out in front of some doctor's house? Howie had an idea how he might find out more about them. He let the curtain fall closed, and then he hopped with his crutches along the hall to his bedroom, leaving the door open so he would hear Angela when she awoke. He pulled off the plastic dust cover from Allison's old computer and spent a few minutes trying to figure out how to turn it on. He poked and prodded until the machine fired up with an electric whoosh, and the screen began scrolling and chattering with information about bites and other esoteric matters. How he had used computers often enough in his academic life, but he had never had the patience or interest to learn much about them. Mostly he did an information age version of Hunt and Peck, simply trying different things and seeing what worked. At the C prompt, how he typed Win for Windows and then waited while various messages and flashy graphics appeared and disappeared. His first choice came when he had the program manager in front of him. He tried clicking onto the icon Accessories, got nowhere that he wanted to go, went back, examined his choices more closely, and this time brought the mouse onto Netscape Personal Edition. When he double-clicked, a new group of icons appeared, various email choices, and something that said My Account Dialer. This seemed like a promising direction, and in a few moments, he had typed Allison's password into the computer and was connected to the World Wide Web. This was where Howie was liable to get lost and frustrated. Computer nerds who cry the glories of the Internet usually don't mention the hours of wasted time waiting for connections to be made, watching the annoying little hourglass on the screen, arriving all too often at an inglorious electronic nowhere. Howie typed out HTTP www.yahoo.com, punched enter, and soon found himself in Yahoo, one of the few Internet servers he knew. Yahoo was a good starting place for computer illiterates like himself. He put the cursor in the search box, and after brief consideration, he typed three words, Christians, Moral, America. Then he tapped enter and waited for a match. To his surprise, there were 16 sites on the Internet that contained these three words, more than what he would have imagined. 
Number 11 was what he was after, Christians for a Moral America. He moved the cursor finger beneath the name, clicked once again, and a few moments later he was on their homepage. The problem with the information age, Howie had always thought, was simple. A world in which there is more and more information, but less and less meaning, is a world in which a person can quickly go mad. No wonder there were so many self-help gurus and cults. Mankind couldn't inhabit the vastness of this limitless world without a search engine, some grand yahoo in the sky to make sense of it all. This was the void that http www.cma.com, Christians for a Moral America, tried to fill. Their home page had slick graphics, and Howie could see that they had gone to some expense and trouble to present themselves in a positive light. Whoever had written the copy was very big on capital letters. Welcome to Christian America, Howie read. Our goal is nothing less than to obey, proclaim, and demonstrate the word of Jesus Christ, and to bring this great nation under God into full accordance with the law of Christian principles that our forefathers envisioned. Howie found himself staring at a color photograph of Dr. Fred J. Doran and his wife Kathy, who were apparently the guiding spiritual force behind the group. Dr. Doran was a rugged, deeply tanned middle-aged man who had a square face that was made even squarer by his crew-cut hairstyle. His wife, Kathy, was a plump, blonde woman, also deeply tanned, though slightly older in appearance than her husband. The doctor and Mrs. Duran were standing on their patio with a swimming pool in the near distance. They stood side by side, smiling into cyberspace with an almost insane amount of sincerity. Beneath the photograph there was a caption, A word of welcome from our president, Dr. Fred J. Duran, and his wife, Kathy. In this word of welcome, a paragraph, in fact, Dr. Duran took a decidedly folksy tone. He was a simple man himself, but he just wanted to say that it seemed pretty obvious to him that Jesus had great plans for America. We all had to do our part and live by the Bible so that this could become the great Christian nation that God had intended. Somehow, and it was no secret, the country had got off track recently. Pornography on television, lesbians in the White House, foreigners allowed to run things. What kind of America was it when children were taught that homosexuality was okay, where our kids weren't even allowed to pray in public schools? It was the goal of Christians for a Moral America to set these things right, and Dr. Duran hoped that every right-minded American person would be a part of this exciting crusade. I know you are asking yourself, what can I do to help? The doctor continued. I would like to make a special appeal to each and every one of you to open your wallet, your checkbook, your purse, break open your piggy bank if you need to, but please give generously to this important work. We are on the verge of a great victory. But unfortunately, the elitist liberals are gathering their forces to fight us to their dying gasp. I know that many of you good people are far from wealthy, but remember this. Every dollar you send to Christians for a moral America means another bullet in the war against Satan. All in all, it was mildly amusing stuff, though this last bit about another bullet in the war had an ominous tone. Howie kept scrolling through the website. There were individual articles describing various projects the CMA had undertaken. The group was fighting to make homosexuality a criminal offense in Colorado. And to highlight the urgency of this task, there was a story, meant to be terrifying, of a Denver restaurant owner who had been required by law to hire a gay cook who had the AIDS virus. CMA was active on many fronts. They were waging an expensive legal battle on behalf of a seventh grader named Polly Warden to teach creationism at public schools in the liberal elitist stronghold of Boulder. They were also active in the issue of parental rights, the right, that is, to raise a child as a Christian rather than an atheist humanist. As shocking as it might seem, the liberals were trying to make it a crime for a parent even to hit his own child. Of course, all these battles legal and moral, 
were expensive to wage, and each article called for renewed generosity from Christians everywhere. At last, Howie came to the protest action against the infamous child killer, Dr. Allison Hampton, in New Mexico. He clicked onto the lead sentence and found himself looking at a photograph of the Women's Cooperative Family Planning Clinic of Albuquerque. The name itself was an object of ridicule, with protesters outside on the sidewalk waving their banners and signs. The article estimated that the clinic murdered over 400 innocent babies each year and also encouraged rampant immorality by supplying free condoms and birth control information to teenagers. The language was very heated. Dr. Doron himself had a few urgent words to add to the debate. We must always remember what Holy Scripture tells us. Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Rescue the weak and needy. Psalm chapter 82, verse 3. Rescue those being led away to death. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 11. And as Jesus himself said most eloquently in the gospel according to John, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Nothing can be clearer, my friends, and no work today is more important for a true Christian than stopping the satanic butchering of innocent babes. To date, we have spent nearly 24000 in incidental expenses to support our six-month vigil against this so-called women's cooperative. Please support our important work in New Mexico. If you are unable to come march with us, but you want to show how deeply you are concerned about the murdering of God's children, please put your urgently needed donation in the mail today. Jesus certainly seemed to need a good deal of American greenback currency so that his will might be done on earth. The website was starting to depress Howie, and he scrolled quickly to the end. He couldn't resist clicking one final heading. Don't forget Bible Camp this summer. As Allison's computer received the transmitted information bite by bite, a photograph gradually began to appear, apparently showing some summer fun from last year's Bible camp. Howie smiled at how hokey all this was. The snake oil salesmanship, the constant ill-concealed greed for cash donations. But his laughter died abruptly when the photograph on his screen was finished. It showed a tall young man with a pale complexion and red hair standing with a group of children on a summery meadow near a lake. Howie's stomach went tight with remembered pain. The last time he saw this face, Howie had been lying in his own vomit in a Colorado Springs parking lot. It was a strange face, almost medieval. An El Greco face Howie had thought in Colorado Springs, but now, looking more closely, he considered Bruegel as a better choice of artists. This was one of Bruegel's mad, red-headed peasants from some crowded revelry in hell. What did he say to me? Does it hurt? What a bizarre question. Of course it hurt. He had just been kicked in the face. How he felt such a wave of nausea at seeing this red-headed man pop up on the screen so unexpectedly that he hardly even wondered at the intricate web of connections. What the Millennium Investment Corporation the San Geronimo Peak Ski Resort, and the fundamentalist Christians who were marching outside Allison's house might all have in common. Howie was so shaken that it took his eyes a moment to absorb the entire photograph. Good God! he cried out loud. The red-headed man in the photo stood with a bow and arrow in his hand. He was showing the children gathered around him how to shoot. The caption read, Luke Duran, demonstrates archery at last summer's Bible camp. Luke, who holds a silver medal in the annual Rocky Mountain Archery Competition, is one of the many fine people who volunteer each summer to help instill old-fashioned American values in our children. Says Luke to his young friends, a Christian always takes true aim. How he found that his hand was not completely steady as he dialed Jack's number. But no one answered at Jack's house. The phone just rang and rang. 10. Jack Wilder was in the jaws of a feeding frenzy beyond conscious control. This often happened when he was depressed. By 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, he had gone through an entire tray of scones and was pulling a second tray from the oven. Katya watched with interest, ears pointed, 
tongue lolling from her mouth as he set the scones on a side table to cool. So what do you think, Katya? Maybe we'd better try a few of these suckers. Make sure they aren't poisoned. He used a knife to cut two of the scones in half, and then spread unsalted butter and strawberry jam on each of the four halves. With the death of Crystal Henderson, Jack's investigation had come to a crashing halt. He had pinned everything on finding her, certain she would prove to be the key to unraveling the mysteries of Kit Hampton's final morning, and why he and Howie had been summoned to Doobie Rock. Jack was not entirely unaccustomed to investigative setbacks. He had suffered plenty in his more than twenty-five years on the San Francisco police force, but this setback was particularly annoying since his means of functioning as a detective had become so limited. He felt utterly stuck. With Howie out of commission, it was difficult even to imagine how he could develop a new angle of attack. Being stuck was only one part of Jack's depression. There was also the way Captain Gomez of the state police had treated him at the crime scene in Donnie and Crystal's blood-spattered living room. Unfortunately, Jack, in his blindness, had stepped into some of the blood, disturbing the evidence, making quite unforgivable footprints on the carpet. Captain Gomez no longer even pretended to be polite or respectful. He had taken a statement from Jack, and Emma as well, in a crisp, unfriendly manner, and since that afternoon had not bothered to return Jack's phone calls. This was frustrating for Jack because he wanted to know the results of the various forensic tests. He treated me like I was some sort of interfering old fool, Jack said to Katya. It was not a good sign, he knew, to be having a conversation with a German shepherd. Well, maybe I am in the way. Face it, if I was Gomez, I'd hate it if there was some blind ex-cop bumbling around, thinking he's some hotshot detective when he can't even see to avoid stepping through the evidence. My God, Katya, how did I ever turn into such a ridiculous figure? Well, hell with it. What'd you say we whip up a bunch of brownies, my friend? Katya thumped her tail with encouragement. As far as she was concerned, Jack Wilder was still a very great man, a wise master, and a fabulous cook. The telephone was Jack's last remaining investigative tool. At the moment, it was his sole connection to the outside world, and he had left messages on a number of answering machines in several states over the past several days. A few minutes before eleven, Special Agent Kevin Niemeyer from the Denver office of the FBI, returned one of those calls. Fifteen years earlier, Jack and Kevin Niemeyer had spent three days together on a particularly boring stakeout, holed up in a San Francisco hotel room, and they had done some male bonding, filling the time with endless hours of conversation, discussing everything from wine, women, children, to Zen Buddhism. "'Hey, Jack!' he cried into the receiver. "'How you doing, buddy?' Kevin couldn't have sounded more friendly. But with Jack's heightened sensitivity, paranoia, was it? He heard a subtle note of guilt in Kevin's voice. It was the discomfort of the perfectly healthy for the infirm and handicapped. Oh, I'm fine, Kevin, he lied. Not quite like the old days when I could see, but there is life after blindness. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I've been so damn busy. I've been meaning to call for more than a year now, see how you and Emma are getting on down there in New Mexico. Oh, we love San Geronimo, Kevin. The weather's great. We have a fabulous garden. Emma has a job she likes with a local library. I've even opened up a private investigations office with a bright Indian kid who functions pretty decently as my eyes. And it looks like you've got yourself quite a case here. Look, Jack, I'm in the middle of a monster day, so I'm going to skip the small talk. I ran those names through the computer, the ones you wanted me to check, Donnie and Crystal Henderson. Her maiden name is Hauptman, by the way, Crystal Hauptman. There's nothing on Donnie. He's clean as a choir boy as far as we're concerned. But Crystal has a sheet. Nothing big, and most of it comes from when she was a minor. I had to call in a favor to get a peek at her juvenile file. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Crystal Gale Hauptman. Apparently, she was named after the country singer, which may account for some of her troubles in life. Her father is Sergeant James Hauptman, who teaches small weapons training at the Air Force Academy. Her mother, Tina Hauptman, is a housewife. Crystal grew up in Colorado Springs. 
She and her family moved to the Springs when she was 11. Before that, she was all over the world, an Air Force brat, Germany, Guam, Hawaii, even a stint in Saudi Arabia. Probably it's not so easy to grow up in these military families moving every few years. When the Hauptmans settled in Colorado Springs, Dad and Mom became very active in the local Christian scene. The Springs is quite a gathering place for right-wing evangelicals, as you probably know. Crystal's problems started in high school. She was the family rebel, apparently. In 1989, she was picked up for selling two ounces of marijuana in the school parking lot. She was 15 at the time, and the court gave her a suspended sentence. Six months later, the same judge sent Crystal away to a youth camp in the mountains for a three-month stint. It seems her father beat the shit out of her one night, and the judge thought it best to get her out of the house for a while. He sent her to reform school because her father beat her up? Well, it was a conservative judge, Jack, and he happened to be a member of Sergeant Hopman's church. Apparently, Dad had found a box of condoms in Crystal's closet, and so the judge thought it was understandable, maybe even commendable, that he had applied some serious moral wrath. Probably he believed a few months in a youth camp would turn Crystal back into a blushing virgin. Naturally, it did just the opposite. She came out wilder than she went in, got busted the following year selling ecstasy to an undercover cop, spent another six months at the youth camp. And that's the end of her juvenile record. Apparently, she behaved herself during her last year of high school and even became something of a skiing star. There was talk that she might try out for the Olympic team, but she never quite got around to it. Mm, what about her adult record? There's only one mark against her there. She was arrested for prostitution in Lake Tahoe in 1994. Apparently, she was working as an instructor at Heavenly Valley and trying to turn a few extra bucks in the evenings by cruising the casinos. Heavenly was where she met her husband, Donnie. He was a ski instructor there as well. And that's all I got. Your girl seems to be a mixed bag, not exactly a nun, but she seemed to straighten out in recent years. If she was still seeking the lush life, I don't see her working a ski patrol gig. That's a lot of exercise, Jack. The pay's not great, and it wouldn't leave the lady much time for trouble. Yet, trouble found her in the end. Well, I guess it did at that. Listen, Jack, I have a guy in my office, an agent who's a real ski nut, and he knows tons of people in that world. I could set him loose a bit and see what he comes up with. Maybe he can find out something more about Crystal, maybe not. But uh, I'll give it a whirl if you'd like. Uh, I'd appreciate it, Kevin. Thanks. I owe you. No, I still owe you, Jack, for about a million and one things. Oh, shit, my other phone's ringing. I'll talk to you soon. After he put down the receiver, Jack sat quietly for some time. He was still at the kitchen table when Katya thrust her long nose into his lap, hoping to inspire Jack to further culinary endeavors. Nice guy, Kevin, he said moodily to Katya, scratching her velvety ears. But he feels sorry for us, Katya like this whole investigation is some sort of basket-weaving therapy for the blind. Well, we'll just have to show that son of a bitch, won't we? It was noon when Jack's phone rang again. He and Katya were just finishing up a few open-faced tuna sandwiches on homemade whole wheat green chili bread, piled high with avocado, sprouts, and melted Jarlsberg cheese. Jack and Katya were not exactly having a low-fat day. Jack. It's Josie Hampton. I'm sorry I've taken three days getting back to you, but I've been crazy busy, and this murder-suicide has really got me down. I bet it's Donnie and Crystal that you wanted to talk about, right? You bet. Mostly I'm interested in Crystal. Are you aware that she was seeing your father? Josie snorted. Screwing my father was the way I heard it from the state cops. Apparently it's why Donnie freaked out. Somehow he found out, and it drove him over the edge. Did you ever see your dad and Crystal together? Never. I didn't have a clue it was going on. Not that it surprises me. It's like I told you, the women just kept getting younger and younger. How well did you know Crystal? Not well at all. She and Donnie have been employees the past three seasons. They did a good job, and we were all very pleasant to one another, and that's about it. You never had a personal conversation with her? Josie paused for a beat. Not really. We rode the chairlift together once or twice. Mostly we just talked about skiing. 
You hesitated for a second. Is there anything on your mind? No, I'm sorry. I was just trying to remember, that's all. Tell me, Josie, who were Crystal's friends up on the mountain? Someone she might have confided in. I'm looking for anybody at all who can fill in the blanks about her. Well, there's Craig Watts, of course. He's the head of the ski patrol. Craig would probably know as much about Crystal as anyone. Where can I find him? He's at home. Actually, I just talked with Craig five minutes ago about some equipment I need to order for next season. Jack, I tell you what, why don't I swing by your house, and we'll go see him together. I have to pick up a list from him anyway. Then, if you'd like, we can stop by my office up on the peak, and I'll pull Crystal's employment file for you. Maybe there'll be some information in it you can use. Uh, that would be very helpful, Josie. Thank you. No problem. Believe me, I want to put this incident behind us before the bad publicity starts to hurt our season next year. Josie pulled by Jack's house half an hour later in her Jeep Grand Wagoneer. Jack buckled himself into the passenger seat, Katya jumped into the cargo area in the rear, and they set off into the mountains. She was a fast driver, too fast as far as Jack was concerned. He tried to tell himself he shouldn't be nervous, but, my God, she was a child, a mere thirty-one years old. What did she know about tragedy and sorrow, let alone how to drive a car? Josie, could you slow down just a little, please? Are you nervous? Was there perhaps a small note of glee in her voice? Only a little, he assured her. Anyway, we're not in such a hurry. She said she would slow down, but from the rush of wind outside the window, it seemed to Jack as if they were going faster still. He was thrown against the door by centrifugal force as they sped around a long mountain curve. Jack was almost glad he couldn't see. He had meant to use this time to ask her a number of questions, but now he thought it best to allow her to concentrate entirely on the hazards of the road. Craig Watts, the head of the ski patrol, lived in a high mountain valley a few miles from the chairlifts. The air grew colder and there was a scent of imminent snow in the sky when Josie finally brought the jeep to a stop. At this altitude, spring was still only a fragile promise. Jack could feel the looming presence of tall trees. They parked, and Josie came around to open his door. Craig's cabin is up the side of a steep hill, she told him. We have to climb quite a few steps. Are you going to be all right? If you just go ahead of me, I'll put a hand on your shoulder and follow behind. Katya ran free, ecstatically sniffing and peeing wherever she was able, while Jack followed Josie up a long flight of outside stairs. Craig built this cabin himself. There's no running water or electricity, but it's very picturesque. He lives alone? Yeah. Craig's one of those woodsy bachelors who's a little too eccentric for any woman to put up with for long. At the top of the stairs, Josie used a brass knocker on the front door to announce their arrival. Craig was expecting them, and the door opened with a creak of tight-fitting wood. Well, well, it's the infamous blind skier, said a growly male voice. Jack had met Craig Watts on April Fool's Day in the aftermath of Senator Hampton's death. From his voice, Jack pictured a big, gruff mountain man with a beard. Come on in, he said. I got a pot of coffee on the stove. The cabin smelled of smoke and the rough, woodsy aroma of a bachelor who lived alone. Josie guided Jack into a musty armchair that was greasy to the touch. Craig poured them all cups of strong black coffee. I'm trying to reconstruct Senator Hampton's final morning, Jack began. I'm hoping you can help me, Craig. I'll be glad to try. The cops sure haven't done shit, and I hate to see something like this drag on and on. It's not good for morale at the peak, and when morale is down at a ski area, accidents happen. Do you have any idea who killed the senator? Television, he growled. I beg your pardon? Television! Man, it's all that friggin' violence on the boob tube. It makes people crazy. To tell the truth, I'm constantly amazed that more people don't murder each other. People who live by themselves in remote mountain cabins tend to hold strong opinions. Jack nodded and did not contradict him. What can you tell me about Crystal Henderson? he asked. Crystal was a good worker. That's about all I can say. I have no idea about her personal life. I guess she was married to some ski instructor. Assholes, every one of them. 
As far as I'm concerned, the peak would be a whole lot better off without a goddamn ski school. Craig, my sweet, people come here to ski, and they want to learn how, Josie told him patiently. Better they should learn on their own. I did, he bellowed. Did you know that Crystal was having an affair with Senator Hampton? Jack asked. I make it a point not to know stuff like that. But, of course, after that nose ring business, it was hard not to suspect something was up. I don't follow you. Her nose ring. It was the only run-in I ever had with Crystal. It was around Christmas time when she showed up one day with a damn gold ring through her nostril. Now, I don't have any aesthetic or social problems with this, you understand, but we have a rule. No earrings, nose rings, no dangling jewelry when you work ski patrol. The reason is safety, because we ski in and out of some pretty close places, through trees and rocks, and it would be easy for a piece of jewelry to get caught on something. It would be a real drag for a patrol person to be rescuing somebody and then need to get rescued himself. So you told Crystal to get rid of it? I surely did. And I told her the same thing a week later when the damn thing was still in her nostril. That's when she pulled her little Kit says it's all right routine. And if I didn't like it, I was just being an uptight male chauvinist pig. Artistic people need to express themselves, she said. Hell, I told her she was suspended from the job until the damn thing came out. I see, Jack replied judiciously. So she went to Kit, and Kit came running to me, saying this was getting close to the 21st century, and we all had to be sensitive about matters of hairstyle and personal adornment. Besides, we didn't want a lawsuit on our hands. I told him, screw that, Kit. Forget sensitive. This is a safety issue, man. I don't want to see that girl take a tumble and come out of the snow with her nose ripped off. We had quite a discussion about it. Old Kit stood his ground, and I stood mine. But, you know, when push came to shove, he was the boss. There wasn't much I could do except resign. And frankly, I wasn't in the mood for unemployment last winter. So I said, hell, all right, we'll chuck the whole thing, if that's the way you feel about it. From now on, the ski patrol can come to work in hula skirts if they want. Jack felt the conversation was getting out of hand. He tried to pull it back into focus. Let's talk about the morning of April 1st, he suggested. Did you see Kit that morning? Sure. I saw him take the 745 chair to the top. It runs just for ski patrol and lift employees at that hour. He was alone about four or five chairs ahead of mine. Isn't that unusual? To ride a four-person chair by yourself? Mm, not really. At that hour of the morning, everyone's just waking up. I prefer myself to take the first ride alone. Just me in the mountain. No friggin' bozo skiers anywhere in sight. Sounds very peaceful. Did you see Kit again that morning? Not up close. Just a glimpse of him skiing. Skiing where? He was coming down El Lobo Ridge through the new powder. I was on a chair riding up the backside, and I just happened to look up. The public's not supposed to ski there, so I got him in my binoculars. It was Kid, all right. He was coming down from the avalanche hut in the ridge? Possibly, I don't know. What time was this? About 9.30, I'd say. He liked to ski that chute. It's steep, man, but there's a hell of a view. Surely there wasn't any view on April Fool's Day. It was snowing hard that morning. Craig made a dismissive sound. That wasn't what I call snowing hard. Just a little spring fluff. Anyway, the clouds were moving pretty fast. A day like that, the visibility changes from second to second. I saw him when the clouds had lifted a little. Who was the ski patrol person assigned to the number three avalanche hut on April 1st? Crystal. Probably I wouldn't remember, but she was up there alone, and generally that's a no-no. How did she happen to be alone? Her partner missed work that day. Dennis Abrams. Normally, you understand, everyone on ski patrol works in pairs for safety reasons. Crystal shouldn't have been up in that hut by herself, but we were shorthanded because of the storm, and she convinced me that she would be okay. And her partner, Jack asked in a neutral voice. Did you ever find out why he missed work that morning? Well, it was the damnedest thing. His car was vandalized the night before outside his house, down in town. The tires were slashed. It took him all morning to get it fixed. I bet it did, Jack agreed, allowing himself 
the smallest smile. 11. Jack sat in Josie's office while she read aloud to him from the two separate employment files that the ski resort kept on Crystal and Donnie Henderson. The building was quiet, and her voice seemed unnaturally loud in the empty space. There's something sad about a ski resort after the season is over, Jack was thinking, like a party the morning after, or a carnival that is closed. There was nothing of interest in Crystal's file that Jack did not already know. She had lied in a few places on her job application, leaving out her various stays in a Colorado youth detention center and her arrest for prostitution in Lake Tahoe. But such omissions were to be expected. Few people admitted the darker episodes of their past when applying for a job. Jack listened to the bold statistics of her life. Born January 9, 1974, in Munich, Germany. Height, 5'6", weight, 122 pounds. He heard about her schooling, her interests, computer graphics, astrology, learning more about first aid and mountain rescue techniques. But at the end, she was still a blank, this pretty skier with a nose ring, Crystal Hauptmann Henderson. The slashing of her partner's tires from the ski patrol suggested careful planning for the murder of Senator Kit Hampton, but Jack had suspected careful planning all along. He sensed someone behind her, some guiding intelligence. But who? Who? God damn it, he wished he had gotten to her when she was still alive. Her husband Donnie was from Menlo Park, an upper-middle-class suburb of San Francisco. He had lived a less adventurous life than Crystal, elementary school and high school in Menlo Park, then an inconclusive year and a half at San Francisco State. Jack visualized a slouchy young man with few interests and goals, who spent his winters at ski resorts and his summers in various low-paying jobs, often working as a waiter in restaurants. It was hard for Jack to imagine what had brought Donnie and Crystal together, except they were both more than a little lost, and they liked to ski. Josie had finished reading the two files and was waiting for Jack to comment. With difficulty, Jack pulled himself out of his reflective slumber. Millennium Investment Corporation, he said. Can you tell me who they are? They're Colorado people a real estate development outfit of some kind, but I've never had any contact with them myself. They own approximately 2,000 shares of the peak. Dad had dealings with them, of course, but I'm only just learning about that side of the business. How much is 2,000 shares worth? Mm, a bit over $2 million. Have you come across any correspondence between your father and Millennium? Any memos, contracts? Nothing. Dividends are sent out on a semi-annual basis to all of the investors, but that's done by our accountant in Santa Fe. Did your father travel to Colorado Springs recently? Not that I know of. I never heard him mention Colorado Springs at all, except in a derogatory way. He hated the right-wing politics there, naturally. So you really can't tell me anything about Millennium? Well, only that Dad didn't like them very much. He once told me he wouldn't have let them into the business at all if it had been up to him. Unfortunately, they invested back when the peak was still in a blind trust. A blind trust, Jack repeated with a smile. Actually, I'm not certain how trusting we blind people really are. It was when Dad was in Washington, she continued. So he didn't know anything about it until he lost his re-election and returned home. What wasn't there to like about them? He said they were pushy. They expected to have too much say in the day-to-day -day running of things. I remember there was something unpleasant about six or seven years ago. Someone from Millennium came down here and tried to convince Dad to expand the backside of the mountain with a new chairlift and a year-round resort village, with condos right on the slopes. That sort of thing is very big in Colorado. Dad squelched the idea in a hurry. He tried to explain these things just don't fly in New Mexico. The water regulations alone are hellish down here, and we'd never get approval for something like that anyway. Who did your father talk to from Millennium? I don't know. I got this all secondhand from Dad when he grouched about it a few times over dinner. I'm sorry to be so vague, Jack, but at the time I was concentrating all my energies in an entirely different direction. Lift maintenance, restaurant supplies, making sure the payroll got out on time, all the thousand little details that go into an operation like this. Is there anything else you remember about Millennium? Anything more recent? Not a thing. I'm sorry. 
Well, I still can't understand it, Jack told her. Fortunately, I have an FBI friend up in Denver who's looking into Crystal's background a bit more closely. We'll just have to hope he can uncover what she was doing up in Colorado Springs last week with the Millennium people. The FBI has become involved in the case? Not officially. This is only a friend doing me a favor. Josie caught her breath. For some reason, this news seemed to bother her. Look, I'd appreciate it if you let me know if they come up with anything dirty on Crystal. I don't want a scandal here. It's our reputation, Jack. Skiing's a dangerous sport, and it's essential that the public has a high level of trust in the ski patrol. That's reasonable, Jack agreed. Nevertheless, there was something in her voice which he could not entirely fathom. Why was she suddenly anxious? Was there something about Crystal that caused her fear? For the moment, he drew a blank and decided to let it pass. Let's talk about your half-sister, Allison. You've given me a pretty good idea of your family history, but I'm interested in the last month or two. How would you characterize the relationship between your father and Allison this past winter after she moved to San Geronimo? Was it warm? Strained? Any difficulties between them? I'm trying to get a better fix on Allison. She's elusive in my mind. Being elusive is a big part of my sister's fatal appeal for men, Josie said dryly. Anyway, as far as she and Dad go, I'd say they were on good terms recently, though there was a bit of a blow-up right before Christmas. What sort of blow-up? She asked him for a loan of a hundred thousand dollars, and he turned her down. Really? Do you know why she needed the loan? For her clinic, naturally. A worthy cause, I'm sure, but it's also a huge money loser. Allison has been operating that clinic in the red for years, and this winter she came very close to closing down. So she tried to hit up Dad in order to stay afloat. Actually, I was surprised when he said no. I'm surprised, too. I understand he donated quite freely to various non-profit groups. Yes, he did. And I believe he gave Allison the money originally to get the clinic started. But Allison has no business sense at all, you know, and for Dad... It was starting to seem like throwing cash down a well. Half of her patients never bother to pay, and her records are chaotic, if she bothers to keep them at all. Dad was generous, but it worried him to see Allison being so careless about money. He said it was her upbringing, that she didn't know the value of a buck, etc., and he wasn't going to bail her out any more because it was time she grew up and became more responsible about practical matters. The whole thing was full of paternal overtones that had nothing to do with the original matter of the loan. Allison was furious and accused him of being a pseudo-liberal. That's the phrase she used, and he didn't like it one bit. So if Allison didn't get the loan, how did she manage to stay open? Well, this is a secret. Allison has let her medical insurance lapse. That's always been her major expense, you know, the real killer of running a small clinic like hers. Without the monthly premium, she's been able to limp along for the time being. She's hoping to get her insurance up and running again as soon as possible, and with her inheritance, that shouldn't be too long now, of course. Meanwhile, she's just keeping her fingers crossed that someone doesn't sue her. Sounds like a dangerous gamble. It's insane. I tried to tell her it was crazy to go without insurance, but apparently her premiums are outrageously high due to the fact that she does abortions. This is also typical of Allison. She thinks she's on some sort of holy mission to help poor women take charge of their bodies, which is very admirable, of course, but she has a tendency to let everything else in her life go to hell. Josie snorted with disdain. Somehow these high-minded people always leave the rest of us to pay the bills. Yes, I see what you mean, Jack murmured in agreement. But he was thinking more of Josie's manner. She was agitated, talking too quickly, too loudly. Something was bothering her. Even her smell wasn't right. There was a scent in the room, the musky odor of fear. After twenty-five years of interviewing suspects, Jack had a second sense in these matters, a sense that had become even sharper with his loss of sight. What the hell is bothering her? The success of an interrogation depended entirely on taking advantage of such small openings as this, and Jack didn't want to make a mistake. Was she holding back something about Allison? He paused to let his mind roam the possibilities. Then he had it. This wasn't about Allison at all. Josie had become agitated 
at exactly the moment when he had mentioned the FBI was looking into Crystal. Josie was hiding something about Crystal. Jack struggled to keep his poker face, but his heart beat faster, sensing he was on to something. Tell me, Josie, when's the last time you spoke with Crystal? I thought we were talking about Allison. We were, but let's go back to Crystal now. Well, I told you, we rode the chairlift together once or twice. I guess the last time I spoke with her must have been February but maybe it was earlier than that. Jack decided it was time to gamble. No, I think you spoke with her a lot more recently than February, he insisted gently. Tell me the truth. I am telling you the truth. Why should I lie? Jack had no idea why she should lie. He knew nothing at all. But at this point, he could only press forward and pretend he was omniscient. Listen to me carefully, Josie. I helped you out of a jam once, right? You know you can trust me. But you've got to tell me everything. I'm telling you. I remember now, the last real conversation I had with Crystal was at the end of January on the Martin Luther King weekend. We took the chair together up the back side of the mountain, and she told me about some Texan the patrol had to sled down that morning with a broken back. Martin Luther King Day is always our biggest weekend, and the ski patrol keeps pretty busy. Jack shook his head sadly and pressed his bluff. You can't hide the truth from me. I know about you and Crystal. Why can't you trust me, Josie? Jack, you're starting to piss me off a little, she said angrily, but he heard a note of doubt in her voice, a crack in her defenses. I've got to warn you about my FBI friend, Kevin Niemeyer, he told her, leaning forward in his chair with intimacy and warmth. He's really good. Incredibly thorough. This isn't like dealing with the local cops or a blind detective like me. Kevin's going to put half a dozen agents combing through Crystal's life, finding out everything about her, all her relationships, everyone she's telephoned, all her incoming and outgoing calls, particularly the most recent. There are records of these things, Josie. So whatever you're holding back, this is the time to tell me. Do you understand? If you made a single telephone call to Crystal that you haven't told me about, or she to you, it's going to look very bad. Jack felt her increased agitation, and he knew that she was going to break. He recognized the signs. The denials, the evasions might go on another hour, but it was like landing a fish you had on the line. She could still get away if he wasn't careful, but he was confident of his skill and very patient. Josie lasted nearly another twenty minutes, but in the end... It was a much bigger fish than he had imagined. This is such a nightmare for me, but I can't tell you, Jack. I just can't. Yes, you can tell me, Josie, he insisted. If you're in trouble, I can help you. But it's not really trouble. It's just so... Well, it's embarrassing. In my time, I've heard everything. Believe me, there's no way you can shock an old cop like me. This is more something where I think I shocked myself. It's, well, I was seeing a guy for a while last fall. Nothing too serious. His name's Donald Kassenberger, a nice Jewish lawyer in town. But then he dumped me in mid-September, and it left me feeling just slightly bitter about men in general. So I had an affair. This is extremely difficult for me to admit, Jack. You had an affair with a woman? Yes, she said softly, almost a whisper. A few bells went off in Jack's mind. Lights flashed. The truth dawned. You had an affair with Crystal Henderson? Yes, she said again, and burst into tears. After Crystal's death, Josie Hampton had been living in fear, a horrible, gnawing fear that the truth would come out. It was all so humiliating, and perhaps it might even implicate her in crimes she knew nothing about. She pleaded with Jack to help her. Yes, there were telephone calls. At one time, quite a few telephone calls. But she was innocent, she swore to God, of every crime except foolishness when it came to sex and love. Jack listened carefully to her confession as it poured forth. As romances go, it was not a huge affair. It lasted less than a month, in October of last year. 
In today's world, many men and women would feel no shame, would, in fact, be proud to admit to a homosexual relationship. But Josie Hampton was not comfortable with what she had allowed to happen, nor did she particularly think of herself as gay or bisexual or any of the words that people seem to use these days with such astonishing ease. She was just drifting, experimenting. She wasn't even sure what exactly. And then at the end of October, on Halloween after a gay costume party, she became disgusted with herself and broke it off. Did this mean she actually knew Crystal any better than she had admitted to Jack earlier in the day? No, Josie said. Crystal had been a mystery from start to finish, almost more of a mystery after they had been to bed together than before. The whole thing had been entirely sexual, nonverbal. They had spent a few weekends at a discreet gay lodge in the Colorado Rockies, where they rarely ventured out of bed. At the end, Josie felt almost suicidal, like she was drowning in something. I just couldn't keep it going. Deep down, I'm too conservative, Jack. So I told her it was over, and that was the end of it. Did she accept gracefully your breaking it off? Oh, absolutely. We never referred to it when we met at work. It was like it never happened. Only it did. Then it must have been disturbing to you when you discovered she was seeing your father afterward. Disturbing? Jack, ever since Captain Gomez told me on Wednesday evening that Crystal and Dad had been lovers, I've been feeling half insane. It's hard to describe exactly how claustrophobic this is for me. Incestuous, really. I feel so dirty and confused. Now, Josie, I don't see anything at all in this business that should make you feel dirty, Jack told her. But let's talk more about Crystal. Would you say that she was the one who seduced you? Oh, yes, absolutely. When it came to sex, she was a predator. Then she probably seduced your father as well. Do you think... Maybe I'm being paranoid, but do you think she had us marked in some way? Dad and me? I think it's entirely possible. She must have set out deliberately to seduce you both. Did she ever ask you about business? Well, yes. Now that you mention it, we talked about the ski industry quite often. I thought it was just a way to avoid any really personal conversation. But I wonder if she was pumping me. What did you tell her? Basically everything she wanted to know. She was curious about the peak's income, taxes, insurance, how many skiers we average each year, the kinds of environmental regulations we deal with, how a private corporation is set up. None of this is secret information, of course, and skiers can get awfully obsessive once you start talking shop. But come to think of it, we talked about business a whole lot. Did she ever mention Millennium? You know, she did once. She asked me about them, who they were, just like you did, but I couldn't tell her anything more than what I told you. I said I'd look into it, but that was just before we broke off, so I never got around to it. Apparently, she just changed Hamptons. I'd imagine she began to ask your father the same kinds of questions she had been asking you, probably with more success. This is so strange. There was a shiver in Josie's voice. I wonder what she wanted from me and Dad. What the hell was this all about, anyway? Jack had to admit he was wondering exactly the same thing himself. Josie drove Jack and Katya home later in the afternoon. They had not been in the house five minutes when the phone rang. It was Kevin Niemeyer calling to say that he'd managed to pick up a few interesting tidbits he wanted to pass on. The first item was that Crystal Henderson had received a traffic ticket in Aspen last October for an illegal U-turn. Not exactly the crime of the century, but when Kevin's agent dug a little deeper, trying to learn what exactly Crystal had been doing in Aspen, he discovered that she had spent several weekends at a small but expensive lodge that catered to the gay world. A little more digging, and the agent learned that Crystal had been in the company of Senator Hampton's daughter Josie. Jack thanked Kevin for the information, and mentioned, just a tad smugly, that yes, he had come across this same information himself. Jack was so pleased with himself that he missed what Kevin was telling him next. I'm sorry, would you say that again? This is something we picked up from your New Mexico state cops, Kevin repeated. I wasn't entirely certain if they were keeping you up to date with their investigation. They're not, 
Jack admitted unhappily. Well, that's their mistake. Anyway, this may mean something, or it may only be a coincidence, but Crystal's autopsy showed she had an abortion approximately two months ago. A rather late-term abortion, as a matter of fact. Second trimester. And guess who the doctor was? Jack took the plunge, not at all liking the increasingly close family weave. Dr. Allison Hampton? You got it, Kevin agreed. Dr. Allison Hampton. Twelve. On Sunday morning, Howie played Gicket with Angela and the sagebrush behind the house, out of sight of the protesters who were still keeping their vigil in front. Gicket was a game that Howie had invented, a cross between golf and cricket, played with one of his crutches and a Nerf basketball. Howie was feeling pretty chipper all in all, batting the spongy orange ball to Angela and making silly Tarzan noises as he swung around the sagebrush on his crutches. Angela was delighted with his clowning. She glowed with laughter and the little girl's flirtatious excitement at finding herself in the spotlight of male attention. Howie bet Angela that he could beat her to the pinion tree at the back edge of the property. They were racing across the sagebrush, Howie galloping on his crutches with Angela in the lead, when Jack and Emma pulled into the driveway. "'Looks to me like Howie is rehabilitating just fine,' Emma remarked, describing the scene to Jack. "'Youth,' Jack told her enviously. "'It heals quickly.' Emma walked Jack along the path to the rear of the house, where Howie and the child were playing. "'I'm just dropping him off,' Emma called to Howie. "'But don't worry, I'll be back in an hour.' Howie sent Angela inside the house, saying they would play some more gicket later. Then he and Jack sat down on an old-fashioned patio swing that Allison had set up on the desert behind her house. "'You're recovering fine, I take it?' Jack asked. "'Sure. I'm getting pretty good on my crutches. So good I'm going to be a parent volunteer at Angela's preschool this Tuesday. One of the other kids is having a birthday party, and the mother called last night to see if Angela can come.' Allison's been keeping Angela out of school, you know, ever since the pro-lifers showed up in San Geronimo. So you're going to stay with Angela at school? Yeah, that's me, bodyguard to the tots. Allison says she'll feel easier if I'm there keeping an eye on things. Is this going to be a steady gig, then? No, just Tuesday for the birthday party. Allison's still not sure what she wants to do with Angela in the long term. I think she's hoping for some sort of miracle that maybe these... Christians for a moral America will pack up and find someone else to terrorize. Jack began pushing the swing with his foot in a restless, dissatisfied way. Howie wasn't at all certain what he was thinking. If you want me back at work, maybe Wednesday is the day, Jack. As I say, I'm getting pretty good with these crutches, and the leg isn't hurting too much. I'm thinking I could even drive a car in a pinch, as long as it was an automatic. Have you thought about replacing the Toyota? Maybe next week. We'll go down to Santa Fe together and pick something out, probably another truck. Meanwhile, I think it's best for you to stay here and look after the little girl. I can understand why the mother is worried. And since you're here, there's something I'd like you to look into for me. A little more snooping, huh? Listen, Howie. Allison knew Crystal Henderson. At least she performed an abortion on Crystal this past winter. I want to know more about it. Allison has performed a lot of abortions, Jack. Doesn't mean she had any special connection with Crystal. Well, that's what I want to find out. It's starting to bother me how closely everybody seems to be interconnected in this case. Why should Crystal go all the way to Albuquerque to Allison Hampton for an abortion? Why not? My guess is Dr. Hampton knows her stuff, and these days women prefer going to a lady OBGYN. Yes, but I understand there's a perfectly good woman doctor here in San Geronimo so she could have saved herself a long drive. And here's something else. Crystal was having an affair with Josie Hampton. With Josie? You've got to be kidding. Josie's gay? It sounds more like a bit of lifestyle experimentation. Still, it's a curious coincidence, particularly since her father was having an affair with Crystal as well. In fact, there's a chance the child that Dr. Allison Hampton aborted would have been her half-brother or sister, had it lived. So, you see, it's hard to imagine that Crystal just 
came across the women's cooperative family planning clinic in the phone book. This sounds a little tangled, Jack. Yes, it is, and we're going to untangle it. Jack went on to tell Howie about Allison asking for a loan from her father to keep her clinic going. Howie's undercover mission was to snoop out anything he could learn of these matters. Howie was uncomfortable with the role of spy, but he said he'd do his best. Then he told Jack his news. I found some interesting stuff yesterday on the Internet. Guess who won a silver medal in archery? Howie told Jack about the Christian website and how he had come across the photograph of Luke Duran, son of Dr. Fred J. Duran, with a bow and arrow in his hand, and how this same Luke Duran happened to be at the shopping mall parking lot in Colorado Springs, sitting in a car having a conversation with Crystal Henderson, which meant one more loop added to the knot. San Geronimo Peak, the Millennium Investment Corporation, and now the Christian group that was making life hell for Allison Hampton. Jack listened, deep in thought, rocking the swing so violently with his foot that Howie had to hold on to the armrest to keep from falling off. That night, after Angela went to sleep, Howie and Allison played Scrabble in the living room in front of a burning log in the fireplace. What about a prize? Allison suggested. The winner gets a blowjob, okay? It was more than okay. How he had trouble concentrating on the game instead of the prize. Still, they were neck and neck until Allison scored a decisive lead with the word zygote, placed in the upper left-hand corner of the board, covering the red triple-word square. Howie told her it was unfair using her medical background to come up with a biology term, but Allison's smile only deepened to a warm glow. The final score, Allison 197, Howie 171. Time to pay up, Howie, she told him with a smile. The prize-giving took place in the guest bedroom. Howie was always astonished at the beauty of her naked form, the delicate, sculptured smallness of her shoulders and legs and breasts. He lay on his back on the bed, and she straddled him, bringing herself down upon his mouth. It seemed the easiest way to arrange matters with the inconvenience of his plaster cast. Howie found her clitoris with his tongue. He knew he had just the right place when she exhaled sharply. There was something very soothing, he found, in the rhythmic licking and lapping of an oysterish labia, a slippery meditation, these wet lips rubbing against his face. Mankind crawled out of the sea millennia ago, and to the sea he must occasionally return. When she became more excited, she pressed down harder upon his mouth and rode him back and forth. This went on for a long time, and as far as Howie was concerned, it could go on forever. But after a while, Allison told him to put two fingers up inside of her, and then he watched as she masturbated herself with her own fingers to a shuddering climax. Oh, my God! she cried. She laughed. She moaned. And then she stretched out beside him on the bed. Howie, meanwhile, was hard as a rock and suffering a certain degree of physical distress, but a deal is a deal, and he did his best to think of something unsexy in order to calm down. He remembered he was supposed to be asking Allison all sorts of ugly questions, and this did the trick. The flag of his desire went down to half-mast. Was it all right? he asked her. Howie, it was more than all right, she assured him. When you die... I hope you'll donate your tongue to science. Howie smiled. But the more he thought of the snooping Jack wanted him to do, the more unhappy he became. What was half-mast a few moments earlier was now entirely limp. Honey, you're looking a little deflated. What's wrong? It's Jack, he told her. There are some things he wants me to find out about you. To be honest, I'm supposed to be spying and learning all your deep, dark secrets. Allison propped herself up on one elbow and regarded him with interest. Really? I'm afraid so. Only I'm no good as a spy. I don't even know how to begin. I wouldn't let that worry you. Frankly, Howie, you're so good in bed that it's easy to forgive a few deficiencies in other areas. So why don't you just ask me what you want to know? Just ask you, huh? Well, why not? Here you've got me naked and vulnerable and 
so satisfied with sex that I can hardly think straight. So go ahead and take advantage of me. I don't mind. Well, okay. Jack wants to know if you knew Crystal Henderson. Crystal Henderson? Allison repeated the name dubiously. Isn't that the girl in that murder-suicide? I heard about it on the radio while I was driving to Albuquerque the other morning. Did you know her? I don't think so. Should I have? She was Josie's lover for a while last fall. Jack just found this out. Josie? Allison cried. Josie finally had her lesbian fling? I don't believe it. Allison howled with laughter. Actually, I do believe it. Why do you say finally had her lesbian fling? Did you see this coming? Absolutely. Think about it, Howie. Dad deserted her as a child. He treated her mother like shit. Then she had a stepfather who was a drunk and pretty much abused her. She's always carried a lot of really deep anger, mostly about men. All her boyfriends were creeps, at least the ones she told me about. But it's like she was reenacting all the negative feelings she had about men. I think every single one of her boyfriends dumped her in the end. Frankly, I think it's a great thing she's finally come out of the closet. Maybe she'll be happy now. What about Crystal? Did you ever meet her when she was with Josie or any other time? Allison shook her head. No, I don't think so. Now it was Howie's turn to prop himself up on an elbow and study her. She was a pretty girl. Dark blonde hair. She worked on the ski patrol. A nose ring through one nostril. Allison continued to shake her head. Sounds like a thousand other girls you see in ski resorts. Tell me something else about her. She had an affair with your father, too. How long an affair, no one really knows. But she and your father managed to screw on the very morning he was killed. Allison laughed again. A sharp, unkind laugh. Poor Josie, she cried. But there was something gloating in her voice. My God, she must have been devastated when she found out she was sharing her little romance with Dad. So, Crystal Henderson still doesn't ring a bell? The girl sounds fascinating, Howie. That's quite a feat, after all, getting it on with both father and daughter. But no, I don't think I ever met her. You gave her an abortion, Allie. Probably sometime two months ago. She was in her second trimester. Allison still looked mystified. Then her mouth opened. Ah, oh, Crystal. You know... I do remember now. But Henderson wasn't her last name. Hauptman. That was the name she gave me, Crystal Hauptman. Hauptman was her maiden name. Well, I guess that's why I didn't make the connection earlier. But I remember now. She came to me in mid-February. A pretty girl with dark blonde hair. But you know, Howie, I see so many of these girls, they all sort of blur together after a while. You can see why Jack is curious about this. Here's this girl who, before she gets murdered, has an affair with your half-sister, and then with your father, and then goes to you for an abortion. The baby, well, it could have been your father's child. Aha, uh -huh, said Allison. The plot thickens. How positively baroque. I can see why Jack's wondering why she came to me. Of course, I do have an excellent reputation as a doctor, you know. I get women referred to me from all over New Mexico, even some from Texas, Oklahoma, as well as Arizona from time to time. I'm good at what I do, Howie. I know you are. But you can see how odd this is. Even if you didn't know who she was, she certainly knew you. You think so? Maybe it was just a coincidence, her coming to me. Not with your name, Allie. You don't have an affair with someone named Josie Hampton, then Senator Kit Hampton, and then go to a Dr. Hampton for an abortion without suspecting a family connection. Well, maybe you're right. But I just don't have a clue about it. For me, Crystal Hauptman was only one more patient. Probably I wouldn't even remember her name except for one thing. It's a little kinky, actually. What's that? Allison smiled mischievously and ran a fingertip lightly down Howie's chest. Her nostril wasn't the only place she was pierced. She had a small gold ring through her clitoris. She told me it was a wedding ring. Ugh, said Howie. Oh, it could be put in without any pain, though she would certainly be sore for a few days afterward. Have you ever made love to anyone with a ring through her clitoris, Howie? Not once, Howie assured her. 
though I knew a lot of people into body piercing at one time. It's quite the fashion among a certain set in New York. I even heard of body piercing performances down in the East Village, a kind of theatrical event where you can watch people cut themselves in various places. Personally, it was never quite my thing. What do you think it means, Howie? Means? he repeated. Well, I don't really know. At first I thought it was like our Indian sun dance. You probably know about that. No, I don't. Tell me. I always thought a sun dance was very, well, sunny. Not so sunny, really. The way it works, a brave will pierce himself and thread leather thongs through his chest, then suspend himself by these thongs from a wooden beam. Some of the guys hang like that for hours, even days. It's a way to transcend pain and take a walk into the spirit world, a kind of out-of-body experience, I'm told. You've never tried it? We Ivy League Indians generally just drink a little too much Chardonnay when we're looking for that out-of-body high. Well, whatever turns you on, she said, her fingertip tracing downward to his soft tangle of pubic hair. Would you like to screw a girl with a ring in her pussy? Are you saying it's supposed to be sexy? You know, you really are awfully innocent, Howie. Of course it's supposed to be sexy. That's what it's all about. Howie was meditating on the mysteries of gold rings and vaginas when he felt Allison's fingertip very softly stroking his cock. The flag began to rise. Now, I find that sexy, he admitted. Of course you do. But this is only the meat and potatoes of eroticism. Don't you feel an occasional desire to explore new frontiers? She flashed him a most feline smile and then moved her head so that her tongue could take the place of her fingertip. She licked upward from the root toward the tip as though he were a popsicle. Ah, he groaned. That's right, a little pleasure, she told him. But then she did something insane. She bit down sharply on the tip of his penis with her neat, bright teeth. It was only a jab, a quick snake bite. She didn't actually break skin. The hurt was abrupt and exquisite and made Howie jackknife to a sitting position. And a little pain. She laughed triumphantly at his distress. Allie, for Christ's sake, he cried angrily. He didn't like it, but he was so horny and overfull, he was afraid he might explode in her face. Well, that's your lesson for today. Now just lie back and relax, Howie. I've always believed that Scrabble is a game in which everyone should come out a winner. 13. Bright Rainbow Preschool was located in a converted adobe house on the edge of the historical part of town. It was a pretty building, set in a large playground behind an old wooden fence. Howie had always heard that this was the preschool in San Geronimo, very progressive, a trendy parents' co-op of enlightened ideals where all the kids seemed to have names like Chelsea, Brittany, Dylan, and Mesa Moon. These favored children were encouraged to discover their inner worth, to eat hot vegetarian lunches, and even dabble on kitty computers to get a jump start on the information age. Very nice. But it made Howie wonder about the poor kids in town, all the Hernandos and Billy Bobs and Ritas, who generally stayed home with someone's grandmother in front of the TV, eating junk food and getting whacked whenever they did something wrong. The divisions of a class society are planted early, he told Angela on Tuesday morning as they walked together into the school. She grinned at him and crinkled her nose. Angela looked awfully cute this morning in a Babar the Elephant sweatshirt and green corduroy pants. She didn't know what he was talking about, but just about everything that Howie did and said made her laugh. Allison's maid, Viola, had driven them to the school in her huge old American car. It was a sunny, spring-perfect morning. Even the wind, often so savage in New Mexico, had died to a complacent murmur. There were geraniums by the front door and the sounds of high-pitched, overexcited children's voices within. It all conspired to put Howie in an idyllic mood. Won't it be fun to be part of a kiddie birthday party? He thought, in ignorant bliss unaware that as he passed through that pretty preschool doorway, he was entering the very jaws of hell. Angela was in the camisa room, and her teacher was a young woman with frizzy brown hair and huge worried eyes named Phaedra Holbrook. 
Phaedra and her assistant, Heidi Schlumberger, both appeared on the verge of collapse. They had fourteen children between the ages of four and six to look after, and they were hugely grateful for help, any help at all, even an Indian guy on crutches. Look who we have here, everybody, Phaedra announced to the children in an exaggerated happy, happy voice. This is Howard Moondeer, and guess what? He's a Native American. Phaedra, of course, knew exactly why Howie was here, and she had promised they would keep a particular eye on Angela. Probably she meant it, too. But as the day wore on, Howie saw how difficult it was to keep on top of anything. Two of the children in the group were the objects of bitter custody battles, and there were special instructions to remember about them as well, which relatives could pick them up, and which were banned by court order from even appearing at the school. Two other children required special medicines. A third was allergic to nearly everything. A fourth must be watched with particular attention because he had recently bitten another child so badly that the victim's father, a lawyer, was threatening legal action. And, as if this wasn't enough to keep in mind, there was always Shanti, the youngest, who at the age of four had somehow missed toilet training and at odd times of the day had a sweet way of announcing she had just gone caca in her pants. With so many possible calamities at hand, a child who might become the target of Christian wrath was just one more disaster waiting to happen. On Tuesday, they were overwhelmed nearly from the start. Two of the boys, Christopher and Colin, had just seen a new Batman movie, and they were eager to reenact for the other children the fabulous ways that the grown-ups had killed one another. Brittany's parents were getting a divorce, and the first thing Brittany did when her mother dropped her off was throw a yellow building block at Chelsea, who burst into tears that didn't stop for fifteen minutes. Her parents were getting a divorce, too. The situation was made even more hectic by the birthday party that was planned for little Buffy Fletcher later in the day. Buffy was turning five, and her mother, Shannon, had wanted to make it a memorable occasion, with games, prizes, and an enormous cake. Since they were having such fine spring weather, Phaedra had decided days ago to hold the party itself at Ernie Martinez Municipal Park, which was five blocks away and had swings and slides and an open field. Buffy's mother had agreed to deliver the cake and various birthday treats to the park at noon exactly, and then remain to lend additional adult supervision. Such, at least, was the plan. At eleven o'clock, after circle time, Fourteen small human beings were lined up in pairs, holding hands on the sidewalk in front of the school. Phaedra led the procession toward the park, while Heidi took up the rear, constantly on the lookout for stragglers. Howie, hobbling at an easy gait on his crutches, minded the middle, and for a while things went fairly smoothly, as excursions go with fourteen children of preschool age. They arrived at Ernie Martinez Municipal Park at approximately 11.45, entering from the parking lot. Ernie Martinez, how he discovered through a bit of research, was the only native son of San Geronimo to lose his life fighting Nazis in the Second World War, and as a result the town fathers had named an acre of brown patchy grass after him, a few dusty cottonwood trees, a dilapidated set of swings, a jungle gym, and a tennis court with a sagging net and weeds growing up through the cracks. The kids ran directly to the swings, slides, and jungle gym to await the arrival of Buffy's mother with the cake and a lasagna she had agreed to bake. But this was the first serious glitch in the day. Shannon Fletcher was nearly half an hour late, and by the time she arrived, the kids were already over-hungry and overwrought. Mrs. Fletcher was full of exasperation and apologies. She said it had been a hell of a day, and she was terribly sorry, but she had a major crisis at home. Her hot water heater was broken. The plumber could only come this afternoon to fix it, or she would have to wait until the end of the week. Clearly, she could not live that long without hot showers, laundry, and her automatic dishwasher. So she would have to drop off the cake, the lasagna, the party favors, and run. She could not stay to help supervise the party after all. Phaedra blew up. She would never have brought fourteen children to the park for a sugar-fest birthday party with only two fully mobile adults to supervise and one volunteer on crutches. But Shannon Fletcher was adamant. She could not, would not stay, and that was the end of it. Well, I guess we'll just have to cope, won't we? Phaedra said to Howie and Heidi through clenched teeth. Her happy, happy voice was showing serious strain. The preschoolers began running every which way around the park, 
enough to make a sane adult dizzy with despair. Later, there were a lot of things that Howie could not account for in that day, the most striking of which was the child he was there to watch, Angela Hampton. In a preschool setting, Howie discovered it is the destructive children, those who are about to act out and bonk each other on the head, who occupy 99% of a teacher's attention. Sweet little Angela was so good-natured and well-behaved that she became more or less invisible. Even Howie hardly saw her. Lunch was a free-for-all fiasco. Pieces of cake ended up on the ground, accompanied by hot tears. Christopher and Colin had to be restrained from throwing lasagna at each other. At a climactic moment, four-year-old Shanti pooped in her pants, and Heidi had to take her off into the bushes to get her cleaned up. Unfortunately, they had forgotten to bring an extra set of pants and panties for her, and the little girl most definitely could not be allowed to run around naked in a public park. Not in today's climate of sexual paranoia. This meant that Heidi needed to return to the school to fetch some extra clothing. If the school van is free, drive it back to the park, Phaedra told her frantically before Heidi took off on foot. At least it'll make it easier to get the kids home. So there were two adults now, Phaedra and Howie, to look after fourteen children. By the time lunch was over, they were both nearly numb with stress and exhaustion. One of the boys said, let's play hide-and-seek, and Phaedra decided this might be a good idea, a chance to let them all run off some steam. Hide-and-seek was the final undoing of the afternoon. Howie was it, since he was on crutches. This gave the kids an advantage in whooping in around him and safely touching home, a languid cottonwood tree that was in the first stages of its spring bloom. For each round, Howie closed his eyes and counted to twenty in a loud, melodramatic voice. The children scattered with screams of excitement throughout the park. They hid in gullies, behind trees, sometimes in the shrubbery clear over by the parking lot. Phaedra allowed the game to go on for over a half hour, and still Heidi had not returned with the school van. Every now and then the two adults counted heads. One, two, three, four, all the way to fourteen. Fourteen little bodies running around like maniacs in their colored t-shirts like an abstract painting in motion. Phaedra finally decided they'd have to walk back to the school, and she called all the children together from their various hiding places with a kind of pagan chant. Ollie, Ollie in! Free, free, free! When they were gathered around, she did a head count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. But this was the wrong number and she and Howie both counted again. One, two, three. Stand still, everybody! Four, five. But again they arrived at the unlucky number thirteen. Howie felt the first cold fingers of panic. Phaedra shouted, actually shouted at the children and told them to line up together and not move. The children had never been shouted at before, and they were so surprised that they did precisely as they were told. Then the adults counted again, one to thirteen. There could be no mistake this time. Number fourteen was missing. Who's not here? Phaedra cried. It took only a moment now to identify the missing child, the quiet one, the nearly invisible Angela Hampton. Howie told the children, Don't move. Don't move an inch if you know what's good for you. Then he galloped around the park like a madman on his crutches calling for Angela. He looked everywhere, and so did Phaedra. They searched behind bushes and trees, gullies and picnic tables. They shouted until their voices were hoarse, Angela! Angela! The game's over! Angela, I'm not joking! Come in wherever you are! But she did not come in wherever she was. It was inconceivable. Could a child simply evaporate? Howie was nauseous with fear and outrage. There must be some mistake, he kept saying to himself. He had to be dreaming this. The thirteen remaining children stood in a small forlorn group, some of them crying, feeling the panic in the air. I don't think I checked that clump of brush by the tennis court, Howie cried, taking off in his three-legged hobble across the park to the spot he had in mind. But Angela was not there. While Howie was poking at the brush with his crutch, Heidi finally returned with a school van. She said the van had had a flat tire that needed to be changed, and the jack hadn't been in its proper place. It was all very frustrating. The hell with the van, Phaedra screamed. Find a goddamn telephone and get the police. It was a New Mexico state trooper, nearly an hour later. 
who discovered the fate of little Angela Hampton. There was a note folded in a thin strip sticking out of the end of a soda can, like the fuse of a bomb. The can had been sitting unnoticed near the jungle gym, half filled with pebbles to give it weight. The message inside was in capital letters, a computer printout. Repent, baby killer, and your daughter will be spared. The can, how he noted, was a diet Dr. Pepper. Part 3 The Ghost Dancer 1. Midnight, Tuesday, April 13th Josie Hampton sat by herself in the haze of Rio's lounge, getting drunk on tequila and grapefruit juice. The room smelled of beer and cigarettes and the urinals from the men's room nearby. There was music coming from the jukebox, an old Janis Joplin tune, and the sound of pool balls colliding on green velvet. Rio's lounge on the south edge of town was the best San Geronimo could offer in terms of sin and late-night sleaze, catering to a mix of druggies and gays and people of all persuasions who lived on the edge, everybody cruising for brief bouts of satisfaction. Josie couldn't remember the last time she had been so drunk, and man, it felt great. What's up? she said to a guy with long, stringy hair who was passing her table. She knew him from someplace, probably the peak. Hey, I heard about your sister's kid, he said with sympathy. It was on the TV news. Real bummer, man. A bummer, she repeated incredulously. A bummer? Some pedophile, huh? the guy said, shaking his head. Suddenly she was furious. What the hell do you know about it, asshole? she snarled. He forked her the finger and walked away. Josie held up her empty glass to the waitress. Another tequila grape, she said. The jukebox went from Janis Joplin to Grace Slick, singing White Rabbit. There were some retro 60s freaks in here tonight, putting down their quarters for the old songs. Josie slipped out of her seat and glided toward the few square feet of open space in front of the jukebox that served as a dance floor. She clapped her hands and shimmied her body in rhythm to the beat. She was getting loose when she noticed a dark-haired woman come onto the floor to dance nearby. At first they were separate orbs, two different people dancing to White Rabbit. But then the woman came closer, and shimmied when Josie shimmied, and shook when she shook. They made eye contact, and in a moment they were dancing together. Well, why not, Josie thought. Get me drunk enough, I'd screw a grizzly bear tonight. When the song was over, the dark-haired woman whispered in her ear, Let's get out of here. Go someplace. In a little while, Josie told her. Right now I want to dance. You like to shake those buns, darling? That's right. I love it. I love to dance. Midnight at Garden of the Gods Park in Colorado Springs was another matter. As Dr. Fred J. Doran walked with an oversized flashlight along the path to the special place, he was thinking angrily that it was cold as a witch's tit and dark as a well-digger's asshole. This was no night for a Christian to be out of bed. "'You're in serious doo-doo, boy,' he declared aloud after he stumbled on the uneven ground. The special place where he was headed was a hilltop in the park from where there was a great view of the mountains, at least during the day. He and Luke used to come here when Luke was a little boy, just the two of them, for Fred had been the sort of father who spent a lot of time with his boys, Luke most of all, because Luke had been his favorite. This is what hurt Fred beyond measure. Lord, they had tossed footballs and gone on overnight hikes. Why, one season they even drove clear up to Denver to see every single home game the Broncos played that year, watching from seats that were pretty damn close to the fifty-yard line. And now the kid was trying to destroy him. You're trying to destroy me, Luke? Fred bellowed as he climbed the path. I know you're up there, boy. I just know it. Fred was breathing hard by the time he reached the top of the hill. Sure enough, Luke was standing in the clearing in the exact spot, the special place, where Jesus had appeared to the boy when he was nine years old. Luke always came here when he needed to think. Always. Fred had been with Luke on that long-ago afternoon. He didn't see Jesus himself, of course, because he was an adult and had committed a few sins in his time and though his heart was in the right place, he was no longer what you might call entirely pure. But even Fred had felt something that afternoon. He honestly had, when his stepson had fallen to his knees 
and his unblemished child's face had filled with utter radiance. Lord, it was spooky. It was like there were angel wings beating in the air. Afterward, neither Fred nor Luke ever told the soul about what had happened. Not Dwight nor Fred's wife, Kathy. Nobody. Turn off the flashlight, Father, Luke told him. I hope you're praying, boy. I seriously hope you're praying, Fred told him sullenly. But he flicked off the flashlight, and now they were both only shadows in the velvety darkness. It wasn't my doing, Luke said. His voice was even and calm. Hell, it wasn't. Where have you hidden that child? Damn, I'm out of breath. Fred found himself gulping in air. Being so angry and shouting and climbing the hill all at the same time, it completely tuckered him out. Careful, father. Anger is a sin, Luke told him. As Fred's eyes became accustomed to the dark, he could see Luke better the longer he stood there. The boy had become a stranger to him, this tall, pale young man with the face of a saint. Why are you trying to destroy me, son? My God, I had cops in my office all afternoon. The damn FBI, even. They're going through all our records, everything. Do you understand what I'm telling you? These people, because of what you've done, they're going to put us under a microscope, and they're not going to stop until they know every damn thing about us. I mean, are you crazy? Didn't this cross your mind even slightly before you grabbed that lady doctor's brat? This isn't my doing, father. This is the Lord's work. Don't lie to me, Fred thundered. He had gotten so he hated it when Luke spoke of Jesus, but he forced himself to keep his voice down since he didn't want to broadcast family problems to the entire world. Worse even than the cops, he hissed. I had a dozen phone calls this morning from some of our biggest contributors asking what the hell we're up to, calling attention to ourselves right at this time when there are all kinds of deals in the works, all sorts of things you don't even really know about. Oh, I know. I know all about your big contributors, too, and the money, money, money you get from them. That's what you're all about, isn't it, Father? Money. You're all getting rich, you and your friends, and the tragedy is the kingdom of heaven is slipping away, so far away. I don't need any damn sermon from you, Luke. No? Then perhaps I should save my sermon for your small contributors. All those sad, beguiled souls who keep sending you their hard-earned cash to do Jesus' work here on earth. I wonder how they would feel if they discovered their money is being invested in shopping malls and ski resorts. Fred Durand was hardly able to breathe. It was unbelievable, hearing Luke speak to him like this. You've done this deliberately, haven't you? He cried in astonishment. You are trying to destroy me. Luke Duran narrowed his cold blue eyes to his father's, and a cruel smile appeared on his lips. Dad, let me tell you something, he explained quietly. You are the only person destroying yourself. You don't need me to do that. You don't even need Jesus. You're greedy, you're ignorant, and you're absolutely empty inside. Without thinking, Fred Duran slapped his stepson hard across his face with his open hand. Luke staggered and fell to his knees, with blood around his nose and mouth. He seemed dazed for a minute and unfocused. Then he rose to his feet, and when it looked as if his father was going to hit him again, he calmly offered his other cheek. This was more than Fred Durand could bear. Terrified, he turned on his flashlight and jogged heavily down the hill to the safety of his Cadillac de Ville. Midnight at Dr. Allison Hampton's house, Howie sat exhausted, almost catatonic, at the wooden table in Allison's kitchen. There was a uniformed state policeman on one side of him and Jack Wilder on the other. None of the three men heard Allison as she came barefoot down the stairs from her bedroom, not even Jack, though his hearing was very sharp. Allison was dressed only in her white nightgown, and she moved with the stealth of a jungle cat. She stepped quietly to the bookshelf in the living room and stood on tiptoe to reach for Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead on the top shelf. She pulled out the novel and then the thirty-eight revolver that was hidden behind the book. Jack was the first to hear something wrong. What's happening in the living room, Howie? Howie looked in time to see Allison running toward the front door with a gun in her hand. She looked so much like a hallucination it took a moment for him to move. 
By the time he found his crutches and went bounding after her, Allison was already outside in the driveway, running quickly toward the road. She had decided to kill a few Christians for a moral America, as many as she could get. It was the only thing she could think of that might give her a little relief. She began firing the revolver as soon as her bare feet touched the main road. The first shot was a disappointment, as the hammer came down with a dull click on an empty chamber. But the next round fired with a deafening roar. The kickback of the pistol made the barrel fly upward in her hands. She lowered the barrel more carefully, pointed the gun toward the place in the road where the protesters had been marching so relentlessly during the past few days, and began firing round after round all five bullets in the gun. It was an orgy of smoke and noise, but when the smoke cleared, she saw that the road was empty. The Christian vigil had pulled up camp and gone home hours earlier at the first news of the kidnapping. Allison screamed in frustration as Howie came up alongside her and took the gun from her hands. She fell to her knees. She pulled her hair. She howled with rage. But her rage was futile. Like shooting bullets at a ghost, some unseen spirit of midnight air. 2. The great media invasion of San Geronimo began on the day after the kidnapping. By morning an army of sleek vans with satellite dishes affixed to their roofs appeared in town and could be seen cruising the streets, stopping occasionally to interview anyone who had anything to say about the crime, no matter how trivial or repetitious. It was a huge story, the kidnapping of an abortionist child stirring up anger on both sides of the contentious divide. On the afternoon following the kidnapping, Howie sat with Jack around the same heavy wooden table in Allison's kitchen, where they had sat the night before. It seemed to him that time and motion had ceased. Howie had missed a night of sleep, and exhaustion gave everything a dreamlike clarity. Sunlight was streaming in the large solar window, filtering through Allison's private jungle of green-growing plants. He knew he would remember these things forever. The banana tree in a huge pot by the window, the orange tree near the refrigerator. And on the kitchen table itself, among their cups of coffee, a half-dozen avocado pits, sprouting in jars filled with dirty water, like a science experiment gone amuck. Howie blamed himself desperately. How could he have let Angela out of his sight in the park? The enormity of his failure burned in his chest and gave an unhealthy glow to his cheeks. Allison was upstairs sleeping, thank God. After her raging hysteria last night, shooting at shadows in front of her house, a doctor had been summoned to give her an injection that knocked her out, and he had returned with another needle in the morning. Outside in the front yard, the driveway was crowded with police vehicles. Farther away on the road itself, stood a dozen media vans and cameras trained on the house waiting for something, anything to happen. It was hard for Howie to conceive of such perfect specimens of humanity, these squarely handsome six o'clock newsmen and women with their superb speaking voices and plastic bodies. Howie hated them on principle and wished they would go away. It had become a waiting game now for Howie and Jack, just as it was for the reporters outside, waiting for the kidnapper to make the next move waiting for a forensic report from the police lab, waiting for some big shot to show up from the Denver office of the FBI. Howie felt that at any moment he might start shooting at shadows himself. It would be better than sitting here endlessly, staring at the dismal avocado pits on the table. He closed his eyes and must have fallen asleep in his chair, because suddenly there was a commotion and several strangers had appeared in the kitchen. jack you old son of a bitch! Good to see you, man! Kavinsky, my friend. Jack Rooney. Kavinsky. Was this some sort of strange tribal greeting between law enforcement personnel? Through bleary eyes, Howie saw Jack shaking hands with a mild looking middle aged man who was dressed in a tweed sports coat and brown slacks. Howie wondered if they were giving each other a secret handshake. Kevin, this snoring kid is my assistant, Howard Moondeer. Howie, say hello to Special Agent Kevin Niemeyer. Special Agent Niemeyer looked to Howie more like a small-town pharmacist than his idea of an FBI investigator. He had a bullet-shaped head that was bald and shiny on top, with a narrow ring of dark curly hair around the ears. He wore thick glasses. Howie was struck by his sheer ordinariness. 
Yet he must be important because there were two young FBI agents in suits hovering around him in a very respectful attitude, waiting to do his bidding. All three men pulled up chairs to the table and sat down. Howie, you'd better put on another pot of coffee, Jack suggested. We're in for a long haul. Three hours went by while Kevin Niemeyer's two aides took notes, and Jack and Howie recounted every detail of the events that had led them from Doobie Rock to this table in Dr. Allison Hampton's kitchen, from the murder of Senator Hampton to the apparent murder-suicide of Crystal and Donnie Henderson, Allison's troubles with the right-wing Christian group, the kidnapping, the mysterious Millennium Investment Corporation, and the shadowy figure who had tried to kill Howie as he was driving home from Colorado Springs. Kevin had heard some of this before in pieces over the telephone with Jack, but he wanted to put the story as much as possible into a clearer sequence. Kevin Niemeyer was a careful listener, cocking his head thoughtfully to one side, chewing on the end of a ballpoint pen, and interrupting occasionally to ask a question or give an instruction to one of his two aides. Once Jack and Howie had told their story, Kevin recounted what the Bureau had done so far. There was still a forensic crew examining the crime scene at Ernie Martinez Municipal Park, but it would be several days, perhaps weeks, before all the information was sifted through and sorted out. Meanwhile, the area around the park had been canvassed, and neighbors asked if they had seen or heard anything unusual yesterday afternoon. So far, no witness had come forward with anything helpful. All these facts seemed very tedious to Howie. Personally, he was in a mood for something big and conclusive. Grand deeds, a daring rescue. But Jack and his law enforcement buddies were more into a painstaking study of minute details. Particular attention was being given to how the kidnapper had arrived at the park, where he or she had hidden while watching the children play, and how the perp, as Jack and Kevin tended to call this genderless individual, had delivered the note in the Dr. Pepper can. The park apparently had two entrances. The main entrance was by the parking lot along Martinez Street, but there was also a small back gate from Carson Road, a narrow street that bordered the eastern edge of the park. A rusted chain-link cyclone fence enclosed the park, but it was old and sagging, and there were many places where a person could easily climb in and out and be hidden in the dense brush. There was also an overgrown path that passed along the outside perimeter of the fence and exited into Carson Road where a car or van might have been waiting. It was possible that this was how the kidnapper had managed his or her invisible approach and escape. It was a struggle for Jack in his blindness to visualize the dimensions of the park, the precise distances from the parking lot to where the children had been playing, and to the various entrances and possible hiding places. It took a good deal of time for Kevin and Howie to describe to Jack every possible detail of Ernie Martinez Municipal Park, so that Jack finally had a clear picture in his mind. Another hour went by in this manner, and Howie was astonished to see that Jack and the FBI agents showed no sign of wear. As for himself, he was starting to feel the way he had in college after studying three nights in a row for final exams. All the facts were starting to swim in his head. Okay said Jack at last, holding the immensity of detail in his mind like a juggler performing a difficult act. Now, the Dr. Pepper can. That was found thirty-five feet west of the back fence and twelve feet north of the jungle gym? That's right. Well, I don't see how it got there, Jack decided. On the face of it, it's downright impossible. It was weighted down with pebbles, Howie reminded him. It could have been tossed from the fence. Without attracting anyone's attention? I don't believe it. You were hardly more than thirty feet away yourself, Howie. Don't you think you would have heard the can hit the ground? Under normal circumstances, sure, but not necessarily with all the noise those kids were making. Even so, I still can't imagine that the perp would have risked giving himself away like that. Jack frowned behind his dark glasses, the furrows of his forehead converging into a V above the black plastic frame. Well, I'm glad to report we have an honest-to-God clue, said Kevin Niemeyer with a smile. A clue, huh? Well, don't keep it from me, please. We're talking fingerprints, Jack. On the Dr. Pepper can. That's the good news. The bad news is that we have a whole bunch of them. Too many. 
Maybe the grocery clerk who sold the thing, maybe a bunch of friends who passed it around taking swigs after a game of tennis. God only knows. But here's the intriguing part. One of the prints comes from the right thumb of a young child. It's only a partial, but we should be able to get a match. Jack's frown grew deeper. Damn. One of the preschoolers must have picked up the can at some point during the game of hide-and-seek. Probably moved the thing. That's about the size of it. So now we need to find out which kid it was and where exactly the little darling found the can originally. We have two child psychologists flying in from California. We've been holding off interviewing the kids until they arrive. If their parents don't object, we'll fingerprint the preschoolers and see if we can get a match from the can. All this is going to take a few days at best, maybe longer. As you know, Jack, it's tough as hell working with very young children, not to mention their parents, and unless we're careful, any evidence we get from a four- or five-year-old will be thrown out of court anyway. You know, Kevin, I can't believe this was just a crime of opportunity. Someone had to plan this snatch carefully, and to do that, they would need advanced knowledge of where Angela was going to be yesterday afternoon. I agree, and we're making up a list of everyone who knew about Buffy Fletcher's birthday party. But take a guess, Jack, just how many people we have so far. Well, with fourteen children and their families, and of course the teachers at the school, I'd say you have maybe forty names so far. Fifty-two, and it's still growing. You have to take into consideration the people who baked the cake, who are fundamentalist Christians, by the way. Even the plumbers who came to fix Shannon Fletcher's hot water heater, they knew about the birthday party too. It goes on and on. I have a team of ten agents down here, but I still think we're looking at two or three weeks just to lay the most basic groundwork in this case. Unfortunately, that little girl may not have two or three weeks. Can you requisition more help? I have another ten agents on their way. This kidnapping has national priority. Even the president has made a statement about it. The damn thing's very political, of course, but I still think we're out of time. What we need is a little bit of luck, and maybe an inspired hunch. That's where I'm hoping you come in, Jack. You've always been good at hunches, so give me one now. You want a hunch? Jack asked bleakly. He sighed and then remained silent for quite a long time. If I were you, I'd be looking for a ghost dancer, he said finally. Kevin smiled thinly. Are you talking about an Indian, or some religious nut, or what? I'm talking about a metaphor. Not necessarily an Indian, nor even one of the Christian protesters, though it might be someone from either of these groups. I can't give you anything very precise, because this is still too shadowy in my mind. But I'm picturing someone who is dispossessed, angry. There's a chance this is a hate crime against the entire Hampton family. Killing the senator, terrorizing the daughter, and now snatching the granddaughter. Someone who wants to bring this family to its knees, Kevin. Punish them for being the elite. Anyway, you asked for a hunch, and that's as close as I can come. No, I like it. I like it, Kevin said agreeably. So let's give our shadow a name, and call him the Ghost Dancer. Why not? He certainly managed to spirit away that little girl in a ghostly fashion. So this Ghost Dancer, tell me, Jack, is he crazy? Is the person we're looking for a madman? Crazy, Jack repeated. No, I don't think so. I would say, rather, that he's inspired. Inspired by what? The voice of God. A burning bush, I don't know. But he's following a master plan. Kevin's smile grew broader. Well, then, that's just fine and dandy. Because as it happens, I have a candidate I'd like to nominate for the role. A guy who sees burning bushes everywhere he looks. Special Agent Niemeyer opened his attaché case and pulled out a file. He opened the manila cover to a photograph that he gave to Howie. Howie had seen the picture before. A tall young man with light red hair and cold blue eyes, who was standing surrounded by children, with a bow and arrow in his hand. Jack, I have a guy here I'd like to describe. Allow me to introduce you to Luke Doran. Three. It was turning into an unpredictable day. 
less than an hour after the gargantuan bull session with Kevin Niemeyer, how he found himself staring out the rear window of a huge American station wagon as they made their way northward through the high empty desert into Colorado, how he had the back seat to himself, and he sat sideways with his leg propped up. Jack was asleep in the front passenger seat with his head against the window. This was VIP treatment, how he supposed, to have use of an FBI car and driver. The driver was a sullen young agent with wraparound dark glasses named Corky Roth. Corky spent the entire drive chewing gum and looking as if he wished he were doing something more useful than driving two physically challenged individuals to Colorado Springs. Certainly the FBI had to be in dire straits to seek the help of a blind detective and an Indian graduate student who had his right leg in a childishly painted plaster cast, a cast that Howie could not bear to look at with its colorful drawing of Little Red Riding Hood and a very pregnant-looking Big Bad Wolf. Howie tried to stretch out in the back seat and get some sleep, but his leg hurt and his mind was racing. He had been reluctant to leave Allison alone, worrying that she would need him when the tranquilizers wore off. But then Viola, the old Spanish woman, offered to sleep at the house for a few days, and Jack seemed to think this was a good idea. There was something very comforting about Viola. The old woman had an earthy peasant strength that might be just what Allison needed right now. How he felt so useless he wanted to scream. He had failed in his role as bodyguard to the tots. Allison didn't need him, and he wasn't certain how he could be of any help to Jack. Not knowing what else to do with himself, he reached for the FBI file that was in his green day pack and read carefully through it one more time, hoping for a clue a miracle, anything at all that might save Angela Hampton. The patriarch of the family, Dr. Fred J. Duran, was a dentist, it seemed, not a theological doctor as Howie had always assumed. The man was six feet three inches in height, according to the FBI file, and 240 pounds in girth. There was a color photograph stapled to the file that Howie found fascinating. It showed Fred and his two boys, Dwight and Luke, standing together on some perfect summer day in the green foliage of a park, with barbecue smoke rising behind them. In the background, there was the blue hint of a lake. Fred was wearing a frilly apron that looked pretty silly with his huge shoulders and square, beefy face. The top half of the apron had some writing on it, Jesus Loves. But what Jesus Loves was cut off by the frame, leaving this great theological question unsolved. Does Jesus love his hamburger medium rare? Or would he love another diet Dr. Pepper, please? The photograph was evocative, so clear in detail that how he could see Fred's nose was crooked from an old break, perhaps the result of some long-ago game of hardball catch with his boys. Dwight, the youngest boy, was wearing a tank-top shirt and a baseball cap backwards on his head. He was about to chomp down on a hot dog. The photograph caught his hunger that greedy moment before the first bite, the bun and wiener poised with relish and mustard, raised expectantly to his mouth. Luke, meanwhile, stood on the far side of his father, taller, slighter in build, more pale in complexion. He was dressed in a dark blue polo shirt, and there was an enigmatic smile playing on his lips. Despite their godly inclination, there was nothing sanctimonious about the Doran men. The photograph captured an outdoor-loving Colorado clan, the sort of all-American family that would have a speedboat in the yard for tearing up summer lakes and a fleet of snowmobiles in the garage to roar through the silent snowy woods in winter. Everywhere they went, they would leave behind a whiff of gasoline. As for Jesus, how he imagined they thought of him as someone pretty much like themselves, a big, outdoorsy, rocky mountain Jesus, a kind of Paul Bunyan swaggering through the woods with a chainsaw in hand. Howie turned his attention to the text. According to the file, Dr. Fred J. Duran had been born near Alamosa, Colorado, on October 24, 1941. His parents operated a small farm that went bust in the mid-fifties, leaving Fred to make his own way in the world. After high school, he got a job as a vacuum cleaner salesman in Pueblo, Colorado, and supported himself through two years of junior college. Then a stint in the Marines, 
a tour in Vietnam, and an undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Science, from Adams State College after his release from the armed services. Fred had then drifted for a number of years before discovering his true calling. He managed a restaurant, sold automobiles, and drove a cement truck, finally deciding to enroll in a small dental college in Colorado Springs. He was thirty-five years old when he opened his first dental office, a late bloomer, but at this point the unique talents of the man came bursting forth. Within five years he had three offices in different sections of Colorado Springs. Five years after that, there were eighteen Dr. Duran dental emporiums throughout Colorado, mostly in shopping malls. He advertised on radio and television with a clever jingle and a cartoon logo of a dancing tooth with a big smile and a cowboy hat. The home of happy teeth was his well-advertised motto. His goal was to be the McDonald's of the tooth trade. You never needed an appointment at a Dr. Duran outlet. You could walk right in off the street. There soon came a time when Dr. Duran personally did very little actual dentistry. It was more expedient to run his growing empire from an office high in a new office building in downtown Colorado Springs. On the personal side, Fred married Kathy Lindstrom in 1971, a pretty blonde woman of Norwegian descent who had a seven-year-old child, Luke, from an earlier marriage. Luke's real father was in prison at the time on mail fraud charges and tax evasion. Left on her own with a young child to support and her ex-husband in prison, Kathy had found Jesus. It was her influence that eventually brought religion to the rest of the family, giving Fred Duran his first inkling that there was a spiritual dimension to life beyond the tending of teeth. For a number of years, Dr. Duran appeared quite willing to be a Sunday-only sort of Christian, but all this changed in the early 80s when the evangelical movement started to blossom in Colorado Springs. For Dr. Fred J. Duran, a whole new career was about to begin. He founded the group Christians for a Moral America in 1983, and eventually his two sons, Dwight and Luke, became his lieutenants. The stated purpose of CMA was to unite the dozens of fundamentalist sects in town, from Southern Baptists to the more trendy New Life Church, into a political advocacy group dedicated to creating change in America consistent with Christian belief. Money was necessary for the work, a good deal of money, and once again Dr. Duran proved his genius in this area. It was very clear to him, for example, that Jesus was opposed to environmental regulation, which enabled him to convince various logging and mineral interests in the state to contribute generously to the cause. It was the same with the gun lobby. There were blatant references in the Bible, if you understood them properly, to the need for Christians to arm themselves for the coming Armageddon, the fast-approaching millennium, the year 2000, in which good and evil would battle for supremacy and Jesus would walk again. The National Rifle Association was always pleased to support a cause like this, so in harmony with its own agenda. But most of the money the CMA collected came not from large interest groups, but individual donors who were concerned about two terrible sins that were sweeping America, abortion and homosexuality. Whenever it came to either of these hot issues, the money flowed and flowed, and when the flow slowed for even an instant, it was enough to send out brochures with photographs of mangled babies and men with gold rings through their nipples kissing on the streets of San Francisco for the floodgates to open once again. How much money exactly the CMA had amassed, the FBI could not say. They had various holding companies and investment branches, the chief of which was the Millennium Investment Corporation, which owned shopping malls, an amusement park, an automobile dealership, and several office buildings. The existence of Millennium was a closely guarded secret from the rank-and-file CMA supporters, few of whom suspected the vast extent of the group's financial holdings. But in private, to special donors, Dr. Duran had been heard to say that Christians could not afford to be dreamers in this terrible time of sin and sodomy. Money was power, and through an aggressive investment policy, the kingdom of Jesus could be made manifest if not to the world at large, at least to certain parts of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Texas. The FBI file included two interesting paragraphs about the boys, Dwight and Luke. 
Dwight, it seems, had been a star receiver on the University of Colorado football team and had great hopes of being drafted by the NFL until an incident his junior year put an end to these dreams. He had caught his sweetheart at a frat party, necking with another guy, and with a few beers to fuel his anger, he threw her down a flight of stairs. In normal times, an incident like this would hardly affect a young man's football career. The requirements of a winning football team, of course, supersede all other law and morality on an American campus. But there was a new woman dean who was on a personal crusade, and she made a stink about the episode. The football coach, a man who earned three times the salary of the university president, naturally was furious to lose his star player, but in this instance there was nothing he could do. Dwight was benched for the rest of the season, and although he played once again his senior year, his heart seemed to be gone from the game, and the NFL passed him by. In the years that followed, Dwight carried with him the sullen mark of a man whose true ambitions had been obstructed. He was a victim, he believed, of international Marxist lesbianism. Luke Doran, who had adopted his stepfather's last name, followed a more gentle path through life. He was a graduate of Oral Roberts University, where he played no sport more ferocious than archery, shooting at leisurely straw targets with a colored circle marking the bullseye. He seemed a truly pious young man, volunteering his time to a variety of Christian organizations, which was why everyone was surprised when he married a buxom blonde cheerleader from Houston, Texas, named Darlene Higby, who sang a sultry alto in the Houston Christian Youth Choir. They met during a Sing for Jesus festival in Dayton, Ohio. Luke was a tenor in the Oral Roberts University Choir. Such was the extent of the file, a clever dentist and his boys, their women, and a whole lot of money. The FBI had not been able to find the CMA guilty of breaking a single law. The file existed only because the Bureau had made it a policy in recent years to keep a watch on militant right-wing groups. Howie was pondering these matters when a small color snapshot fell out of the file. Somehow it had gotten loose and been stuck between the pages. It showed Luke and Darlene Duran marching together outside an abortion clinic in Oklahoma City, probably a romantic occasion for a zealous Christian couple. Howie was surprised to recognize Darlene. She was the blonde receptionist from the Millennium Office at Manitou Mall, the one he had thought of so amusingly as a Republican sex goddess. But there was something about her, and how he was so spaced out he didn't remember at first what it was. Then he remembered. My God, she was the one. The car phone began beeping. Corky answered and then handed it over to Jack. Yeah, said Jack with a loud yawn. Then he closed his mouth and listened carefully. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. No, I'm getting sort of accustomed to coincidence in this case, Kevin. When will you know for sure? Okay, we'll talk later. Jack handed the phone back to Corky and turned around to Howie. Try this one on for size, Howie. It's looking very possible that CMA was the right-wing group that funded the smear campaign against Senator Hampton in 1984 the one that got him unelected. That was Kevin. He's in Santa Fe right now checking it out. This case is like a ball of yarn that keeps getting tighter and tighter. Are you awake, Howie? Wide awake. It's going to be tricky. Getting any hard facts about these people. Groups like CMA have turned paranoia into a fine art. What we need is some sort of wedge. Some way to get inside these people. Pry them open. I got one. What do you mean you got one? I got a wedge, Jack. I know how to make them talk. You do? Jack asked skeptically. I do, Howie assured him. 4. What they did really wasn't very nice. This disturbed Howie when he thought about it later because he considered himself a civilized person, someone who took the high road. In desperate moments it was worrisome how easily the pretense of fine behavior crumbled and for the sake of expediency, one took any road at all. At six o'clock on Thursday morning, after a brief night in a Colorado Springs motel, Agent Corky Roth drove Jack and Howie to a townhouse in an expensively manicured subdivision of homes near the Garden of the Gods Park. 
Dawn was still only a gray hint in the eastern sky, and the air was cold, blowing into town from the direction of the Front Range Mountains. Corky parked the station wagon across the street from the townhouse, and then the three of them settled back into companionable silence and waited, sipping coffee from 7-Eleven and paper cups, and munching on doughnuts that were hardly anything but sugar and air. Howie was surprised to see Jack, who was one of the world's great food snobs, consume such empty calories, hardly what Jack would condescend to call breakfast back home. Was it de rigueur, Howie wondered, perhaps an old law enforcement tradition to eat junk food on a stakeout? The townhouse they were watching belonged to Luke and Darlene Doron. It had a redwood exterior and a patch of lawn and a few shrubs in front, exactly like every other house on the block. It appeared to Howie the perfectly generic home for your young professional two-car, two-job, we've-only-just-begun suburban family. At seven o'clock a light went on in the upstairs bedroom. More lights followed downstairs in rapid succession. Howie yawned and waited. He imagined they must be taking showers inside and eating breakfast. Grape nuts, Howie decided, and big glasses of reconstructed glow-in-the-dark orange juice. Perhaps even some nice microwave waffles, smothered with margarine and imitation maple syrup. Howie filled the long minutes by pondering such diabolic culinary possibilities. Luke's father, Fred, would doubtlessly prefer a dinosaur diet of eggs and bacon, high in fat, but at least you could call it more or less natural. It was the new generation that was sliding down the path of plastic inevitability. Jack interrupted these meditations, asking Howie to read him the most recently updated FBI report, a computer printout that had been delivered to their motel at five o'clock that morning. In flat governmental prose, the report gave a detailed synopsis of a series of separate interviews with Dr. Fred J. Duran and his two boys. All three Durans vigorously denied any knowledge of either the kidnapping, Senator Hampton's murder, or slitting the throat of Rusty, Allison Hampton's dog. A good deal of effort had been taken to establish the exact whereabouts of each of the Duran men during the time these crimes had been committed. The father had a fair alibi for each of the three incidents. He was snowed in in a Montana cabin with a well-known Colorado industrialist at the time of the April murder and the night the bloody words were written on Allison's window. As for the time of the kidnapping, he had been involved in a long business lunch with three other men at a steakhouse in Colorado Springs from 12.30 to nearly 2.30 on Tuesday afternoon. On the face of it, it appeared as if Dr. Doron could not be directly involved in any of the crimes. The boys were another matter. Luke was covered for the time the dog's throat was slit, but he claimed to be driving by himself from Colorado Springs to Albuquerque on the morning of April 1. On the Tuesday afternoon of the kidnapping, he admitted being in San Geronimo, giving a pep talk to the protesters outside of Allison Hampton's house. As for Dwight, he could account adequately for his whereabouts on April 1 and the evening the dog was killed, but he also was in San Geronimo on the afternoon Angela was kidnapped, running various errands in town, he said, at Walmart and other stores. But so far, no witnesses from these stores had been found to support his alibi for the vital time. Along with these notes on the Duran men, there were also nearly fifteen pages concerning the ongoing investigation at Ernie Martinez Municipal Park. Most of the information seemed inconsequential to Howie, endless interviews with neighbors, some of whom might have seen something or might not. One old lady reported a suspicious-looking panel truck parked near her house on Tuesday about noon. Two agents checked it out and discovered the truck belonged to High Desert Satellite TV, who were installing a satellite dish in a nearby house. More promising, two teenagers who had skipped school on Tuesday had observed a gray van parked on Carson Road about 11.30 a.m. Agents R. Brown and T. Lester had spent half a day tracking down this lead, only to discover that the van belonged to a certain elderly gentleman, Kenneth Montoya, who had parked briefly on Carson Road to read a girly magazine away from the prying eyes of his wife. Poor Mr. Montoya was still being checked out, but it appeared that he and his aging libido 
had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And on and on it went. Naturally, all the really gung-ho CMA protesters would be investigated as well, starting with the three individuals who had burst into the Blue Mesa Café with the animal afterbirth. Howie was astonished at the dull, dogged persistence of a criminal investigation. So many men and women knocking on doors, gathering odd, unrelated facts. It seemed impossible that he and Jack might come across anything the others had missed. Howie was still reading the report when Luke Duran stepped out of his front doorway, dressed in a well-tailored light gray suit, looking every inch the model young businessman. Howie was tempted to jump out of the station wagon, pound the bastard senseless, and simply demand where Angela was. Easy, Jack murmured, sensing his rage. I'm cool, Jack. A model of restraint. Luke carried a black leather attaché case in one hand, threw open the garage door with the other, and in a moment pulled out of the driveway in the dark blue late-model American car that Howie had seen in the Manitou Mall parking lot. Howie hated to let him go, but Luke was not their prey this morning. Ten minutes later, at exactly 8.23 a.m., according to their log, Darlene Duran came out the same front door and made her way to the second car in the garage, a compact Chevrolet convertible. Darlene was wearing a beige skirt with a tight green sweater, and her yellow hair was tied back in a ponytail, more simply arranged than when he had last seen it. Her breasts seemed to lead the way as she walked to her car, and Howie once again found himself doubtful that they were entirely the work of nature. Man, look at that, Corky said appreciatively. This was plainly his sort of girl, a silicone goddess, a pin-up dream. Stop her. Jack ordered curtly. My pleasure. Corky fired up the engine and swerved quickly across the street into the driveway, blocking her exit. He jumped out of the station wagon, holding up his badge. FBI, ma'am, he told her. We'd like to have a few words with you. She looked unhappily from Corky with his badge, to Jack with his dark glasses, to Howie with his broken leg and crutches. Who are you? she demanded, turning her attention upon Jack. I talked with people from the FBI yesterday, and you don't look like FBI to me, and you neither, she said, turning to Howie. You're that Indian who came into my office with that cock-and-bull story about building a ski resort in the Black Hills. Darlene Duran, Jack announced in his most official voice. Look at me, and listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you. You are in serious trouble. Oh, yeah? And why am I in trouble? Because I know everything about you. She laughed in his face. Jack lowered his voice delicately. Darlene, I know about your affair with Dwight, your sexual relationship with your brother-in-law. Her mouth opened in astonishment. My what? She cried. Jack repeated his accusation, but not so delicately. You've been screwing Dwight, and that really isn't very nice. Howie noticed that Darlene's orange tan had turned a kind of lemonade pink. You, you take that back, she sputtered. I'm a decent Christian woman and I refuse to listen to these insinuations. You are going to listen. And do you know why, Darlene? Because if you don't play ball with me, I'm going to tell your husband exactly what you do in your free time. Can you imagine the scandal this is going to make for your Christians for a moral America? You think people are going to mail in their checks once this gets out? Luke won't believe a word of it. You're nuts, mister, and you can't prove a thing. You don't think so? As it happens, the Bureau has some very explicit photographs of you and Dwight together. At this very moment, the photos are in an envelope on an airplane that's flying here from Washington. What time are those photographs due to arrive, Corky? The ETA is when the next hour, Corky said crisply. They were both lying, of course. There were no photographs, and Howie didn't think this was going well. It certainly wasn't like the confrontation he had imagined in the car yesterday when he remembered the flirtatious body language between Dwight and Darlene at Manitou Mall. After watching them together that day, it had been quite a surprise for Howie to discover that Darlene was married to Luke, not Dwight. But maybe he had misread the signals. Who could say? Perhaps there was nothing more at stake here than a mild attraction between a brother and sister-in-law. 
Howie did not have enough experience in this sort of confrontation to realize how easily someone could call your bluff. This great plan of his was looking like a total flop. But then the conversation swerved in a new direction. Are you blind? she asked Jack nervously. There was an audible shudder in her voice, as though it was very spooky to her that someone might be less than body perfect. For an answer, Jack removed his dark glasses, revealing his dead eyes and scars. Dear Lord in heaven, she cried, looking away quickly. What do you want from me? I just want some truthful answers to a few questions. Will you put your glasses back on? If you answer my questions. She seemed to be furiously calculating the odds. She had no idea, of course, how little they really knew. Howie was certain she was about to laugh and drive away. But between his threats and his blindness, Jack had succeeded in unnerving Darlene Duran. Quite unexpectedly, she caved in. You'll give me the photographs and go away? That's right. You have to protect me. He'll kill me if he finds out. Luke will kill you? Not Luke. Luke doesn't care. Luke is impotent for crying out loud. Or celibate or whatever the hell he calls it. My God, I'd still be a damn virgin if it had been left up to Luke to run. It's Fred who will kill me. I sympathize, Darlene. Jack slipped his dark glasses back onto his nose. Shall we go inside your house and talk this over? You know what this is? This is downright blackmail, mister. Jack nodded. Yes, he admitted. That's it exactly. Blackmail. She wasn't very bright, Howie decided. A blonde Texas cheerleader in the youth choir who had been impressed by the Duran money and thought she was moving up in the world when she married Luke. But what she got was a sexless marriage, a horny brother-in-law who had finally seduced her after a long siege and a father-in-law she described as a bad man. Bad in what way? Tell me about Fred Durone, please, Jack urged. Well, he's a fake, that's all. He doesn't care about Jesus or the Bible or the commandments, not really. All he thinks about is money. Luke's the only real Christian in the whole family. But, of course, Luke's kind of crazy, I guess, so maybe it doesn't count. They were sitting in Darlene's living room which was as perfect as a department store showroom, matching settees, a coffee table, and lamps that looked as if they had been brought all together, part of a prepackaged living room suite. The motif was early American, as visualized by Sears. You say Luke is a little crazy. What do you mean, exactly? Well, take the sex thing. I mean, I tried to have a normal married life with Luke, but whenever I, you know did stuff to sort of get him in the mood, he'd only get angry. And I mean angry, like I was the devil or something. He said bodies were impure and that he was following the immaculate path of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I almost think Luke believes he is Jesus, and I mean, that's a sin, isn't it? I would think so, Jack agreed. Certainly he should have at least warned you that he planned to remain celibate before you got married. Yes, that would have been nice she said archly. To tell you the truth, I think it was his father's idea that he get married in the first place. For appearances, you know. Luke probably didn't want to at all. You know, I'm not really such a bad person. But what's a girl supposed to do after a while? Anyone in your situation would do the same. Jack had done a neat job of transforming himself into the sort of person a young woman might confide in. So, Luke is extremely religious. St. Luke, I call him. Jack laughed obligingly. It must be difficult for St. Luke to put up with Fred and Dwight's cupidity. Cupidity? she asked. You mean like in Cupid? The word means avarice, Mrs. Doran. Greed, Jack told her. As his politeness increased, he had gone in an odd backward motion from her first to her married name. I'm talking about Christians for moral America raising huge amounts of cash under false pretenses. As a true believer, this must have caused Luke some anguish. Oh, you bet it has. While Luke gets just about beside himself whenever he thinks of all those decent Christian people getting milk like that. And you know what the money is for, don't you? All those millions of dollars that Fred's been raising? No, what's it for? Well, this is the absolute worst of it. 
It's for a ski resort, she confided to Jack. Can you imagine that? Why, that's terrible, he agreed. But I don't quite understand. From what I know, your father-in-law's company, the Millennium Investment Corporation, put a bit over $2 million into San Geronimo Peak in the early 80s. But surely that doesn't have anything to do with the money he's concerned with now. Oh, that was other money. That was just some small change. I guess you haven't heard the news, what they're building now? Down at San Geronimo Peak? No, I don't think I have. She lowered her voice. A casino. Can you imagine that? For gambling and all. A casino? Jack exhaled. His brain was racing like a roulette wheel, looking for a lucky number. Ah, uh, yes, a casino, he repeated softly. He leaned closer to Darlene. But, of course, gambling's not legal in New Mexico. She leaned closer to him. But it is legal, she assured him, at least on Indian land. Yes, it's true. Unfortunately, San Geronimo Peak isn't on Indian land. Well, that's the funny thing. Just a small part of it is, way up high on the mountain. At least that's what I've heard Fred tell Dwight. I've never actually been down there myself. I think I know the spot, Mrs. Doron. It's called Phoenix Rock. Sometimes the locals call it Doobie Rock. Yes, that's it. But surely it would be impossible to build a casino up there. Why, that must be, what, Howie, 11,000 feet? At least, Howie agreed. And I've seen people there get higher still. Jack raised a disapproving eyebrow at Howie for this remark, but Darlene didn't notice. She continued, The plan is to build an aerial tramway so people can go up and down the mountain to the casino all year round. I understand there's really a lovely view from on top. Why, yes, there is, Mrs. Doran. You can see for miles. Besides the casino, they're going to build a restaurant, a hotel, a gift shop, turn it into a kind of theme park, you know? Who exactly is going to turn it into a theme park? You're talking about CMA? Fred's hoping to finance it, yes, and have much more direct control of the management down there. That's why he's been working so hard to keep the donations coming in just now, because it's going to take a huge amount of money. But he says it's going to be a real gold mine, and being on Indian land and everything, they won't even have to pay normal taxes. It sounds like quite an opportunity, Jack agreed. Of course, the status of Indian gaming is a hot issue in New Mexico. The laws could easily change. Darlene shrugged. Fred doesn't think so. CMA controls a lot of politicians down there who will vote the way he says. It's all those Spanish people in New Mexico, she confided. You can buy them a dime a dozen. That's what Fred says anyway. I'm not sure he can entirely count on that, Mrs. Doran. Well, Fred says that even if Indian gambling is outlawed eventually, a few good years and they'll never have to worry about money again. After that, the aerial tramway will make a bundle even without the casino. Very interesting. But what did Senator Hampton think of all this? From what I know of the senator, he was quite an environmentalist. I can't imagine him in favor of turning his mountain into a kind of Las Vegas in the sky. Oh, he was against it. Did sit against it. But, of course, he's no longer around to object. Yes, and isn't that convenient, Jack observed. Have you heard your father-in-law say anything about the particulars of Senator Hampton's death? Darlene shook her head. Only that the Lord's hand was clearly at work there. He thinks the heirs will be much easier to deal with. The heirs? You mean, I believe there are two sisters who have inherited the resort? Meanwhile, Fred's been pushing Dwight and Luke to intensify the protest in Albuquerque, without breaking any laws, of course. You're going too fast for me. What's the connection between the ski resort and the abortion clinic? Oh, that's where all the money is coming from. Don't you understand? They have to march around there to stir up the faithful and get the donations coming in. To tell the truth, CMA really needed to make a kind of showy Christian gesture right now because some of the members have begun to grumble about how commercial everything's become. The anti-abortion protest was just what the doctor ordered, you might say. 
The doctor. Oh, I don't mean her. I'm just speaking in a general way. What was needed to get everybody opening their checkbooks to give to the cause? A lot of your money just arrives in the mail? A whole lot. This is big business we're talking about. Anyway, that's what Luke tells me. He really hasn't been very happy about it. Fred keeps saying, you have to be practical. This is what we need to finance some big changes in America. But Luke says, how can you talk about change when you're building a house of sin? Of course, the Bible says, honor thy father. So Luke feels he doesn't have much choice except to go along. That must be quite a dilemma for Luke, Jack agreed. Mrs. Durant, you've been very helpful. I know I'm going to have more questions for you later, but as I'm sure you'll understand, right now our primary concern is for the safety of Angela Hampton. Can you tell me where she is? The little girl? You think... Oh, my God, CMA would never, never do something like kidnap an innocent child. But you've just been telling me, Mrs. Duran, how corrupt they are. Why wouldn't they kidnap a child? Because it's the opposite of what Fred wants. Don't you see? This is going to ruin him. No one's going to give a dime now to a bunch of crazy extremists. Or maybe a few people will, but not the really wide support Fred needs to raise the sort of money he's counting on. The goal I've heard Dwight mention is $20 million, and I know they're short. That little girl may not know it, but she's pretty much killed this deal for CMA. Jack was nodding energetically. Yes, I see. You know... I've been looking at this whole thing backward. Kidnapping Angela wasn't meant to further CMA at all. It was meant to ruin them, to stop this casino and tramway from ever happening. And there's just one person I can think of, Mrs. Duran, who might be angry enough to want to wreck everything. Luke? she asked anxiously. Luke, he agreed. Five. Howie knew he had been in Mid-America too long when he found himself salivating at the thought of an egg McMuffin. Half an hour later, Corky was pulling up in front of a McDonald's drive through window for a bag full of breakfast goodies when his cell phone began making a strange, cheap-cheap sound, like a sick plastic chicken. It was Special Agent Niemeyer. Corky entered and passed the phone to Jack. "'Jack, I'm in the air right now, flying up from Santa Fe!' Kevin said quickly. I'll be in the springs in half an hour. We got a break and we're moving fast. What's up? It's the state police lab in Albuquerque. They got a match for one of the prints on the Dr. Pepper can. It's Luke Duran, all right. He obliged us by leaving a nice impression of his left index finger. The prints mixed in with a lot of smears of other people who touched that can at one time or another, but it's good enough for me. I've got a warrant and we're going to pull him in as soon as I arrive. Wouldn't it be easier to wait and see if he'll lead us to Angela? We debated that one, Jack, and decided it was too risky. This particular decision came from above that it was best to pick him up now, let him know the game is up, and that if he can produce the little girl, it will be very much to his advantage. Mm-hmm, Jack said thoughtfully. Why don't you sound thrilled? No, I am thrilled. I think Luke's our boy. But you know how I hate loose ends. Like, what about the child's partial that was left on the Dr. Pepper can? Any luck chasing that one down? We've managed to print ten of the preschoolers, but so far none of them are a match. With the other three kids, their parents are holding out, saying their precious darling might be traumatized by having their fingerprints taken. And what guarantee do they have the prints won't be used one day by Big Brother to trample little Brittany's civil rights? You get the picture? Do me a favor, Kevin. Check if that child's partial matches up with Angela Hampton. You have Angela's prints, I presume. Just got them this morning from one of her toys. But they're not in the computer yet. Kevin was silent for a moment. Are you on to something I don't know about? Mm, no, no. It's just a wild idea. A real long shot. Okay, I'll put someone on it. Listen, I gotta go now, Jack. Let's rendezvous at the Ramada Inn on Academy Boulevard in 45 minutes. We're going to make that our base for the time being. You can come along when we pull in Luke Duran if you like. Thanks, Kevin, but I'd only be in the way.
I'd rather use the time to check one of those loose ends that's nagging at me. Oh, yeah? And what loose end is that? Her name is Crystal Henderson. By late afternoon, Howie sensed that this particular loose end was going to take longer than a single day to tie in a tidy knot. Crystal's parents, Sergeant James Hopman and his wife Tina, had recently left the Air Force Academy and retired to the Philippines, where the sergeant had once served for several years. This was a disappointment for Jack, since he wanted to talk with them. A few more frustrating hours were wasted trying to track down some of Crystal's old school friends. Jack had come up with several leads, a girl named Robin, who had supposedly been Crystal's best friend in the eleventh grade, and a guy named Tony, who had been her boyfriend senior year. But Robin, it seemed, had moved to Phoenix six months before, and Tony had drifted away years ago, God only knew where. All these minor discoveries took time. By six o'clock that evening, after hours of fruitless conversations, Jack had learned only one item of interest. It came from Crystal's juvenile probation officer, an elderly woman who was willing to talk now that Crystal was dead. The item was this. When Crystal was fifteen and had her first run-in with the law over drugs, part of her probation was to attend a regular weekend day camp that was organized by one of the local churches to benefit at-risk children. There was a good deal of outdoor recreation designed to keep youthful bodies occupied in healthful ways. One of the activities Crystal was required to attend was archery practice, given by a young graduate of Oral Roberts University named Luke Duran. As it happened, Crystal showed a real talent for the bow and arrow. There was a contest at the end of the year, and she won a bronze medal. Luke was inspired to write a short note to the probation officer that was still in her file. This is a girl who will hit a big bullseye in life, if we can only provide her with the proper motivation. At a few minutes past six, Howie took the cell phone to the far end of the Ramada Inn parking lot in hope of privacy. He leaned up against a Dodge van and dialed Allison's number in San Geronimo. To his surprise, Josie answered. Josie, it's Howard Moondeer. I thought I'd give a call to see how Allison was doing. Howie, I'm so glad to hear from you. Allison was asking for you a few hours ago, wondering if you and Jack had come up with anything. You're staying at the house? Yeah, I came over a few hours ago and sent Viola home. This seemed like a good time for Allison to know she has a sister. Anyway, it's sure better for me. It beats getting drunk at the bars, going crazy with worry about her and Angela. How is uh, Allison doing? Not so great. She spent most of the day just pacing back and forth in her bedroom like a caged tiger. I gave her another sedative a little while ago, and she's asleep now. Or I'd put her on the phone herself. Do you have any news? Some good news, actually. The FBI is about to arrest Luke Duran, one of the CMA boys. They found his fingerprints on the soda can where the note was found. But what about Angela? Well, there's nothing yet, but we're all very hopeful that once Luke is in custody, he'll tell us where she is. The consensus here is that Luke's a religious nut, but he has a history of mentoring children, and it doesn't seem in his character to harm a little girl. Look, Josie, do you think you could wake up Allison for just a few minutes? I'd like to tell her this myself, if you don't mind. It might do her some good to know that things are looking brighter. You know, Howie, I'd really rather let her sleep. I know your news is encouraging, but it almost seems cruel to wake her when she's just settled down to a few hours of peace. But look, as soon as she stirs, I'll tell her you called and pass on what you've told me, okay? Well, okay, Howie agreed reluctantly. He added impulsively, Give her my love, will you? Tell her I'm going to bring Angela back to her. Tell her I'm not going to let her down. Josie's laugh was gently mocking. Of course, Howie. Call back as soon as you hear anything definite. Howie was leaning on his crutches, turning off the cell phone when he saw Jack and Corky walk quickly out of the Ramada Inn office toward the station wagon. Come on, Corky shouted to Howie. Get your ass over to the car. We got a situation on our hands. A situation? Howie asked dumbly. His mind was a little dreamy, still on Allison. Corky was excited. Jesus, he said, this whole damn thing is about to blow sky high. Josie put down the phone in the living room, 
just as Allison appeared on the second floor landing. Who was that? Allison asked. A reporter. Can you believe the nerve of those people? I told them to get lost. There's no news, then? I was hoping Howie would call. I'm sure he'll phone as soon as he can, Allie, Josie said in a patient tone. I just can't bear this waiting. Allison bit down hard on the knuckles of her right hand. I think I'm going to go insane if I don't hear something soon. Oh, Allie, Allie, it breaks my heart to see you like this. Why don't you let me give you a nice back rub? You're just so uptight right now, and it's not going to bring Angela back any sooner, you know, for you to get so stressed out that you can't function. Actually, a back rub sounds wonderful, Allison agreed. My neck, too. I'm so tense I can hardly breathe. You just let your sister Josie take care of you. Good, good care. 6. Sir Galahad's castle was located at the edge of a strip mall near the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame on the north end of town. It was a theme park restaurant with fantasy turrets, a drawbridge at the front entrance, and a doorman dressed up in medieval armor. As a castle, it owed a good deal more in spirit to something you might find on a miniature golf course than one of those drafty stone buildings in merry old England. But authenticity was beside the point. The main reason people went to Sir Galahad's was for its all-you-can-eat five ninety nine dinner buffet. It was twilight when Agent Corky Roth drove from the Ramada Inn with his siren screaming and a flashing red light stuck to the top of the station wagon. He pulled into the parking lot outside Sir Galahad's, just at that bewitching moment when the multicolored city lights were coming on against a backdrop of red-orange sunset still flaring in the western sky. Howie was struck by the odd beauty of the scene, dozens of white Colorado Springs police cars blocking off the parking lot, their red and blue emergency lights broadcasting a revolving light show against the cartoonish facade of the castle. Overhead, a helicopter was beating the air, making slow circles around the besieged building. As Howie watched, the helicopter's searchlight came on for a moment, shining down for some reason upon a huge green inflatable dragon near the drawbridge. The dragon was grinning happily, munching on a giant drumstick. A neon sign near his head constantly wrote, erased, and wrote again, All you can eat, all you can eat, all you can eat. It seemed to Howie a most peculiar setting for a climactic moment of any kind. Nevertheless, Luke Duran had barricaded himself inside this castle, along with Dwight and Fred and several hundred moral Americans, men and boys. They had been feasting and listening to speeches about Christian family values when all hell broke loose. Kevin Niemeyer looked like a man on the verge of a heart attack. He was waiting for Jack and Howie in the parking lot, dressed in a blue blazer with the words FBI written on the back. His tie was askew, his complexion was ashen. When he saw Jack and Howie, he walked quickly to their station wagon. "'Welcome to the nightmare,' he said in greeting. "'Everything's gone wrong. I'd better fill you in.' Apparently more than twenty FBI agents had spent most of the morning and all afternoon trying to apprehend Luke Duran, but somehow they kept missing him at his usual haunts. It was difficult to know if he was on the run or simply having a lucky day. Then, after making himself invisible all day, he suddenly appeared at Sir Galahad's castle. This was a gala night, apparently, the annual CMA Father and Son's Banquet, and not an event a Duran boy could easily miss. The first word that Luke had been spotted came from the two agents who had been tailing Fred Duran all afternoon. They followed Fred to Sir Galahad's from his downtown office, arriving at the restaurant at close to 5.45. A few minutes after that, Luke drove up and went inside. The agents called for help, and within ten minutes every FBI person in Colorado Springs had converged upon the spot. Kevin, who was one of the first to arrive, debated his options and decided they would simply wait in the parking lot for the banquet to finish and then take Luke into custody as he was leaving the building. After Waco and Ruby Ridge, the Bureau had a horror of situations of this kind, a besieged cult, children inside the building. It simply didn't get any worse. Kevin called in the Colorado Springs police, who sealed off the entire area. 
When this was accomplished, the law enforcement officers settled in to wait at a discreet distance. But then the unexpected happened. A ten-year-old kid named Chris Donaldson became restless over dinner, and at 6.12 p.m. walked outside to the family car in the parking lot to fetch his Walkman cassette player. He was a quiet child, worse yet, an observant child, and he managed to get a good look at the small army of law enforcement personnel with riot guns and flak jackets surrounding the building. A few minutes later, a small contingent of men came out to investigate for themselves. They were angry and jacked full of adrenaline. They demanded to know the meaning of this outrageous assault upon their rights as American citizens. Kevin did his best to defuse the situation, explaining that he wished only to talk with Luke Duran. Talk! one of the men exclaimed. When you need a whole army to talk with a good Christian boy, that's the moment decent people got to band together and say, No way! As Jesus is my Savior, I'm telling you, we've had it. Do you hear me? Had it! With all you people in Washington trying to tell us what to do! Amen to that! Praise be! said the others, and they marched back inside the castle walls. The situation went downhill fast. The people inside the restaurant actually seemed to want a confrontation. It was as if they had been preparing for this day for so many years, the inevitable moment when the FBI would appear on their doorstep in riot gear, that now they simply jumped the gun. As far as Kevin was concerned, none of this was necessary, but stopping it was another matter. He got on the bullhorn and did his best to talk sense and be reasonable. He called upon Luke Duran to come out peacefully, before anybody got hurt. But a few minutes later, all the lights went off inside the restaurant, and someone fired a pistol shot from a window. It was insane. But the Christians for a moral America had decided to make a stand. A single FBI agent had managed to get in a back door into the kitchen, and he reported over a cell phone that the group inside had at least twenty handguns between them, and they were vowing to resist to the end. A mood of hysteria and defiance had taken over the crowd. Many people were praying. Dwight Duran was standing on a table by the all-you-can-eat dessert bar, giving angry speeches in which he called upon every free American to stand up and be counted in the war against that evil dictatorship, the federal government. "'How many children are inside?' Jack asked. "'A hundred at least. Man, we just seem to get drawn into these situations, whether we like it or not. Once again, the Bureau is totally up shit creek. Just walk away, then, Jack suggested. Tell all your agents and the cops to go home, and the CMA will be left with no one to be angry at. It'll make them look pretty silly, and you can pick up Luke Duran another time. You know, I'd love to walk away. That's the first sane advice I've heard in an hour. But it's too damn late now, Jack. We've lost that option when whoever it was fired a shot from the window. Nobody got hurt. But if we leave now, it'll look like we're giving in to intimidation, etc. And in the future, anyone can push us around. Meanwhile, I've had three calls from Washington in the past ten minutes, and I understand even the President has been apprised of the situation. My orders are to do nothing offensive until the hot shots arrive. We have psychiatrists coming, religious experts, crisis negotiators, the works. It's going to be a regular zoo. My experience, Kevin, is that the bigger the audience, the more difficult it becomes to back down and lose face. Yeah, yeah, Kevin said gloomily. But what can I do? When do you expect the hotshots to arrive? Within an hour. So there's still a little time for common sense. Kevin, I've got an idea. You FBI boys, you know you're sort of a scary lot to an average citizen. But a blind old fart like me and an Indian kid on crutches with a silly plaster cast, I have been getting the impression recently that we don't frighten anybody much at all. Kevin stared at Jack in astonishment. What are you suggesting? When you can't send in the cavalry, sometimes it's the right moment for the lame and the blind. Kevin scratched the back of his neck. You know, I could lose my job over this. And that would be dreadful, wouldn't it? In all his life, Howie had never imagined that one day he would be required to wear a bulletproof vest to enter a restaurant. The vest reminded Howie, rather unfortunately, of the magic shirts the ghost dancers wore to deflect the white man's bullets. 
He only hoped they were more effective. He was standing with Jack behind a line of police cars, getting himself fitted up for this new sartorial experience, when Kevin Niemeyer came over to them with a cell phone in hand. Kevin looked exasperated. Will you talk to these people, Jack? It's the police lab in Albuquerque. They ran that match you wanted on the Diet Dr. Pepper can. Frankly, I just don't have time for this right now. Kevin gave the phone to Jack and then headed off quickly to yet another urgent conference. Jack held the phone to his ear, listened a few moments, grunted several times, then handed the device to the nearest agent. There was an odd expression on Jack's face. It's the child's partial on the soda can, he said. The print belongs to Angela Hampton. That's crazy, Howie replied. Is it? Come on, we'd better get going. A whole lot of people are waiting on us. Howie led the way, hobbling on his crutches across the asphalt parking lot toward the drawbridge to Sir Galahad's castle. This was not his idea of fun things to do in Colorado Springs. Jack held on to his arm, and he was certain that together they made a pathetic sight. Jack had taken off his dark glasses to show his scars and let his disability become more obvious. The idea was to make his appearance less threatening, but how he was afraid it might have the opposite effect. He expected a firestorm of bullets to cut them down at any moment. He was theoretically protected between his neck and belly button, but this still left a lot of body parts he cared about woefully exposed. You see what this means, don't you? Jack asked as they were walking. You bet. It means I can be shot in the balls any second. Why the hell don't they make these vests a few inches longer, Jack? I'm talking about Angela. The kidnapper simply gave her the can with the note in it and asked her to take it over close to the jungle gym. That's crazy. Why should she help someone abduct her? Because she knew her kidnapper. She went willingly. Haven't you figured out yet who our ghost dancer is? Well, sure. It's Luke Duran. Luke's doing a fine rendition of Jesus driving out the moneylenders from the temple. The thought of his daddy using Christian donations to build a casino was just too much for him. So he flipped out in righteous indignation, and now he's bringing down the house. CMA, daddy, everything. Busting up the whole damn show. Jack stopped walking and tugged on Howie's arm. They were halfway to the drawbridge, and frankly, this did not seem to Howie a very good place to stop. That's what we're supposed to think, of course. But don't you see? If Angela knew her kidnapper, it changes the whole scenario. Just then, a high-pitched voice shouted hysterically at them from inside the building. No closer! No closer or I'll shoot! I'll shoot! Howie recognized the nebbishy figure of the small, nondescript man who had carried the bloody surprise to the Blue Mesa Café. The little man stood in the open doorway with a huge pistol in his hand. There were two lances with medieval banners crossed above his head, lending a cartoonish absurdity to the scene. But the pistol looked horribly real. No closer! No closer! he repeated. Hysteria had given him an echo. He said everything twice. I'll shoot you! I'll shoot you, I will, I will, he declared. We're not armed. We've come with peaceful intentions, Jack said in a calm, resonant voice. God is watching, God is watching. I'm counting on it, Jack told him. Would you please inform Dr. Duran that we would like to speak with him? As you can see, I am blind and my friend here has a broken leg. There is absolutely nothing about us that should cause you any alarm. I am certain we can work something out. No one will get hurt tonight. Wait there. Wait there. Jack and Howie waited, and they waited. Eventually, the little man returned to bring them inside the castle. Okay, okay, he said. Come in, come in. It was dark inside the restaurant, only dimly lit with a few candles and the heat lamps from the buffet line. The heat lamps sent an eerie orange glow into the room, reflecting off the food, turkey, roast beef, mashed potatoes, macaroni, fried chicken, and breaded fish that looked as if it had swum a long, long way from any ocean. The room was crowded with half-seen figures in the shadows. Everywhere how he looked, there was a mood of repressed excitement, 
an oddly festive air, as though a long-awaited adventure was about to begin. In one part of the room an older man was leading a group in prayer. In another corner someone was saying excitedly, You see, they're afraid of us, really. They sent our power. They know their world is about to collapse. They know they can't prevail against the Lord's wrath. Don't you see? It doesn't matter if we die here. They know we've won. This was boys' night out, a father and son's banquet gone berserk. There were only a few women in evidence, several terrified waitresses dressed as medieval-serving wenches in loose-fitting blouses and long skirts, and they did not seem happy to be working this particular shift. Howie noticed Dwight Duran walking about self-importantly with a pistol in his hand, organizing the defenses. There were clearly people in the room who were glad the final Armageddon battle between the forces of good and evil had come at last. The nebbishy little man led Howie and Jack across the dining room to where Fred Duran was sitting at a table by himself with a candle and a half-eaten plate of food in front of him. Howie noticed he had left his peas on his plate uneaten. Probably it was okay to do that on boys' night out. I've brought them! I've brought them! the little man cried excitedly. Fred looked up at the small person with a repugnance he did not bother to conceal. You should take a deep breath, Arnold, and try to calm yourself. We have a long night ahead of us. But I'm so happy, Dr. Duran. I'm so happy. Those people outside think we're laughable just because we believe in the Bible and Jesus Christ. But we're going to show them, aren't we, Dr. Duran? That's right, Arnold. We're going to show them. Arnold turned his bony face toward Jack and Howie. He was positively gleeful. You think you're so much better than we are, don't you? But we're going to have the last laugh. We're going to go to heaven, and you're going to go to hell. Arnold, please, Fred exclaimed. He seemed at the end of his patience. Do me a favor and just go away. Arnold scurried away into the shadows. Fred Duran watched him leave with a disgusted look on his face. Finally, he turned his attention to Jack and Howie. Jesus Christ, he swore profanely. They send me a blind man and a cripple? A few things for the record, said Jack. First, my friend Howie here is not a cripple. He merely has a broken leg. Second, it's fine with me if you want to stay in Sir Galahad's castle forever. You can go through the all-you-can-eat line until you burst on jello salad, as far as I'm concerned. My only interest is finding Angela Hampton. Fred smiled slightly. It was a very haggard, weary smile, but the corners of his mouth moved in an upward direction. Sit down, he offered. I'd suggest you make yourselves up a plate of food, but frankly the food's pretty god-awful in this joint. We do our father and son's banquet every year at Sir Galahad's because it's cheap and the kiddies like it. But I usually have indigestion for days. Howie helped Jack into a chair, and then he sat down himself at Jack's side. Fred stared at them from across the table, a neutral, contemplative expression on his face, like a poker player trying to figure out a hand. He had removed his sports coat, rolled up his sleeves, and loosened his necktie. Let me lay down the ground rules, Fred said. I'm not exactly sure how this situation is going to resolve, because, as you may have noticed, my people are a little riled up. But whatever happens, I'm not giving you my boy Luke. I want you to understand that from the start. He didn't kidnap the little girl, and I'm not going to hand you any goddamn scapegoat so a bunch of liberal TV reporters can have a field day making him look like some kind of extremist idiot. Do you get that? I do, and I agree completely, Jack told him. The last thing I want is a scapegoat. It's clear to me that Luke did not kidnap Angela. Fred was about to say something, but this stopped him. What kind of game are you trying to play here? No game at all. I only want to talk with Luke and ask him a few questions that I hope will help me locate the child. Once he answers, Howie and I will be on our way. And what about that small army of stormtroopers outside? I'll see what I can do to get rid of them. Basically, as far as I know, you people haven't committed any crime, except a few weapons violations. It's a pity one of your group fired a pistol out the window. 
but under the circumstances, I think I can get the FBI to overlook that particular fact. Fred glanced nervously across the room to where Dwight was organizing a platoon of men to pile up tables and chairs against the windows. I don't know. This has gone a little too far to turn around easily, he said with a sigh. Who's going to pay for the damage to the restaurant? Jack smiled thinly. I think I can convince the government to restore Sir Galahad's castle to its pristine condition. Personally, I don't see any problems here that cannot be resolved. Unless, of course, you people really are determined to die. Hey, I don't want to die, Fred Durand said fervently. Look, I tell you what. I'm willing to try to work something out but I want my lawyer present, and I want something in writing that completely exonerates me and my family from this mess. I run a completely legal, respectable organization, and I want you to know that I deal with senators and congressmen and other very important people. It's certainly not my fault that a few lunatics have gotten involved with the CMA and are prone to getting a little wild. Personally, I'm not responsible for any of that. I'm a hard-working Christian businessman who's trying to make a book and maybe do a little good for the world at the same time. Oh, Father, listen to what you're saying. It was Luke Duran, stepping out of a shadow into the dim light of the candle on the table. Luke, I told you to let me take care of this boy. Yes, I know what you told me. But I would rather get finished with this comedy. So I suggest I answer the blind man's questions and perhaps help him see the light. Who knows? After that, the rest is up to the Lord. As far as I'm concerned, if this is Judgment Day, so be it. Luke, please, I know I haven't always been the father you wanted to have, but I got a plan, son. We'll leave the rest of these damn idiots to have a shootout with the FBI if they want, but I'm going to get you and me and Dwight out of this mess. Luke Duran laughed joylessly. Father, you really are pitiful. But let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these gentlemen somewhere we can talk without any fuss. Then I'm going to answer all their questions and see if we can come to some understanding. Personally, I'm not afraid to die, but I don't see what we'd accomplish by dying in Sir Galahad's castle. Amen to that, muttered Jack. Well, what do you want to know? Luke asked in a surprisingly gentle voice. They were standing in a circle in a back pantry, an area with boxes full of crackers, candles, salt and pepper shakers, napkins, and other items the waitresses used in the dining room. There were two candles burning on a table next to an automatic drip-through coffee machine. To Howie, it looked like an altar to the god of caffeine. Luke was wearing a tan suit and a blood-red tie that went nicely with his hair. In the candlelight, his gaunt face was almost handsome. He stood calmly watching Jack. Tell me about Crystal Houtman, Jack asked. Crystal? Well, poor Crystal. She was certainly part of the Lord's plan for me. She taught me everything a young man needs to know about sin. Would you mind explaining? Luke smiled wistfully. I met Crystal when she was fifteen and I was twenty-four. I was volunteering time on my weekends to help with the local youth program. Oh, I was very stern in those days, very righteous. But I didn't know a thing about women, not even a woman of fifteen. Am I to understand that you had an affair with Crystal? Yes, that is exactly what you are to understand. She seduced me, I suppose. Wasn't very difficult, of course. She was a pretty girl. There was something about her that's hard to describe. A kind of playfulness, I guess. Me, I was as rigid as a brick building, but, you know, rigid brick buildings are the first to collapse in an earthquake. It all started when I drove her home one Saturday afternoon in my car. I was a virgin, which she found amusing. After that, we met regularly for a while. The irony, of course, is that I was supposed to be the teacher, not her. But she taught me about sex and a whole lot of things for which I will be forever in her debt. It was quite an education, believe me. I smoked marijuana with her, 
We even took LSD one time. I can tell you're surprised. I am, frankly, Jack admitted. Well, marijuana, LSD, even the brief ecstasy of sexual union. All this intoxication is nothing but a misguided longing for God. We live in such a materialistic age. Young people especially grab at anything that promises even a temporary lift from the emptiness of their daily lives. It's the devil, of course, just a brightly colored mirage. Only God brings lasting peace. How long did your affair with Crystal last? Long enough. Let's just say we had our forty days and forty nights together, and then I saw I was on a false path, and that what I was seeking could only be found in Jesus Christ. Part of my personal atonement is that I've never touched another woman since that time. Isn't that a little hard on your wife, Darlene? Luke shrugged. Well, marriage was something my father wanted for me. My celibacy worried him. He's always hoped I would be more normal, as he likes to call it. He said it would look better for the folks in Colorado Springs if I had a little woman at my side. It would help with the fundraising, you see. So I did it for him. And I think Darlene has gotten something out of it, too, in her own way. She was very poor as a child, so she appreciates having a nice house and money. And when she wants her fleeting carnal pleasures, there's always my brother Dwight. You know about her and Dwight. Do you take me for a fool? No, I certainly don't take you for a fool, Jack assured him. Please tell me more about Crystal. Well... I didn't see her for quite a few years. She went away. She lived for empty pleasures, and she became hardened. It was depressing to see how she had turned out. At fifteen, there had been a spark to her, but by the time I saw her again, the spark was gone. When did you see her again? It was about a year ago. She phoned and said she was in Colorado Springs and asked if we could have lunch together. She said she had something to discuss. Even on the phone, I sensed the evil that had overtaken her. We met at a Mexican restaurant, and at first she was very friendly. She told me she was working on the ski patrol at San Geronimo Peak, and that she had a business proposition she wanted me to pass on to my father. I told her she should go to my father herself, since I was not interested in business propositions. But she wanted my help. She thought I could open the right doors and get things moving. Then she said that unless I helped her, she would tell everyone what had happened when she was fifteen. It was blackmail, pure and simple. Apparently, I was supposed to be terrified that CMA would look like a bunch of hypocrites and no one would donate any more money. I rather surprised her when I admitted that, yes, we were hypocrites, and if she would kindly do me the favor of exposing CMA, I would be much obliged. Let's go back a second, Jack said. Obviously, a girl on the ski patrol isn't in a position to make business propositions concerning the resort. Did she say who she was acting for? Yes. She claimed she was representing Senator Hampton. The story she told was that the senator was her lover, and he had sent her as an intermediary in order to keep everything strictly secret until all the details were arranged. Did you believe her? I believe she was Senator Hampton's lover. I could well believe that. But no, I did not believe he had sent her to us with this supposed business proposition. Senator Hampton hated CMA, you know, and with some justification. After all, it was my father who was mainly responsible for his losing the 1984 election. We targeted Senator Hampton that year, along with about a dozen other liberal politicians in western states. I've been told that. But how did CMA become involved with the ski resort in the first place, and why? Luke shrugged. This happened before 1984, during the time the ski resort was in a blind trust. I believe there was some Swiss outfit managing it in those days. Dad didn't care if it was a veritable house of sin, as long as it made money. I'm not certain Senator Hampton knew exactly who Millennium Investments really was, but he must have sensed something about us he didn't like. When he returned to running the mountain himself, 
He tried to buy us out several times, but my father always resisted. I gather the prophets were terrific. Back to Crystal's reappearance in your life. If the senator hadn't sent her, who did you suppose had? I didn't ask, and frankly, I didn't care. However, I did take the proposition to my father. Despite my taunt to Crystal to expose us if she could, I actually do feel a certain loyalty to my father. Poor Dad, his money fountain would have dried up in a hurry if Crystal started telling people how she had been seduced and abandoned by Dr. Doron's son when she was just fifteen. Jack smiled. You know, this is all a very familiar ring, Luke. You must have recognized a certain thematic unity to this blackmail attempt. Of course, it was almost exactly how CMA destroyed Senator Hampton in 84. And you still don't know who was behind Crystal. Not then, at least. My father was delighted with the proposition, of course. A casino, an aerial tramway, a hotel, restaurant, and gift shop. It was just the thing for him. He was skeptical at first that it would be possible to get the various environmental approvals, but the more he looked into it, the more enthusiastic he became. The proposed complex was to be on Indian land, and this made some things quite a bit simpler. It wasn't even necessary to obtain county permits, for example, at least not for the primary structure. Even though the land is actually on a 99-year lease to the ski resort? Legally, Duby Rock is still sovereign Indian land from which the tribe draws important revenue, and so on. As for the question of Indian gaming, Dad is the eternal optimist whenever a fast buck is involved. Frankly, he has some well-placed friends in New Mexico. He does not anticipate any changes to the laws. So, what happened next? These things move slowly. I imagine there were a lot of meetings with some of CMA's big contributors. Personally, I did my best to stay out of it. Crystal came up to Colorado Springs every few months or so, and as far as I know, everything was on track. Then it all blew up a few weeks ago. Senator Hampton phoned my father and said he had just found out what was going on behind his back. He was furious. Did he say how he had learned about the deal? Nope. Only that as long as he was alive, there would be no casino, no aerial tramway, nothing at all up there but trees and snow and rocks. Dad was naturally upset since he had already spent a lot of time and money on the project, almost $30,000 in lawyer's fees and architectural drawings. He got in touch with Crystal, and they did some serious shouting at each other. But she told him not to worry, that the deal was still on target. But how could that be? Jack asked. If Senator Hampton was dead set against it. Luke smiled coldly. Well, that's the thing, of course. Perhaps Senator Hampton would not live forever. Jack nodded. And you knew, of course, by this time who Crystal was really representing. Of course. Luke, I see that you are a subtle young man, so there's one thing I don't understand. You knew, didn't you, that you were going to be set up for the rap? You must have known. How else could they have gotten away with it? You're asking why I allowed myself to be the fall guy? Luke shrugged. Well, why not? I'm as guilty as anyone. My guilt began years ago when I allowed that fifteen-year-old girl to fill me with lustful thoughts. Who knows? Crystal might have turned out quite differently if I had provided a better example. Anyway, it is the Christian ideal for someone to be willing to take the rap, as you call it. Jack turned to Howie. You got it now? Howie still couldn't quite believe it. Josie? he asked tentatively. Jack nodded. Howie felt suddenly as if an icicle had been driven into his heart. Josie! My God, Jack! She's with Allison! 7. 
The small twin-prop Cessna lurched and dove in the night sky as it crossed the Sangre de Cristo Mountains from Colorado into New Mexico. Howie was afraid the wings would fall off if it got any rougher. They were racing back to San Geronimo, but he had little faith that they would actually arrive. Outside the window he saw from the light of a misty half-moon that they were bobbing in and out of a silvery landscape of snow-capped peaks and granite cliffs that seemed close enough to reach out and touch. Howie was certain they were all going to die in this absurd little flying machine. Kevin was in an improved mood, relieved that the Christians for a moral America had vacated Sir Galahad's castle without further incident. Indeed, he was the hero of the hour within FBI circles. As for Jack, he was still deeply concerned about Angela, but he had been through many situations like this before and had learned to keep a certain distance from his work. Howie was astonished Jack and Kevin could appear so calm. It was unbearable to him that Angela remained missing and Allison's fate was hanging in a perilous balance. Kevin spent the first part of the flight sitting in the co-pilot seat, talking on the radio, organizing the operation that would begin as soon as they touched down in San Geronimo. After a while, he walked back to Jack and Howie. Howie watched his face carefully as he approached, anxiously trying to judge if his news was good or bad. But what he had to say was unexpected. Jack Rooney, good buddy, guess what? Lay it on me, Kavinsky. Howie wanted to vomit. I've been speaking to my man in Santa Fe, Kevin said. He turned briefly to explain to Howie. Jack suggested we contact the accountant down there who does the books for San Geronimo Peak. You know, you're scoring pretty good today, Jack. Thank you. Now, why don't you cut the bullshit and tell us what's going on? Kevin grinned. It was hard to recognize him as the anxious wreck of an FBI agent who had been pacing the parking lot outside Sir Galahad's only an hour earlier. The accountant is a lady named Virginia Obrecht, who works out of her house on Canyon Road. My agent got to her just a little while ago as she was finishing dinner, but she didn't mind the late hour. She even offered him a piece of chocolate cake. Actually, there have been a few things bothering her, and for the past few weeks, she's been debating whether she ought to go to the authorities. She kept finding a reason not to do so, but it wasn't hard to get her talking. This was a lady who was bursting at the seams. She'd found some irregularities in the books. It's even more interesting than that. Toward the end of March, Senator Hampton drove down to Santa Fe with a whole bunch of computer printouts for her to look at. He was the one who found the irregularities. She had never seen him so furious. He told her that a few days before, he had discovered that Josie was going behind his back, trying to set up a development deal to build a casino at Doobie Rock. And now he had just learned she was robbing him blind, if you'll pardon the expression. Did he give any details? He did indeed. Apparently, part of Josie's job was to oversee the four cafeterias and restaurants on the mountain, and this is where she was doing her embezzling. The senator suspected she has stolen as much as $40,000 over the past few years, but the actual figure turned out to be much higher, closer to a hundred grand. She had done it by falsifying accounts and adding a few phantom employees to the payroll. The senator was really beside himself. The way he saw it, he had taken in this girl, tried to do his best for her, and now she was betraying him. This hurt on a gut level. He told Virginia he was going to fire Josie, write her out of his will, completely disown her. Virginia got him to calm down enough to at least wait for the season to end before he did anything. It would give her a chance, she said, to go over the books more carefully. This was a family matter, after all, and a bit sensitive. Meanwhile, she suggested he hire a private investigator to discover what else Josie might have been up to. Aha, uh -huh, said Jack. This all becomes more clear. But I wonder how the senator caught on to Josie in the first place. Kevin was still grinning. Get this. He received an anonymous letter about Josie's plans for Doobie Rock. Virginia didn't see the letter herself, but the senator mentioned it. After he got the letter, he stayed late on the mountain one night in order to go into Josie's office and see what she had on her computer. He was hoping to find her correspondence with Millennium. He didn't find a thing about Millennium, but her latest restaurant spreadsheets were lying on the table, and he had a peek at those instead. It was the phantom employees on the payroll that tipped him off that she was stealing from him. Apparently, 
she had two waitresses named Andrea and Ursula listed for the Winter House Inn, and being an old skirt chaser, Senator Hampton was certain he would have remembered young women with such provocative names had they really existed. Well, well, an anonymous letter, Jack mused. You know, this could be Luke's doing, but personally I wouldn't be surprised if it were Donnie. He must have been a very unhappy young man. If he suspected something was going on between Crystal and Josie, it could have been his attempts to bust things up and get a little revenge. We'll find the note itself eventually, Kevin said confidently. At least we know what we're looking for now. I love it when you get to this point in a case when everything finally starts making sense. Howie became more and more indignant as he listened to Jack and Kevin. They were having a grand old time being so wonderfully clever. Why don't you just jerk each other off? he asked sourly. Jack turned his dark glasses upon Howie. What's the matter? he asked. What's the matter? My God, Jack, everything's the matter. Angela's probably crying her eyes out right now, waiting for someone to come rescue her, and we don't have a clue where that child is. So it seems to me a bit premature to break out the champagne and sit around congratulating each other. Nobody's breaking out any champagne, Jack said carefully. But Kevin and I have been doing this for a long time, Howie. You learn to keep your emotions under wraps. It's just an intellectual puzzle for you then, isn't it? No, it's more than that, my friend. But if you don't keep your cool, you're not going to be able to function. And if you can't function, you're not going to do anyone a whole lot of good. Kevin smiled tolerantly. He patted Jack on the shoulder and moved away down the short aisle to his own seat, allowing Jack the opportunity to explain the facts of life to his young assistant. I don't care about any of this shit, Howie complained stubbornly. I only want to know where Angela is and that Allison is safe. Howie was so upset that for a moment he thought he was going to cry. You know where Angela is, Jack said sternly. We all do. The conclusion is inescapable. The hell with your inescapable conclusions, Howie cried bitterly. I don't know anything. Then maybe we should go over this a little, Jack suggested. Let's start with April Fool's Day. Jack said in a deliberately calm voice. Senator Hampton had just learned that his daughter was embezzling money from him and making secret deals behind his back that she knew he would oppose. He wanted us to find out all the gory details. He didn't know I was blind or that there would be a snowstorm that day to obscure the view, so he set our meeting at the very place on the mountain Josie wanted to destroy with a casino and an aerial tramway. Probably he thought it would be an object lesson for us to see the spot for ourselves. Unfortunately, he had confided everything to his girlfriend of the moment, having no idea that Crystal was Josie's girlfriend as well, and reporting every word. So Josie knew that her father was planning to fire her, possibly even write her out of his will. She realized she had to do something fast, or she could be left out in the cold, without a job and without a penny. At all costs, she needed to stop him from talking with us. So she decided to go for it, to kill her father before he could meet with us at Doobie Rock. At the moment, we can only guess at how exactly this was done. Somehow, Crystal managed to get the senator to Doobie Rock half an hour early. Since he never wore a wristwatch, perhaps this was not as difficult as it seems. The extra half hour was vital in order to get the deed done and escape before you and I showed up. Crystal and Josie probably worked this all out between them, but my guess is that it was Josie who actually shot the arrow. Must have been very satisfying for her to do that, a settling of old scores. So Josie had the motive. She certainly had the anger and the resolve, but now she needed to figure out how to get away with it. Unfortunately for her, in the normal course of things, she and Allison, as the principal heirs, would be the first suspects in any murder investigation, so she had to figure out a way to set up someone else to take the blame. And that's where Luke Doron and the Christians for a Moral America came in. For Josie, they were the perfect fall guys, and everything she did was designed to lead us to them. It's the reason the senator was shot with an arrow. She knew from Crystal about Luke's skill in archery. It's why she killed Allison's dog and wrote hate words on her window. It's the reason Angela was kidnapped. 
Josie was desperate. She had to make up her plan in a hurry, and she wasn't able to think everything through to the end. But still, it wasn't a bad scheme, as these things go. Somehow, Crystal must have gotten hold of that diet Dr. Pepper can with Luke's fingerprints on it during one of her trips to Colorado Springs, and that was supposed to be the clincher, just in case we still had any doubts about Luke's guilt. You're saying the CMA was only window dressing? Howie asked. But surely Josie didn't have anything to do with their anti-abortion protest or throwing that cow's placenta on Allison's dinner table. No, of course not. These moral Americans gave her that for free. As fall guys, they couldn't have been better suited to the role. Josie tried to steer us toward them from the start. Remember our first conversation with her at the winter house? She managed to let us know all about some fanatic right-wing group that had destroyed her dad's political career in the 80s. We were meant to follow that up and discover it was CMA, and they were back to their old mischief, crazier than ever, trying their best to destroy the whole damn family. It's still hard to believe she thought she could get away with it, Howie said, shaking his head. Well, what choice did she have? The moment her father made the appointment to meet us at Doobie Rock, her clock was running out. Jack took Howie on a brief tour of how the subsequent events had unfolded. He was the first to admit that there were many things he did not know, and that much of what he said was conjecture. But it seemed obvious to him that Josie's greatest liability was Crystal. Certainly it was nice to have a partner in crime, and it would have been impossible for Josie to have arranged everything herself. And Crystal, for her part, probably believed she would share in the bounty once she and Josie ran the ski resort. But when Howie recognized Crystal in Colorado Springs and saw her talking with Luke Duran, her usefulness was finished as far as Josie was concerned. The problem, as she saw it, was that anyone investigating Crystal closely enough would eventually be led all the way back to Josie. So first she tried to kill Howie so he would not be able to report what he had discovered. Possibly it was Crystal who had followed Howie as he drove home that night to San Geronimo, and she was the one who acted out the part of the ghost dancer on the lonely road. Or it might have been Josie herself with a shotgun. She could have been in Colorado Springs herself that day without being seen by Howie. Either way, when he survived the accident, Josie knew that Crystal had to go. Jack was certain, though it might never be proved, that Donnie and Crystal's death was a carefully arranged double murder. That brought Jack to the relationship between Josie and Allison. Terrorizing her sister must have had an emotional appeal for Josie. It was a way to avenge an old emotional wound. Allison had always been the legitimate one, the princess from California, while Josie had grown up with nothing. But there was also a calculated reason for the campaign of terror. It made it appear as if CMA was responsible for a series of bad things that were happening to the Hampton family, and in this way it disguised the one real crime, the patricide that would have been painfully obvious had it stood on its own. Kidnapping Angela was yet another attempt to implicate the Christian group, leaving behind as evidence a Dr. Pepper can with Luke's fingerprints on it. But Josie was most likely starting to enjoy herself too much. If she had thought it out more clearly, she would have realized that the kidnapping would bring too much heat down on her. It was one thing to fool the local police, quite another to put it over on the FBI. Josie lost her clear-sightedness as she became more and more engulfed in her own destructive nature. Howie listened carefully, but he felt like he was missing something important that Jack was trying to tell him. Back to the casino, Jack. I still don't understand why she would set that deal in motion when she knew her father would veto it. There are two possibilities. The first is that she knew she was going to kill her father from the start, so he wouldn't be around to veto the project when it got closer to being realized. She would be in charge of the ski resort by then, a very wealthy and powerful woman. The other possibility? That she never cared about the casino at all. That from the very beginning this whole thing was an elaborate sham, just a clever way to murder her father and make it look as if someone else was responsible. So, you think this whole thing is the rage of the dispossessed, Jack told him. So you see, in a way, Josie is a ghost dancer after all. 
She planned to live out the remainder of her life in all the splendor she believed had been denied her as a child. It was a sort of deliverance, I suppose. Unfortunately for her, she got careless. Howie sighed. Okay, maybe you're right, Jack. I'm not sure I even care at the moment. What I still want to know is where the hell is Angela? You aren't listening, Howie. I've told you that Josie is an extremely angry woman who's doing everything in her power to hide her tracks. Now, Angela certainly recognized her Aunt Josie as her kidnapper. Therefore, there's no possible way that Josie could allow that child to live. Howie felt like his stomach was sinking out from under him. But Angela's just a little kid, Jack. She's Josie's niece, for Christ's sake. Howie, this is someone who killed her father. The fact that Angela was related wouldn't worry her a bit. Besides, what better way to get back at Allison? So you think this has already been done? Howie asked tentatively. I think it was done almost immediately. You just have to harden yourself to the fact, Howie. It isn't your fault. That little girl had her own life and her own fate, and you're going to have to accept it. You've done everything you could to save her, but Howie, you're not God. Howie turned away from Jack toward the dark window of the airplane and tried to force back the tears that were blinding his eyes. He tried to think about it all rationally. He knew children sometimes had to die, yet it was too painful. He hated the very world in which such things were possible. Howie was thrown back in his seat as the little plane fell precipitously in the unstable air. Go ahead. Crash. Take me, he prayed desperately to the gods of the sky. I'm ready to die. But the plane didn't crash. Instead, it came down into a long, safe glide onto the single runway of the tiny San Geronimo airport. 8. There was some confusion at the airport. Howie waited on the runway by the plane while Kevin conferred with a group of his agents a dozen feet away. The FBI people stood near a cluster of cars and talked in low voices among themselves. Howie had no idea what was going on, and at the moment he didn't much care. Kevin spoke on his cell phone for a few minutes, consulted some more with his agents, and finally walked over to Jack and took him aside. Now Jack and Kevin repeated the ritual. They spoke in quiet voices, and then Kevin used his cell phone once again. To Howie, it all seemed meaningless, just a lot of strutting about and self-importance. These people with their damn cell phones were beginning to piss him off. He walked to the edge of the runway and with some difficulty lowered himself with his crutches so he could sit on the desert. The sandy earth felt good. It felt real. He stretched out on his back and stared up at the moon and stars. It was a beautiful, serene New Mexico night, but the beauty and serenity only made him more aware of his own jagged grief. After a while, Kevin led Jack over to where he lay. There's been a complication, Jack said. I guess that, Howie replied upward, not moving from his spot. We may not all be Sherlock Holmes, Jack, but even I can make an inescapable conclusion from time to time. Do you want to hear about this or don't you? What I want, frankly, has nothing to do with it. Jack hesitated. It's Allison, he said at last. Is she dead too? Howie asked bitterly. Not at the moment. What the hell does that mean? It means the team of agents surrounding Allison's house started thinking something was wrong when there were cars in the driveway, but no one turned on any lights when it got dark. A little while ago, they heard the phone ring and no one answered. So finally, on Kevin's instructions, they broke in. They found Allison alone in the house, unconscious on her bedroom floor. Was she shot with an arrow, or was it something more mundane this time, like a knife or a gun? Neither. It was a suicide attempt. This brought Howie to a sitting position. Suicide? he asked. Like Donnie and Crystal? No, this looks like the real thing. The agents found an empty bottle of sleeping pills on her bedside table. Right now, Allison's in an ambulance being rushed to the hospital. I have to tell you, Howie. She's unconscious, and it's too early to say if she'll make it or not. As for Josie, her jeep is still in Allison's driveway, but somehow she's managed to give us a slip. The early morning sun flooded through a window into the hospital waiting room. Howie was asleep in one of the chairs, 
his good leg sprawled out in front of him, his head lolling to one side. A nurse was trying to shake him awake. You can go in, Mr. Moon, dear, she told him. What? He opened his eyes groggily. Allison is going to be all right. She's asking for you. Howie sat up warily, expecting some sort of trick. He had become a cynic during the last few days, but the nurse was a pretty young woman with sympathetic brown eyes, and she was even holding his crutches for him, offering a helping hand. Meanwhile, there was no sign of Jack or Kevin or the FBI. To Howie, this almost seemed too good to be true. She's going to be all right? She had her stomach pumped in time. She's going to be fine. Howie swung up onto his crutches and followed the nurse down a hall. Allison had a room to herself two doors from where Howie had convalesced only a few days before. She was sitting up in bed when he walked in, dressed in a funny white hospital gown with ties in the back. The nurse smiled vaguely and left them alone. Allison started crying the moment she saw him. Oh, Howie! She put her arms around his stomach as he stood by the bed and sobbed softly into his belly. This tickled a little, but he didn't laugh. Howie stroked her hair and shoulders and didn't know what to say. She looked terrible. Her face was bloated, her eyes were red, and it seemed to him as if she had aged ten years since he had seen her last. Even her hands suddenly showed signs of age. They seemed bird-like, hardly more than fragile bones covered by taut, translucent skin. He had always been impressed by her physical beauty, too impressed, really. So it was strange to find her no longer so perfect, not his mythical lady in white, not even a snow maiden. The woman he held was entirely human and vulnerable, and he had never loved her so much. Every particle of his body and soul wanted to encircle her with his love and protect her. Oh, Howie, get me out of here, she cried. Take me home, please. Yes he said, stroking her hair. I'm going to take you home. It felt as if they were survivors from a shipwreck, alone together in her house. Howie told Viola there was really no reason for her to come in for a few days. Frankly, he was glad to do the cooking and cleaning. It gave him a momentary purpose. He put Allison into the guest room bed on the ground floor, since he still had trouble climbing stairs, and he set about taking care of her. Allison slept a great deal, and Howie often just sat in the living room and stared out the window at the trees, or picked out a novel from her living room shelves. It was odd how life went on. On the second day, Howie carried a lunch tray with a turkey sandwich and a glass of mineral water into her bedroom, an acrobatic feat with his crutches, but he managed not to spill a thing. Allison sat up in bed with her tray, but instead of eating, she told him the story of Josie's strange visit. At first, Howie was worried that it might be dangerous, a mistake to relive such emotional memories so soon, but she clearly wanted to talk. Josie had shown up unexpectedly on the morning that Howie and Jack were in Colorado Springs. At first I was grateful she'd come. It was a surprise, you know, because we had never been close, but it felt good to have some family support. I thought, wow, I really do have a sister. Maybe something positive is going to come out of this nightmare. But then I started feeling these weird undertones. It's hard to describe, Howie, but by afternoon, I sent something very creepy going on. She was, what, angry? Threatening in some way? No, just the opposite. She was too sweet, overly solicitous. It didn't ring true somehow. In the afternoon, she told Viola to go home and when we were alone together in the house, I started getting a little frightened. I was pretty much out of it, of course, loaded up on sedatives, sleeping a lot. I remember waking up when the phone rang downstairs sometime toward evening. Josie said it was a reporter, but there was something about her tone. I didn't quite believe her. I thought maybe she was keeping something from me. Then she offered to give me a back rub, and frankly, that sounded like a great idea. I was so stiff and tense I felt like I was going crazy. So I was lying on my stomach on my bed, and Josie was straddling me, rubbing my back, and then she started talking in this dreamy voice like she was outside her body, or very stoned, telling me really horrible things, how unhappy she had been as a child on the reservation, how she had hated everything, most of all her creep of a stepfather, Manny Trujillo. I remember saying, 
But your mother loved you, didn't she? She laughed really bitterly when I said that. She told me it was all Dad's fault. Dad had trashed her mother, destroyed her self-respect, and by the time he was through dumping on her, the only thing Maria loved was cheap booze. Apparently she and Manny used to get drunk together and go on terrible binges that always turned violent. Every binge ended with Manny beating Maria up. Josie used to hide under her bed when they were drinking because she was afraid Manny was going to come into her room and kill her. I told Josie I was sorry to hear all this, of course. I never knew her childhood had been quite so bad. Then she said that whenever her mom wasn't around, Manny would make her jerk him off. She really went on about this, how Manny taught her to put her hand around his dick and make him come. Only he was such a drunk, you see, it used to take her forever to do it. She was seven or eight years old, and she would have to just sit there for hours with his limp dick in her hand and Manny getting angry because he said she wasn't doing it right. I was shocked, absolutely horrified, at what she was telling me. I sat up and I turned around on the bed. I tried to tell her how deeply I empathized. The child abuse just made me sick. I said it still wasn't too late to report Manny to the police. But then she started getting angry saying how could I understand anything when I grew up in such a rich house and everybody loved me and treated me just like a little princess. It was a very disturbing conversation, Howie. Did she confess to killing your father? Not directly, but I began to suspect it. She went on and on about Dad, how it was all Dad's fault that she had suffered such a dysfunctional childhood. And then she calmed down a little and said she had to tell me the truth about the phone call I had heard earlier, the one that woke me up. She said it was you on the phone, Howie, not a reporter, and that you had passed on some very bad news. It was me, Hallie, but I told her things were looking a bit hopeful. Did you? Well, Josie told me she didn't know how to break it to me, but I'd better get a grip on myself. The worst had happened. Your phone call was to say that Angela was dead. You had found her naked body in a forest outside of Colorado Springs, and she had been— Allison took a gulp of air, unable to continue. Maybe you shouldn't try to tell me this yet, Howie cautioned. It was all a bunch of lies anyway. But was it? That's what I don't really know, and it's just destroying me, Howie. I don't know if I can bear it. Allie, we've got to wait until we learn what really happened. Josie said Angela had been raped, repeatedly. She said she was raped so many times in the anus and vagina that her little body, her little body... Allison was crying in convulsive sobs. Howie hobbled over to the bed and held her. It's all lies, he said again. She was only trying to torment you. My God, she went on and on and on about it, Howie. I remember I tried to stand up from the bed, but with all the tranks I'd been taking and the stress and anxiety, I fainted dead away on the floor. Probably I wasn't out for long, but when I came to, Josie was gone. I saw she had left the plastic bottle of sleeping pills on my bedside table. I knew she had put them there for me deliberately. I just stared at the bottle for the longest time. For hours, I think, because it had got dark in the room. There just didn't seem anything left for me to live for. Angela was dead, raped hideously. My father was murdered. My sister was a monster, crazy with hatred. I couldn't take it any more. So finally I got a glass of water and I swallowed the pills. Howie didn't have any idea what to do, except hold her and let her cry. Later that afternoon, Emma Wilder phoned Howie with a message from Jack. Josie had been picked up in the Albuquerque airport, attempting to board a flight to Mexico City with a hundred thousand dollars in cash in her carry-on baggage. Jack and Kevin had immediately flown to Albuquerque to question her. The interrogation was still in progress, but Jack wanted Howie to know that Josie had confessed to killing Angela. Jack and Kevin were still trying to discover what she had done with the body. When there was any word, they would let Allison know. Meanwhile, they were doing their best to keep the confession from the media until the details were better established. There was no sense turning this into a three-ring circus. But Kevin was planning to hold a news conference at ten o'clock the next morning, so Howie should be prepared. The moment Josie's confession was made public, Hordes of journalists were sure to descend on Allison's house in search of some true-life grief. Howie had taken the call in the kitchen. He put down the telephone with a carnivorous emptiness in his soul. 
His eyes had become dry, scorched rocks. Allison was sleeping, so he was just as glad to spare her for the moment of this final piece of news. He was still sitting in the kitchen an hour later when she appeared in a white terry cloth robe. Howie felt paralyzed. He sat staring at her from his straight-back chair, his plaster cast resting on a second chair nearby. You don't look very good, Howie, she said. I'm okay. Have you been eating? Why don't you let me make you up a can of soup? Maybe later. I'm not really hungry, Allie. No, she said stubbornly. I'm going to make you up some soup and spoon-feed it into your mouth if I have to. It seemed that they had traded places emotionally. As Howie watched her futz in the kitchen, he became more and more depressed. He knew he should tell her about Emma's phone call. Several times he actually opened his mouth to speak, to form the words, but he couldn't physically make himself say it, and the longer he put it off, the more difficult it was to begin. Allie heated up a can of lentil soup, poured it into a bowl, and placed it on the table in front of him with a spoon. Eat, Howie. Frankly, you're about the last living thing I give a shit about, so I don't want you to waste away. It was good to hear her being a little feisty, a hint of the old Allison. He wasn't hungry, but he took a few spoonfuls anyway to encourage the trend. She sat next to him at the table, and her eye was caught by Angela's drawing on his plaster cast. How he tried to remove his leg from the chair so she wouldn't see it, but Allison told him to leave his cast where it was. You know, I never really looked at this closely, Howie. It's the big bad wolf, isn't it? Allison studied the absurd, fat creature with big ears that Angela had drawn. She was doing her best to remain calm and speak in a matter-of-fact voice. I was telling Angela the story of Little Red Riding Hood just last week. She was always fascinated by the ending, the part where the wolf eats grandmother and Riding Hood, and then the handsome woodcutter comes along and kills the wolf and cuts open his stomach with an axe. At least, that's the version of the story I told her, how I learned it myself when I was a little girl. Angela really got a kick out of how Grandmother and Riding Hood just step out of the stomach and everything's fine. She always used to say to me, Mommy, how can Riding Hood be alive if the wolf ate her? And I would say, well, this was an awfully handsome woodcutter, a kind of prince in disguise. And a prince in disguise, you see, has the power to save Riding Hood. Allison looked up at Howie, her intense brown-gold eyes fixed on him. You know what Angela told me once? She said that you were like the handsome woodcutter, Howie. She had you pegged as the prince in disguise who's supposed to rescue us all. She told me that, too, Howie admitted. She said it was my job. Howie couldn't let go of this image of the handsome woodcutter, that somehow he had really screwed up his part of the fairy tale. He knew it was absurd, perhaps even self-delusionary, and yet the thought was like a seed that grew inside of him. He agonized over it. What kind of handsome goddamn woodcutter let the big bad wolf get away with eating Riding Hood? All that evening he thought about it as he and Allison shuffled around in her big solar home. What kind of goddamn handsome woodcutter was it who couldn't save a little girl? He felt like screaming. As far as how he could see, he was entirely useless and a coward as well, because now too much time had elapsed since his phone call from Emma, and he was certain he could never tell Allison what she had told him. He couldn't voice the words that would put a final end to hope. They slept together in the bed downstairs, but it was sexless, only the embrace of shipwrecked souls. Howie didn't think he would sleep, but he did sleep for several hours. He woke around two in the morning and stared wide-eyed at the ceiling, still thinking about the woodcutter. He had just had the strangest idea. A handsome woodcutter was, if you thought about it, a kind of ghost dancer. Their job description was similar to some extent, to bring people back from the dead. The woodcutter did this by opening up stomachs with his axe, the ghost dancer by dancing until the heavens opened and the gods released the spirits of slain warriors. Howie lay on the bed for another hour, going over and over the idea in his head. He knew he could never have made a very good handsome woodcutter, despite Angela's expectations. I'm afraid I'm just not handsome enough, Angela, he told her ruefully. But what if he could be a ghost dancer? Was it possible?
By three o'clock, Howie was certain he was going crazy. Nevertheless, he gently disentangled himself from Allison's embrace. He got out of bed, hopped on one foot over to his crutches, grabbed his clothes from the chair, and hobbled into the living room. He really had no idea how to begin, but the living room did not seem the right place to try. So he dressed and went outside to the rear of the house, to the open desert, where he and Angela once played gicket with her nerf ball. It had been a long time since Howie had done any Indian dancing. When he was a teenager, he used to go to some of the powwows, mostly for the purpose of meeting girls. But that was years ago, and he wasn't even sure he could remember the steps. All in all, this couldn't be more impossible. The night was black, there was no one to sing, no one to beat the drum, and his crutches didn't help matters either. Ridiculous, he said aloud. But nevertheless, Howard Moondeer began to dance. He found a patch of desert, and he danced in a clockwise circle around and around. Indian dancing is a kind of two-step to a beat that is strangely soothing, like a heartbeat. 